Hello everyone, welcome to helpingtesters.com. Today we are going to see about very basic introduction to the performance testing and some of the topics let's list out here. So what is the performance testing and related to real situations and various performance testing terminology. Let's get into what is the performance testing and let's look at various types of performance testing available that normally we do. So if you look at so where the performance testing falls under QA so on the very top if it comes to any application testing is mandatory so if we divide the testing based on the the way we do either it, it is done by the machine or it is done by a human so we can divide them into two categories so one is the manual testing it is nothing but there is a person who is physically sitting and sitting in front of a system and conducting the testing and the second one is automation so using some set of utilities to carry out the testing the testing activity we call them as automation so again if we consider automation to two aspects that is the functional testing and the non-functional testing functional testing is nothing but testing the application functionality whether it is giving the expected page or not whether the respective button or some part of the ui component is appearing on the page or not that can be validated in the functional testing whereas there are some non-functional as aspects nothing but application speed or application availability those are comes under non-functional testing so under non-functional testing again we categorize them into two categories performance testing and security testing so here the performance testing is nothing but that's what we are going to learn now is all speaks about the performance testing it is nothing but validating the performance of your system or an application it may be anything so testing the application performance is to be covered under performance testing whereas the security testing is the one which mainly speaks about application security whether it is secure or it, it can be hacked by some intruders so that all aspects can be tested using some tools in security testing now let's look at various types of performance testing normally we do in the market so let's look at the very first one the very common we do normally is a load testing load testing is nothing but testing the application with a fixed number of users to determine the application capacity so here we mainly look at how quickly application is responding in terms of the response time a response time is nothing but how quickly the application is responding in terms of seconds or it may be in terms of milliseconds okay let's say if we open the google.com page uh, let's see how it opens like it may be open in two seconds or three seconds so we can say that response time of a google page is three seconds so in load testing normally we give a fixed number of users to determine how quickly all the application pages are loading for that particular X number of users. Let's say our favorite shopping cart Amazon.com. So in Amazon.com, so you are, uh, let's say we are, we are open, we are the owner of Amazon.com. So customer, we are asking a performance tester to test what is the response time for, let's say for thousand users. So here we give thousand users for the Amazon.com to test and see how quickly it is loaded by all these thousand users so here the goal of it to measure the response time with a fixed number of users so load testing speaks also about response times and the number of users okay let's look at what is a stress testing or breakpoint testing some people even call it as stress testing is nothing but so we are testing beyond the limits of the application nothing bad we will be testing the application unless until we see the application crashes either the crash point can be determined in two ways either it may be in terms of application is going down or the application is not at all responding this is the one point we covered and the next point is application is breaching the SLA SLA is nothing but service level agreement normally any industry or any organization will send set some SLA SLA is nothing but service level agreement means each and every page should be loaded within three seconds or five seconds the international standard for 
SLA is 5 seconds so it means all pages should be the loaded within 5 seconds so beyond this point or beyond this number of seconds user may be frustrated and he just will closed uh, he, he will just close the browser page or he just close the application so it is the beyond this 5 seconds user may be frustrated and user may be feeling that application is performing slow so that's why they said is a standard metric for SLA so let's get back to the what is stress testing so stress testing as we just discussed can be derived in two ways one is based on the application responsiveness and another is based on SLA so if we consider responsiveness whether uh, application is been responding or not maybe sometimes if you look at some applications during you know uh, during some special sales when we try the applications they will be either loading very slow or you will see service not available error so these kind of tests to be carried out using the stress testing so let's look at the formal way of how we call the stress testing so stress testing is nothing but testing the application with unlimited number of users so the number of users are equal to where application is not at all responding or application SLA has been breached all that is about stress testing now let's look back about spike testing spike test is nothing bad we are normally starting the application with less number of load and we suddenly increase the load to either double or triple let's say we are testing an application with thousand users all of the sudden if we increase the load from thousand to three thousand means there is a sudden burden on the application so this is just to see how the application is behaving when the load is being increased all of the sudden so this will provide us a detailed metrics like application capacity whether it can handle a sudden load or not so this spike testing is normally done to verify the application behavior during some kind of special situations of sudden load okay now let's look what is about volume testing volume test is nothing bad let's say an application is being launched today so we don't know how much volume will be there after and after one year let's say while testing if we have the 1 GB of data in the database so after one year when the application goes live there will be a lot of data in B in the database nothing but while testing if we have 1 GB so after going for after going it live uh, we may be getting 5 GB or 10 GB of data in the DB so the exponentially like the amount of data is been increased on the DB so when more data is added to the DB definitely it would impact the performance so the volume test is nothing but in increasing the number of records or increasing the size of the DB and do a simple load test it is nothing but volume testing so the volume testing is why we conduct so volume testing is conducted to consider future growth of the DB or future growth of the load and to see after X number of years the application performance is not deviating whenever the later database sizes become high so this is normally determined considering the future growth and the next one is a failover testing failover testing is nothing bad uh, let's say we have a uh, two data centers one is at USA and another one is the United Kingdom so we will take down one of the data center or it may be in one it may be in one single data center and we will take one system out of the all number of systems and we'll see whether the active systems can be able to handle the load or not so this is nothing but we will take one system or one node or one data center down and rest of the rest of the available nodes or the data centers is able to handle the load and what is the impact of it whether the performance is been degraded or users are experiencing any slowness or users are seeing any errors or users are seeing any uh, kind of messages like server not available service not available and how long they will be available like how long users are seeing the errors 
So those are can be seen in the failover testing. Let's take a real time situation and see. Let us consider our favorite shopping cart, Amazon.com. So here, let's look at why do we when we do the load testing. So initially, the customer plans to launch the application for thousand users. Let's say it is only it is only limited to one particular geographical area, so where the population is not very much. So just that they wanted to see how the application is performing with the limited number of availability for the limited set of the region. So obviously, if it is rolled out for the less number of users, the load will not be much. So considering that, let's say we will be rolling it out for the thousand users and we are testing the performance, we are testing the application with a thousand users and here we will be seeing the response times, how quickly we are seeing the response times for how quickly we are seeing the pages loaded for thousand users. Okay, so now let's say Amazon.com has introduced some offers. Okay, so let's say we have uh, put, uh, let's say some offers and uh, day by day uh, the load on the Amazon.com is been increasing. Right, so in that situation we will come to know at some point you know we may be experiencing uh, users may be experiencing uh, there is a delay in the application or application performing slow so to handle that kind of the situation like what is the limit of our system or where it is the breaking or for how many users the system is breaking so considering this situation so we do a stress testing on amazon.com so this kind of testing will helpful for us so if we want to increase the number of servers or if we want to increase the capacity of the servers that we can easily understand how much we can because we don't want to unnecessarily spend on the hardware. Like let's take, we, found, we, we, we were doing a performance testing uh, for a stress test. We found the application is breaking for 1000 users. So for the 1000 users is the breakpoint and let's say the existing uh, in the existing application cluster, we have 10 servers. So 10 servers are able to provide support up to 1000 users. So we are experiencing the big Amazon.com is becoming very famous. So we have to expand our business, nothing but we need to able to serve more number of users online. It means we need to add the cap, we need to add the more number of server to the system. So we are expecting Let's say now we have 1000 and we're expecting we can support up to 2000, 2000. So 1000 users may be added. So what we found the break, the stress testing or breakpoint testing, our application is breaking beyond 1000 users. So if you want to support 2000 users, so if we add another 10 more servers, so that is sufficient to handle the expected increase in load, right? So that's what about stress testing or breakpoint testing, okay? So now let's look at the spike testing. Let's again correlate how it will be used in the real time business. Let's say we we are become we have become very pretty much famous and let's say there is an event, nothing but there is a, we, we want to put some special sale day. Let's say January 1st or December 31st is special sale day for us. So we want to launch an offer, offer like 20% discount on or 50% discount on some XYZ credit card, right? So now let's look at, so what happens when we, well, let's say, when whenever we make it at 12 o'clock in the noon to open it for everyone. So users, there will be sudden traffic at the 12 o'clock on our application, amazon.com, right? So to handle this kind of situation, we will do spike testing means we will all of the sudden increase the load while we are doing a normal load test. It means, let's say we during the normal load, our application is not having not more than 100 users, right? So during the special sale days, whenever the special sale is on at some particular time, so there will be huge load coming to application. So definitely the application behavior changes. So to understand how the application is behaving during that kind of situation, we will do a spike testing, right? So this is all about spike testing. So here what we can observe from the spike testing is nothing but 
So what is the impact of the spike testing, whether the application response times are deviating or not, that we can consider in the spike testing. And if it's deviating, where is the issue? We go and dig it and developer has to fix it. And again, we need to do retest. Okay, so that is about spike testing. Yeah, now let's look at the volume testing. In volume testing, let's say we have launched our Amazon.com to our all the users in live today. So we've been, we have become, we, we have becoming very famous, right? So the, obviously the number of users registered with Amazon.com down the line in a year will definitely increase us. So we don't know what is the impact of adding this new user base or adding that these all new user credentials or new user information to our database. Definitely more database, more records in the database will make the database to perform slow. So considering this situation, so let's expect in first one month, we got approximately thousand users got registered on our Amazon.com. So after second month, so likewise, we can exponentially consider the increasing the load. So in the second month, there will be 2000 and in third month, 3000. Likewise, after an year, there will be 12,000 users. So obviously the database performance will go down whenever more number of records are added to database, right? So volume testing is nothing but to evaluate this kind of situation, whether DB is able to perform quickly or not. If not, what are the key things that we need to take care of and how to improve the performance of DB whenever the more number of records are there in the database. So the volume testing, that's the reason we do considering the our application user base growth. It may be down the line six months, it may be down the line one year, whatever it may be. Let's look at the failover testing. So as we already know that, so we got two data centers or we got two different set of systems. One is at one place and another one is in a different place, right? So why we do the failover testing? Let's see. Let's say we are becoming very famous. Okay. But we are established like all of our servers are, we have put in some X, X location. So the X location is, you know, very uh, prone to some geographical disturbances. Like it may be, frequent earthquakes or heavy rainfalls, floods, it may be anything or it may be frequent fail of uh, frequent power failures. So this X data center having some problem very frequently. So we don't want to lose. So whenever there is a problem, definitely we are not able to reach by the real user. So there will be an impact for our business, right? So to avoid that kind of situation, like if it is taking, if, if you are not available now online, definitely it is a business loss to us. Why it is a business loss to us? Because so our application is, if not our application is not available, definitely customers will not buy anything on us. So if they are not buying anything, buy anything on us means we are losing our business. So what we need to do, definitely we need to have a backup plan or we need to have all our data center in a different location. So we are putting some diff we are putting, we are also establishing our application or our server in a different location. Let's say Y. So the primary data center we have at X and the secondary data center at Y, right? So we are putting a load balancer to distribute the load evenly between them. Okay. So all these type of the load testing has been derived from the Situ real time situation, real time scenarios. So these all the kind of load testing that we can do in our daily performance tests live. So majorly we do load testing and stress testing very commonly. Okay. Now let us look at what are the various performance testing terminologies that we used in our daily life being a performance tester. So the very first thing we look at it, throughput. So in general terms, throughput is nothing but the amount of data that is being transmitted from one location to other location. Let's say if you do, if you take a traffic signal, so in a one minute, let's say all hundred vehicles have been transmit, all hundred vehicles are passing through a traffic signal. 
so we can say that traffic signal throughput is 100 vehicles per minute likewise the throughput is nothing but in performance testing the amount of bytes that were that has been transmitted and also we can determine in another way like the amount of transaction that can be carried out in a minute or in an hour or in a second okay so response times so are like this this is already we have discussed response times are nothing but the time which is taken by the page to the load means how quickly the page is be loading it may be in seconds or it may be in milliseconds okay next thing next thing is think time so think time is nothing but it is the waiting time between a page to page let's say you're doing a shopping right in your shopping you let you going to supermarket and you pick items one after the other you put in your basket right so think time is nothing but your nav you are going through the all the items in your supermarket and you will think and okay which item to pick or which item to not pick so the delay between or the you know the time gap between picking one item to another item is nothing but think time okay now let's look at peak load and average load peak load is nothing but for any application we may be not having the extreme high load on every day so some days we be we may be having very high load some days we may be having very low load so in a given period of time so what is the maximum number of users that have been visited so that day we call it as a peak load average to average load is nothing but so a normal day where we don't have any specific offers so users user load is very normal or not even it is not low but user load is low it is average that we call it as average load and the next thing is a breakpoint so breakpoint is nothing but where the system as we just discussed about in types of performance testing so breakpoint is nothing but where the application is breaking okay and the stability and scalability so stability is nothing but application should be available 24 by 7 without any failure so that is nothing but application is stable throughout the day right and it is able to handle the peak load and average load and the normal load without any issues so that is what the stability of the application and application is nothing but we just seen about the stress testing right in stress testing what we have we have done nothing but we have found what is the peak capacity of the testing peak capacity of the application so in scalability testing we have two kinds again vertical scalability and horizontal scalability so vertical scalability is nothing but we are just increasing the capacity of the hardware we are not changing the number of system just we are putting the number of systems as constant and we are increasing the capacity of the system let's say increasing the cpu ram and hard disk or the network okay so this is nothing but a vertical scalability whereas in horizontal scalability we are we are just keeping the amount of hardware same in each and every system but we are increasing the number of system let's say we have 10 systems so in horizontal scalability we increase it to 20 systems means we have increased the number of servers that are supporting our application so this is nothing but horizontal scalability so these are the most common used performance testing technology that we use in our upcoming sessions welcome to welcome to helpingtesters.com today we are going to cover about business requirement analysis and approach and under that we are going to mainly see about understanding the business and how it is important in identifying the various business critical flows and how we come come to a load model let's look at so understanding the business so normally majority of the time performance testers fail yours to understand the right business what the business will do what is the need of the application for the business so if it is properly understand then we can derive a right test plan and all the performance testing approach will be successful whole performance testing will become a failure so let's look at the very first thing we need to get from this team is we need to get the application architecture 
so our application will mainly help us to understand so what are the various systems available in our test environment and as well as how it would be in the production so let's say if the production system is having 100 servers so test environment may not be or may be having equal amount of the servers or less okay so understanding the application architecture will give us a clear picture like how each and every component of the system or the application will be interconnected to each other those will be used for monitoring whenever we are doing the performance testing and the second thing is application implementation technology application implementation technology is one of the thing that we need to also understand before taking over any application for the performance testing because application technology will also play a key role in terms of scripting so few applications may be quite complex and if you see if you if you take an example majority of the dotnet applications are having a lot of dynamic things in their request so the time taken for the scripting them all will take a lot of time to complete so it would also will be helpful for us to understand the effort and also we can give a right estimation for the scripting let's take another example like google web tool kit so this has become in the last two three years that has become usually very wide so if you consider any GWT application for the te test scripting using a normal application using the virtual user generator or any performance testing tool there will be a problem if you are not having a proper understanding what is the background implementation of the technology so your tools will not be able to capture the all the traffic of the application if the GWT framework is used so you should be having an advanced knowledge into how you need to do the scripting part for GWT so that's why application implementation technologies they plays one of the key role when you are trying to do performance testing and also to be more precise talking to the developers is also one of the important thing because developers are the persons whenever you get stuck with one application functionality or one application page is not working properly as expected definitely you need to know what's happening in the background for that particular page so you always need to talk to the developer so whenever you face an issue sometimes you may be sometimes you may not be but if given a chance go and talk to the developers whenever you stuck with any issues with the application and also talk to the testers sometimes talking to the testers or approaching them will give a better understanding of the application what it will do because uh, other i mean to say here testers are nothing but functional testers or manual testers because they will be knowing in and out of the functionality of the application so talking to them will help you to understanding the application business and various functionalities of the application and talk to the product owner that is right so talk, talking to the product owner will help us to understand what would be the upcoming feature that they are planning and what would be the rollout so based on that we can we can get prepared for upcoming feature to be handled for the performance testing and also sometimes talking to the dba whenever you stuck with some performance issues will also help will be able to you know get resolve the some of the performance issues which are arise due to the database so better always keep in touch with the database administrator also to get and avoid most of the performance issues and one more important thing that i would like to bring up here so we should never start our performance testing unless until the application is functionally stable otherwise we may lead into a lot of duplicating duplicating of scripting effort so which would waste off our time so my dear friends i always suggest as a best practice until unless the application is functionally stable do not start the performance test scripting sometimes people say go and do though the application is not stable but all it depends on the situation if you have a tight timelines definitely you need to go and you cannot deny that but the best standard practice is you should be having a application should be functionally stable otherwise 
your script may be recorded may be needing again rescripting look at how to identify the test script flows okay why we called specially the flows are the business critical flows okay so for the performance testing normally we do not test for each and every application functionality for performance testing because based on the load of the particular functionality we go and do the performance testing for them only otherwise if we do it for each and every functionality it does not add any value to the performance testing let's say there is a x feature which is to be used most of the most of the users in the production so in that case testing that particular feature will be helping us to determine any performance bottleneck otherwise let's take another application so in every application there may be something called uh, application map or some there is a functionality which is not used by the users so in that case if the if there there would be no load or the load will be very less on that particular feature so testing them testing that particular feature for higher number of users will not add any value because that particular feature will not be used by the users as much we expected so identifying the right functionality is playing a key role in the performance testing so let's look at various things that we do while we collect the business critical flows so the very first thing is based on the feature criticality let's say there is a feature called paying the product so whenever we select any product and adding it to the cart and once we pay the item so you see if you fail if you get any errors so whenever you're paying for that particular item the amount will be deducted and if the user sees okay there is a payment error on his page so he will be in trouble now let's say he may he, he may be assuming that he lost his money but the product was not confirmed so in that case if it happen again and again for the different set of users so there will be a lot of calls to the customer care so that would be you know that would be a, that would be a creating lot of impact on the business so obviously it will result into business loss and next thing is based on the feature usage in the production let's say there is an x feature let's take an example for amazon.com so there the most frequently used feature in amazon.com searching for a product so everyone will come with their own search key and they will search on the amazon.com for their product so this search feature is used by the many people worldwide so testing the particular testing that kind of the feature will be giving a good result and if the user is not able to get the results quickly then that would be result into again okay user may be think okay this particular application is very slow i don't want to buy anything on this side so likewise so based on the based on the feature usage we can consider that as a one of the performance flow for the testing next thing is taking the advice so sometimes taking the advice from the product owner or from the business will help us to gather the right business requirements because business knows what happens and which particular user which particular feature will be used by the majority of the users and what are the features that are upcoming they will be understand business will be understanding quite easily so they can help us to derive the right business critical flows for the performance testing and also in ter in terms of the load they will be helping us so and next thing once you gather all the business critical flows are nothing but the application functionalities which are need to be covered for the performance testing so you need to be documented in various documents some people document them in test approach uh, test approach tells about how your performance testing that you're going to be conducted and some people document them into the test plan or test strategy document so there are as of now i'm not going to cover about test strategy or test plan any kind of documentation but just i would like to say documenting will help us to keep track everything what we are going to cover we have discussed the way how we collect so far uh, how to collect the business critical feature but collecting them for various applications like 
brand new application or it may be any existing application or it may be a maintenance application for a brand new application you need to go and the scratch together to derive the business requirements or business flows so for the brand new application the time that we take to understand the application and the time that we take for identifying the business critical flows and the load everything will be heavy if you look at an ex existing application so existing application may be already having some flows covered so we need to identify which all list of the part are yet to be covered like there are any new features that are being added for the applications are these new features definitely needed for the performance testing or not so that we can cross check with the business and we can add them for the performance testing and maintenance applications so these maintenance applications may not be having a drastic changes or they may not be having a lot of changes that are to be needed for in scripts and so that we need to identify which particular feature has got request changes so we can cross check that from the functional testers or from the developers so that particular part just we can replace in our test script and we can carry out the testing task for a brand new application so if we speak in terms of load so we don't know how many users will be used by these application in the production so there will be a better approach that normally we follow as a standard approach like the stay step approach it means let's start we will be starting with a less number of load and we will start doubling the load let's say we started for the uh, business critical flows with 100 users and we simply multiply and see if the application is deviating from deviating in terms of sla or in terms of server resources so based on that we we increase the load into double and we'll see whether the application is stable or not and for the ex existing application so we will be getting most of the thing from the product owner or the business so we don't need to worry about it if we are not getting from the business so we can do a benchmarking for them for the existing and maintenance application and also sometimes apart from this sometimes we can also depend on the application logs if the application is already in the production so we can dive through those logs and we can get the which particular feature will be you which particular features are already being used in the production so based on that we can derive a right business critical flows and the respective load model so in that case most of the time database administrator and application logs will be helpful so these are the things that we have discussed to gather business requirement analysis and approach thank you welcome to helpingtesters.com now we are going to cover about load under architecture in detail so as we discussed in our previous sessions we have learned about various components of the load under those are nothing but virtual user generator controller analysis and load agents now let us look at very detailed level metrics of these each of the components now let us look at the virtual user generator so this is the very first component you will be dealing with if you want to start with a load runner so this virtual user generator is used for the scripting so we are scripting nothing but capturing the browser traffic or any other application traffic using the virtual user generator so the virtual user generator is nothing but a test script so the test script saved will the extension called dot usr nothing but user okay so next let us look about the other component of the load runner controller controller is the very important component of the load runner because this is the only part which we need to buy license so controller is nothing but a heart of the load runner or we can say it is a supervisor for the load runner so controller will take whatever the scripts that we have built in the virtual user generator so those will be transferred to the controller it may be one script or multiple scripts so we can pass all the scripts generated by the virtual user generator and we can give it to the controller so in controller we do all the settings like how many users that we want to do for each of the script and also for how long you want to run test it may be one hour test it may be 30 minutes test or it may be eight hours test 
so everything will be set by the controller so controller decides so how long you want to run that or how much load you want to run the test so controller itself cannot do anything controller is nothing but a supervisor so in our offices so supervisor just will instruct with its subordinates to get his work done so likewise controller will take the help of load agents are nothing but load generator so these load agents are end components which will generate the actual load on the targeted system so it may be targeted system may be your amazon.com or it may be any application which you want to test okay so here controller will be having all these load agents configured under it so we can we will see more details how we configure them in controller in detail in our latest sessions but as of now controller just remember controller is a part which will instruct the load agents to generate the load on the targeted system so we define everything under controller so as we just seen virtual user generator saves the file with the .usr extension similarly controller saves the its file or in controller terminology we call it as a scenario controller scenario so this controller scenario will be saved with an extension called .lrs nothing but load runner scenario okay so we will put all the user scripts or all the virtual user script to the controller and we will do execute them using the controller so once controller starts the executing for whatever the load that we wanted it will generate an output file nothing but load runner results so before starting the test we need to configure this where you want to save this test results so test results will be saved under dot lrr extension so once your test is done so these results can need some external tool or these results need a tool to analyze and to make some beautiful graphs and to get some meaningful metrics out of this result so analysis is the tool which will help us to open these result open the results generated by the controller and this analysis will be useful to draw some beautiful graphs or some transactional level or a uh, transactional level or client side metrics everything can be covered using the analysis so once you open these results whatever the generated which by the controller so which are having a dot lrr extension so once you open it with the analysis so if you want to save you can save with them you can save them with dot lra extension nothing but load runner analysis so just what have we learned so virtual user generator creates an extension called dot usr so which will be given to the controller and controller we whatever the controller generates the file we call it as a controller scenario so which will be saved with the extension called dot lrs so once you start the test there is something need to track all the test results right so that can be tracked by the dot lrr nothing but load render results so this lrr can be opened by the analysis okay so load render results will be opened by the analysis so once you open the analysis either you can save them with the dot lra extension or you can save that analysis file whatever you have opened or you can just ignore it and close it so for a single controller you can configure either one load agent or you can configure multiple load multiple load agent so here if you see we have three load agents for this particular controller so in real time we can configure as many as load agents we need so sometimes why we need to have more than one load generator so whenever you are trying to do execute for hundreds and thousands of user load so one load one load agent is not sufficient to handle or to generate that much load on the targeted system so definitely we need to take the help of other load agents okay that we need to configure with the help of controller so there is a one particular component in the controller so which will keep track of you know load agent communication process nothing but so lr bridge dot exe so which will keep tracking of all the connected load agents to the controller and also once you start the execution with the controller so controller will generate a particular process called mmdrv dot exe so these are the process which will be generated in the windows machine or windows these will be generated as a windows process so this process will be actually generating the load on the 
targeted environment okay welcome to protocol introduction now we're going to see about protocol in our general terminology and also what is the meaning of protocol in low run terminology so let us look at what is the protocol definition in our general terminology nothing but a set of rules which decides the way of communication between the two endpoints so if you take a system which is having an internet so the protocol it may be http protocol it may be tcp protocol it may be ft it may be telnet it may be ssh and it may be smtp and it may be imap and it may be ableton and there are n number of protocols in our internet terminology but if you look at the load runner load runner protocol terminology sounds in a different way in load runner terminology a protocol is nothing but the way the client is talking to the application is defined by the protocol so let us take an example recording an application if you if you wanted to perform is testing for a web application so now let us look at protocol introduction so now we have about what is the protocol in our general terminology what is the meaning of protocol in low runner terminology and how it works so let us look at in our internet terminology a protocol is nothing but set of rules which governs the communication between the two endpoints or between the two end systems it may be our laptop and it may be the google server and it may be our laptop it may be with the amazon.com server so a protocol is defines the way how you are contacting with the targeted system or the targeted server so if you take an example for internet protocol you can you can take as an example http is a one of the protocol that we widely use and the tcp ip protocol and uh, ftp protocol for file file copy and uh, file upload download services and ssh for the shell service and smtp for the mailing services and imap is for also mailing mailing services likewise there are n number of protocols welcome to protocol introduction now we are going to see about what is the protocol definition and how it can be elaborated in the terminology of load runner okay let us look at what is the protocol definition in our general a protocol is nothing but it a set of rules which governs the transmission between the two end systems so the end system may be a client or nothing but a laptop and a server nothing but let's say as an example we can consider amazon.com so to communicate amazon.com normally we use the browser so we use the browser using the http protocol so if you are using any other application like it may be mobile application any desktop application which will be using uh, tcp ip protocol likewise there are other protocols ftp protocol for that file transfer smtp and imap is for mail services ssh is for the uh, shell service and likewise there are these are the internet various internet protocols that are available that normally daily we use okay so let us look at what is the meaning of protocol in low runner terminology in low runner terminology protocol is nothing but the way how the low runner is communicating to the targeted server nothing but whichever the application that we want to do performance testing okay so a protocol defines how we can communicate to the targeted system or how we can project the load on the targeted system using the load runner if you take as an example in load runner if you want to perform a test for a web application let's say amazon.com so which is a uh, which is a online shopping cart if you want to test that if you want to test that application using the load runner so we can use any of these protocols we can use either web http html or click and script or the true client so these are the three protocols that are commonly offered by the load runner likewise there are other applications like if you want to test the citrix applications you have the citrix ico protocol and if you want to do remote desktop application performance testing you can use rdp protocol and if you want to do performance testing for sap application so either you can do it by the sap gui and sap web okay and likewise if you want to do performance testing for database it may be oracle database or it may be any other database so you can use the odbc protocol and also you can use java user okay likewise the protocols in the load runner defines the way how you are communicating or how you are generating the load on the targeted system 
so if you take web http protocol or web application related protocols are very commonly used protocols in the load runner now we are going to look about very in detail about the web http protocol and how it works what are the various things that we can apply for the web http and how we can do performance testing using the web http protocol so that we are going to discuss in detail Welcome to helpingtestus.com. Today we are going to cover about introduction to web protocols. So far in our previous sessions, we have learned about what is the meaning of protocol and how it is mapped in terms of load runner. And also we have seen what are the various types of protocols that load runner supports and how we can use, how we can map in terms of load runner. So that's all we have seen just on a high level. Okay, now we are going to dig more in detail about web protocols and that too for web HTTP HTML protocol. Okay, so let's let's look at so what are the various things that we are going to cover in our session. Various protocols available. I will take you through the virtual user generator and I will show what are the things, what are the various protocols that are available. And also I will show how to create a web HTTP protocol. Web HTTP protocol sometimes it will also called as web http html protocol so we don't need to confuse if i say web http or web http html okay and also we will be covering about virtual user generator overview and uh, we will also see various controls and use let's get into the virtual user generator if you look at here so once your load under setup is done the complete setup i'm talking about so once your complete setup is done you will see these three components on your desktop or you can find them on your programs okay so in order to start the virtual user generator definitely we must open the virtual user generator component so this is the one uh, which will be used for the scripting part or we can use the test we can create the test script using the virtual user generator so i'm opening the virtual user generator right now i'm just to give an overview i'm using a 12.53 version so going forward, I will also take you to the, the latest version we have 12.55. Okay, let's look at, see once you once your virtual, virtual user generator launched, you will see here some startup page and various menu options available. Okay, so I was talking about the protocols, right? So those protocols, you can, you can click, you can see by just clicking on new solution here. So these are the various protocol lists that are available so here you can see the two sections here single protocols and multiple protocol and rest of these mostly these are you know not much not widely used uh, by industry so these are single protocol and multiple protocols these will be used majority of the times single protocol is the one which we use for the web application so just i will take you through what are the various protocols that web application support so to support the web application the very first that we use ajax click and script so this is very rarely used normally we don't prefer to use this this has a, some complexity side to develop this script this kind of script and sap web this protocol is for exclusively for sap web applications and true client web so true client web is nothing but this is something works like a selenium protocol it will launch a real browser and based on the real browser object this protocol works okay and I were, we were talking about web http html protocol right so this is the protocol 90 percent of industry for the web applications used by this protocol web http html protocol some people call it as a web http some people pronounce it as a full web http html and also if you get into other protocols like mobile applications so true client mobile web and also true client native mobile so these are the other two protocols that are also comes as part of web applications and also there is one more protocol that is nothing but web services since web services are part of web applications right so that's why we are bringing this into web protocol first okay how to create web http html script so as a first step you must select in order to create a web http protocol so you must select web http html protocol here and you must give some meaningful name for your script 
so let's say i am giving the script name as demo so and also you need to mention where you want to save the scripts so right now i am saving my scripts under c scripts folder by default if you are not selecting any specific locations it will be saved under your document so once your load under installation is done it will automatically create a folder under virtual under your documents or user documents a folder called vugen it is nothing but virtual user generator some people call virtual user generator in short as vugen okay so once you open it you will find a folder called script so this these folders automatically created by the load runner so we don't need to worry about where you are saving just you need to be conscious where you want to save because if you want to use them at a later point of time so you must be remembering the path of where you are saving the script so let's go and create this simple script that is nothing but web http protocol so i'm creating it once your script components have been loaded basically you will see this first place that once you started creating your script so actually i will divide these into four pans one is the menu pan and another one is the solution explorer on your left side and this is the script script place or script component area and this is the status area or nothing but it may be related to your script status and everything will be updated let's get into details about each of this pan so once you start once you created any new script by default load runner creates three files or you can call them as three actions one is v user in it action and v user in so these will be automatically created and these comes with default once you create any new scripts and it won't contain any data or it won't contain any code as of now okay so you you must remember by default load runner creates or virtual user generator creates these three files v user in it action v user in why virtual user generator created these three files we will discuss about them in detail in our later classes so let's look at what other file it creates global.h which is nothing but header file since virtual user generator works on c language and all the components or the apis for the load runner everything is built on the c apis or c c libraries so it will try to import all those c libraries so once you create any new scripts by default this global.h also will be created along with this default three actions so let's look at what is there so as we know as we just discussed virtual user generator works on c programming language right so it imports d by default it will run these three header files okay these three header files are required in order to run your web http html protocol if you want to create any explicit c variables you can create them under global variables section so you can create i just created some new lines here so this global variables so you can create any new c variables if you need to have them used in your script okay so this is about global.h now let's look at what is the runtime settings there is one more option which we have is runtime settings runtime settings is nothing but so once your scripting is done or once your recording is done you need to run your script at least one time or if you want to run in a controller so this runtime said whatever the settings that you have applied under runtime settings based on those settings your script will run we will have a separate session on this runtime settings okay and the next thing is the parameter pan so in this pan it will show all the list of parameters that we have created as part of script we'll also have a separate session about what are these and replay or run so once you replay your script it will show up all the replay content or replay log on and the replay summary under this replay summary pan okay now you are done with the solution explorer and let's look at so you you would have already understood that so whatever we click here whatever we click on from your left side pan so those content will be rendered 
on this right side content on this first first half of right side content okay so this is actually rendering content rendering pan that we can call it as now let's look at what are the various menus that are available so if you make any changes this is the save button will be enabled automatically so we just can click on save to save those values and this is undo and this is redo if you make any script changes those will be doing and this is regenerate your script option so let's say you have done some your script changes unfortunately you made some mistakes in your script so if you want to bring back your script to the previous condition or nothing but previous condition here means the moment once you completed your scripting or your script recording so this regenerate script option regenerate script option will bring back your script into the state of a fresh recording and this is recording options we will go we will, we will be discussing that in very soon in this class and this record this is the one which is actual to this button is used to start actual recording process and this button is for compilation or your script compilation let's click it and we will see what it says since load runner by default or virtual user generator by default generates some of the c programs or c functions so we can say each of this we use it is a function c function and action is a we use it function action is a c function and a user and also a c function so, so we don't have any code in that right so we can easily compile them and we won't see any compilation error and if we have anything it will show up here see it, it is showing it is showing once we clicked on the compile it will it is showing that what are the compilation errors if we have any otherwise it won't show any errors if no errors present it will show it as a no errors detected and this is the step by step replay we will also look at uh, look at these options once we started recording process and this is for replaying your script means once your script recording is done so if you want to execute whatever you have recorded we will use this button and this is the design studio so this is comes with some advanced options and this is for commenting section so if you select some set of statements and if you want to comment those statements you can use this comment and this is for start transaction and this is for end transactions we will also get into more details about it and this is one of the imp important options so you can change the layout using this so debug layout there are various different layouts available with this default layout re replay layout record layout plain layout debug layout so based on the situation if you want to it will simply match the pan into different locations based on the your choice you can select each of them by default i'm using the default layout and this is for show output pan so this is the uh, le let us get into that so this is just to show the output pan as of now just remember it and this is to show this is to show the steps navigator we'll also get into that and this is the thumbnail explorer and this is the show snapshot and this is for downloading content from any live hp network okay just we will also look about this later so now let's get into the other pan that we have at the bottom so let's start with the errors so if your script is having any errors those will be read those errors informations will be displayed here and the snapshot pan it is it will visualize the images or uh, html pages that are available that are that are available as part of your script recording we will get into more details once we started our recording process and this is output pan nothing but if you while you are running your script whatever the content that it will show the what are the content or the output that it generates everything will be shown here again this output pan has a different sections replay section compilation section and a code generation section so we will look at them later and the thumbnail explorer this is the some shortcut for if, if we click that so this thumbnail explorer will be highlighted okay so this thumbnail explorer will show the again some sequence of pages page images which are generated while you're recording okay so as of now it shows uh, it is disabled you can enable it from the tools we will look at it later so these are the some basic overview of uh, various controls available under your virtual user generator for web http html protocol
Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to helpingtesters.com. In this session, we're going to learn about how to set up the sample application. That is nothing but JPET store. So let's take a look at the steps. So at very first step, we need to download the JDK. So let me show you that how to download the JDK and set up. Okay, so simple go to google.com and just say download JDK. So it will take you to the Oracle dot com so there you can find out the latest version of the jdk so here you can select the jdk or click here and just go to accept terms and you can select if based on your system it, it may be 64 bit or 34, 34 bit so you can download the respective uh, version of the jdk it may be windows 64 or windows 64 or windows 32 so okay so in order to download you must be having registered with the oracle or sometimes you may it may be asking without uh, sign in so right now it is asking without signing so once your download is complete uh, you can go and uh, set up just by double click on it so i have already one downloaded version let me show you that so this is the latest jdk jdk 9 right now i have downloaded so i'm going to double click on it it's a simple wizard mode so you can easily able to identify all the steps clicking I agree and uh, click next 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 and finally you can submit okay so right now I'm just uh, submitting it so it will go and uh, continue further so to install you must be having administrative level access on your system So please be with patience, it will come up with some wizard to continue further. Okay, so a JDK is uh, come up with some window, so you can just click click next, 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 and uh, it will continue further. So once your installation is successfully done, you will be coming up with the finished status. So in my system, I have already installed JDK, so I don't want to continue further. But in your system, if, if you have already not installed the JDK, so please go ahead and continue with the complete setup so once your jdk is installed then the next step you need to set up the tomcat so now you need to copy the you need to download the latest version of the tomcat or any tomcat version which is above 8 so let me go and show how you can download the tomcat and how to set up it so go to your chrome so here you can just say download tomcat okay so you can go to the Tomcat uh, genuine site, so Apache Apache dot genuine site. So there you will find the, the various and latest version of the Tomcat. So here, where I'm, uh, I would like to install the Tomcat as a service. So I'm just downloading this. Just I clicked on it, so it is going to download. So it is just a 9 MB file. So my, once your download is finished, you can go and uh, set it up the file. So my, my download is completed. So I'm going to click on it. So just it is a simple easy wizard. Just I'm clicked on Tomcat. So it may be asking for some credentials or it may be asking for admin access. If your account is already having the service installation access, then that's fine. Otherwise, please get the admin access because to install as a service, you must be having a admin level privileges. So it is asking me to click yes then just it is a simple wizard just click next i agree next uh, here just select the host manager okay the, because we're going to uh, set up so in this step please be with uh, a bit warning here so you must be setting up some credentials here so you need to remember these uh, credentials so I, right now i'm setting it as a default admin admin for the both username and password Okay, so by default, uh, Tomcat listens on the 8080 port. So make sure that these ports are not used by any other application. Or if you would like to change these ports, you can change as you want if those are already occupied. So right now, these ports are not occupied uh, by any of the applications. So I'm just clicking on the next. So just you can click next, next and install so that it will go and uh, complete the further installation. So my Tomcat setup is ready now. So I'm just clicking on the finish. So it will try to start your Tomcat as a service on your machine. So now what you can do is,
sorry, this is the we have a previous conducted for the JD cancellation. So I'm just ignoring it. So now once your Tomcat is uh, done, then you can come in, uh, come down here. So you will be seeing this icon. So this icon means your Tomcat is uh, installed as a service. So by default, your Tomcat is started. If not started, okay. So just um, it is already started. I'm just closing it now. So if your Tomcat is not started, so you can click on start so that your Tomcat will be up and running now. So this stop button is enable means your Tomcat is running. So once your Tomcat is up and running, so now you can go to your browser and uh, just I'm going to the incognite model and uh, see here. So say type localhost 8080 because localhost means your application Tom your uh, Tomcat application is hosted on your machine that is nothing but local host and uh, we are running Tomcat and 8080 port. So just we are launching the Tomcat which is installed on our local. So here just you go to manager app so that whatever the credential that you set up previous in our previous Tomcat setup is it so you need to supply those credentials. Right now I did set up with admin admin so I'm just giving the credentials as admin admin so I'm able to I'm, I'm able to launch the Tomcat application manager so that I can deploy my uh, JPEG store application from here. So now the next thing is you need to download the var file which is provided uh, by me. You can always download uh, the var file from here uh, from this Google Drive or uh, you can download you can download it from the downloading of uh, helpingtesters.com. Okay, so once you download this var file, I will show you put it on your desktop or somewhere. Now I placed my JPEG store var file. So this is actually JPEG store application uh, web archive file. So you need to deploy this web archive file into your Tomcats. So let me sh let me sh show me the procedure for it. So I'm uh, going to my browser where I host where I opened the Tomcat application manager just a few seconds ago. So now here you are seeing something like a select var file to upload. So just click on choose file. So there you can show up the file, show up the var file wherever you place. So right now I place it on my desktop. So let me search for it. JPEG store var file. So the JPEG store var file I just selected. And once you selected that, just say deploy. So your Tomcat will be deploying the JPEG store where. So once your deployment is done, so that uh, JPEG store will come as part of your application list here. See, your JPEG store has been coming up here. So if you click on this, so it will open up the respective link. So now your JPEG store is ready. So now you can go and uh, register and you can go and play around JPEG store using the load runner. So this is how to simple three setups how you, you know a um, few setups how you can uh, uh, set up the JPEG store on your local machine so that why we are telling why we are explicitly telling to use your local host machine because if you use uh, JPEG store from an external hosted it may be from the internet so you are unnecessarily putting some stress on their uh, uh, server so it is not recommended to use that so instead you better host your JPEG store application on your local so that you will be having more control on the application so that you can create you, you can retain whatever the credentials that you created on your local host environment thank you so this is the various steps that you know how can you host JPEG store thank you welcome to helpingtesters.com in this session we are going to cover about some C basics so in order to work with a load runner, we must be knowing some of the C basics. This is not an in-depth class, but I will give you a brief introduction about what are the C variables and how we can use them in load runner while you are scripting. Let's get into that. Now let's get into how to use some of these C built-in programs or some of the C variables how we can use in the load runner. So to create that, we must be using virtual user generator web http protocol show you how you can do that so this is the web http protocol that i have selected in our ongoing classes we will be learning about more advanced topic of what are these functions and what are these methods we use in interaction and we user and, and what are these global data we will be learning them in detail so by default uh, virtual user generator works on 
the by default loader by default C language include libraries. So we don't need to worry about which libraries that we need to include as part of C. So by default, web HTTP scripts will bring all the necessary libraries that are required for your C language. So if you look at, let me write some of whatever the code that we wanted to write as part of C language. So we'll be writing under the actions part or any of these actions that are available under your script. So let me write all the code part or all the C language code part under action files. So let's start with some basic C variable. So if you look at in C language, we have to handle the int to handle the numbers. We have a data type called int. So it is nothing but the integer. So for this integer, you can give any name for that. Let's say it's a number you're trying to say, you're, you're trying to save a number value into the integer type. So this is the, how you need to declare a number or this is how you need to declare an integer in C language or in virtual user generator. Likewise, there are other data types. Those are nothing but float. So you need to give the what is the identifier that you want to give. So this is the name. This is the built in keyword. So you don't need to create any identifier or you don't need to create any variable with the existing any built in code. So the built in codes by default will be shown in blue color. So we should not, we should be avoiding them whenever you're trying to declare any variables or the identifiers. So likewise, there are other built-in data types available for C. Those are double and after that, we have the other data type called char, nothing but characters. So let me give some brief introduction about what are all these in which particular case we will use it okay let me reiterate the each and every type of it so integer is the one which would save all the integers or all the numbers so in this we won't be considering any decimal values means which are which are as part of points let's say 1.23 like this those values will never be used for integers instead integers instead integers will be holding only the plain numbers let's take an example so for this integer i'm saving some value called one two three four five likewise for the float number i'm giving one two three dot four five okay and the double is also somewhat uh, similar to the float number but it will save more bigger the size by default this integer size is the integer can hold only up to sixty four thousand five thirty five characters and also the float also like sometimes you may you may need a bigger number to store by the variable so in that case you can go to the double okay along with this the other type of data type we have to hold the alphanumeric values it may be alphabets or it may be numbers again so we call them as a literals or strings in our general programming language we call them as literals, literals or string so to use the literals or string we will be using another data type called character so in the character data type we will be giving the whatever the identifier name or the variable name so if you don't mention any if you want to say only one character then you should be mentioning it as without we are not mentioning any size for this particular character if you look at the other if, if you look at the other declaration that i made so it has uh, it has took it has it has took an index some something called a temp means this particular character array we call them as array because it, we are mentioning the group of characters to store into this particular variable. Let's say just I'm naming that they just I'm changing the name for it. It's a my name. Okay. So the very the difference between this and this this the very first declaration name doesn't have any specific size to be stored by default. It would be storing only one character. It means it can be it may be any character it may be number or it may be any character it may be alphabet it may be in uppercase or lowercase anything okay it cannot hold more than one character if you are not mentioning size for the array by default it would only hold one variable or one value for it likewise if you want to hold a particular name let's say you want to hold you want to save your name as a tester so i am giving some name called tester so tester 
so this is the some value i'm giving trying to put here so make sure that all the c statement by default will be terminated by a semicolon likewise so in this case you cannot declare multiple variables with the same name because uh, here for the integer you have already used to identify a name as number for the fig and float you cannot reuse the same name you can go with some different name as of now just i'm trying to remove this because i don't want to get any errors with them so this will became so if you look at this character array so the character array capacity is maximum it can store 10 characters so up to 10 characters we can give we can assign any value to this character array likewise you can declare any number of array of array size in your script let's say if you want to store some website address you can store it like website address let's say if you are mentioning uh, 10 characters double double dot google dot com so if you look at here google dot com is totally of the length uh, 9 uh, 3 6 3 4 4 3 7 7 3 10 10 totally 14 characters so by default you are mentioning the array size as a 10 but you are trying to store more than 10 characters so in this case let's see what it would return so i'm running it so this is the key this is this is the icon just look at this icon it would say this is used for running your script or running your the code as part of your virtual user generator so i'm running it so it will show some it, it is showing some error because we are trying to assign more than the size of the array so it is a compilation error because we are on the runtime itself on this uh, we are trying to assign some literals to the variables where variable size the declared variable size is lesser than than whatever the value that you are trying to assign it so if you bring down the size of it it would accept that particular value so if you look at if you look at i have remember i have removed some more characters so now it is accepting the number of characters that whatever i want to pass it for the character record website so if you want to store more bigger number make sure that in prior you are trying to allocate as much as many number of characters that you want to store so let's say google.com will never exceed more than 20 characters so i'm assigning the google.com www.google.com to the variable called website so now it would accept because the array size that you're trying to that you have declared is enough to handle the length of the google.com so that is what so so far we have seen that okay we are we are assigning some values to it right so let's get into we know the variables of to variables to hold the numbers and we also know that variables to hold the characters and we also know that some variables to hold the strings are the group of characters similarly let's learn about some of the arithmetic operations so let's simply carry out some of the you know some of the two numbers let's say you're trying to have two numbers let's say number one i'm giving some meaningful meaningful names to the variables number one and the other number i'm going to declare is number two so in the number two i'm declaring i'm storing some value called 12 so let's now let's perform some basic arithmetic operation nothing but uh, we are doing some addition operation so let's do how we do uh, arithmetic operation in this c language using virtual user generator so i'm declaring another one so called as total so which would hold some of these two values so to do mathematical operations of addition so we will be using plus symbol in general so similarly in c language where we will also be using the same now we have we have been storing that value into addition of the number one and number two into the total so now let's run it whether it is really assigning or not or whether it is showing any compilation error so we just assigned but we really don't know whether this total value is being getting the value or not so you can use either c language print statement printf statement percentage d sum of or you can mention sum equal to percentage d so this is a very basic c syntax that you must be remembering 
so i'm just mentioning that okay i'm printing the whatever the value comes as part of summing of these two numbers and it would be stored into this total so i'm just i'm trying to assign i'm just trying to print this total whatever the total comes as part of your output log so let's run it now so if you look at here it is not we assume that this see this is the by default printing statement output uh, printing statement printf is trying to print on the your output console but this is a blunder in your c pro in your uh, virtual user generator because it won't print anything here instead there is another statement that you need to use in place of printf to print any statement on your replay log so for that we have a special function called lr output message so this function lr output message function is used is equal to the printf in c language since this is some of the customized library of the c language so if you use a printf statement that won't be working here so to in order to print something on your output console or on your replay log so here your output console is nothing but your replay log so in order to print something on your output log or replay log you must be using lr output statement so now let's run it again whether it is printing that or not so lr output message also similarly works like a printf statement so it would be taking two arguments or too many arguments so here we are trying to print the total so here we mentioned percentage d means it is a placeholder for integer or we, we are going to say I'm going to print something here which is a number so percentage D is for a specification for numbers so let's run it and whether it is prints or not at least this time it should be definitely printing the sum of that value sum of the total see if you look at here it shows the value has been printed here likewise we can perform any other operations it may be a uh, plus addition multiplication anything that we can use okay so let me do another operation so there is nothing but multiplication so let me change the statement here let me run it if you look at so it has made some of the multiplication of these two number number one and number two and it has given the output as expected so this is the way how you do some basic mathematical operations so we just seen some of the uh, mathematical operations right now let's jump into some of the real stuff that is nothing but handling or how to use the strings welcome to helping testers.com so now we are going to cover about another session of c basics using the virtual user generator so in our previous class we have learned about some of the basic basic into basic variables or basic data types that are available in c language which can be used in the virtual user generator and also we have seen some of the examples which tells about basic mathematical operations now let's look at the other crucial part of you other crucial part of c language that is nothing but working on strings or working on literals those are nothing but character so we have seen we have already learned about in our previous class about character so characters characters are the data types which holds the alphanumeric values or any special characters into your variable let's take an example that we are going to store first name and last name into two character arrays and we will be combining them into the resultant character array and we'll be printing it so let's so let's look at and how we can achieve that so i'm declaring to hold the first name i'm declaring a variable called first name character array and i'm assigning my name my name to that that is nothing but first name and also i'm taking another variable or another character array to store the last name last name of 10 make sure that you should not be forgetting semicolon at the end of each statement otherwise it would result into a syntax error syntax error so let me store my last name is last name and i'm saving it 
So now we have directly saved first name and last name into two character arrays, first name and last name. Now our goal is to combine both of them into one single character array. So we are expecting that okay, the sum of the character arrays will be 20 characters because the sum will be because just by default we took first name last name as 10 characters. So let's create another character array which holds the total size of the two arrays whatever the first name and last name so i'm declaring the another array to store the sum of those values okay so we cannot use here any automatic operations to automatic operators to hold the to to combine the first name and last name instead we are using some built-in tree function c functions to achieve that activity those are nothing but c string functions so all c string functions will start with str so what we are trying to do is first we need to save the first name into full name and after that we need to save last name into full name so that full name gets combine 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 uh, value of first name and last name together so let's look at which for c function will be helpful for us to carry out that activity so we can make use of strcpy is a function which is used to copy a string a value of a string to another character array or to another string so here what is the the string called strcp we will take two things the very first the very first argument will be or the very first part of it would be the destination means the assignment of the is all string functions will always be from the right to left it means whatever the value on the right side will be assigned to the left side so our target is to first store the last first name into your full name so we have stored our first name into full name so now just to make sure that whether we are storing it or not we are trying to print that so i'm writing lr output message so first name percentages here percent previously we have seen in our automatic automatic operators we have seen about percentage d to print the number any number into your output statement so which can be put as part of lr output message so similarly in order to print any string we will be using some special formatter nothing but percentage as nothing but for the strings so we are trying to store we are trying to print the full name okay and after that let's run it so we will be running step by step let's check whether the full name has got whatever the value that we wanted to have as of now so here the full name has got first name otherwise let's change it we are trying to change it as alpha just to avoid the confusion and we am trying to put the last name as a beta so let's run it again so if you look at here in our replay log so full name for the, the first name so called as alpha has already copied into the full name so what is our next activity we our next activity is to copy the last name into full name so here if you use again the string copy string copy will always replace the existing content of the whatever the character array and it will copy the new value so here if you directly use strcpy with the full name and the last name what happens like it will overwrite the previous it will it will clear up already existing string that is nothing but your alpha will be removed and a very recent value will be available if you use strcpy so now if you if you run so your full name will be printing at the first time it would be printing alpha and for the second time instead of printing alpha beta it would print only beta so let's let's look at how it prints so we are assuming that it is a full name so let's look at what it prints see instead of printing the complete name together for the first time it has printing only the first name alpha that is expected and if you look at this the second statement full name instead of printing the alpha beta it is printing only beta that is because strcpy function will erase whatever the content 
in this full name will be erased and it will copy the latest value so the older value will not be available in your full name so that's why we should not be using the strcpy here instead we are going to use strcat function nothing but we are concatenating the last name into the full name for the first time we have copied the first name and for the second time we instead of copying it we need to concatenate so concatenation is nothing but without losing the any existing content in your character array we are trying to append new value to it it means your first name alpha will not be moved out of your full name variable so let's look at whether it works or not so just remember this output in your previous our previous replay so it has printed first name as alpha that is expected but the sec full name as beta but it, that is not expected so now let's look at if it our str c8 is able to append the whatever the last name we have into the full name see here this is what expected right so alpha beta is the one that is a full name that we are expecting so these are the basic two three c functions that we mostly use in our virtual user generator whenever you are trying to deal with web applications so this is about how to use character arrays into your virtual user generator likewise let's get into other topic in our next session so called as we will be looking at control structures welcome to helpingtestas.com in our previous sessions we have learned about some of the c basics in terms of c variables and we have seen some of the arithmetic operations and also we have seen some of the string operations now let's look at about the control structure so what let us understand what is a control structure so if we divide control structure is nothing but which would control your execution of the program let's say here if you look at this program will be executed sequentially one after the other based on the lines that whatever we have written so control structures will control the way of execution your program executes so let's learn about the, some of the important control structures available in your c language those are nothing but if if control structure and after that along with l along with if we will be using else and also we will be using while and also we will be using for control structure and also we will be using do while so let me align this properly so this is the do while statement okay these are the very basic control structures and important control structures we will be using in our day to day life in your virtual user data so let's take an example with the very first statement called if statement so if statement is used to compare a condition let's say we know that 1 equal to 1 right so 1 is always equal to 1 and 1 is always not equal to 2 okay so this is how we check the conditions using with the help of operators so let's say we have two variables int 1 equal to some 5 and int 2 equal to some 5 so if we are trying to compare whether the both the values are equal or not we will be using if statement so let's look at how we achieve that so here in c language instead of using one equal to in order to compare anything we will be using two equals it means if both are equal then the underlying statement which is in the brackets will be executed let's say i'm printing some statement using lr output message both numbers are equal so i'm printing it now so if 1 equal to 2 then first value equal to second value then it will print both value equal to both values are true so let me change some value and let's check whether it will compare it will go with the actual comparison or not so 6 never equal to 5 so that's why the statement will not be executed 
that is nothing but LR output message will not be executed and it won't be printing in your output statement. Let's consider a situation. So when these are not equal to these, these two values are not equal to each other, then we want to print something else. Means we are need we need to say both are not equal. So for that purpose to print to use that we will be using other statement called else. Else is nothing but whenever your first statement of if fails then only the else will be executed if your condition fails here in if condition let's say one not, one equal to equal to two whenever that becomes false then the underlying else code will be executed now let's look at whether it is executing or not so so far when we verified this particular statement was not executed so now it would be executing because we have added else statement so just I'm running it. See, it has printed the else part of it. Both are not equal. So make sure that just remember if else statements how we are writing in our programming language, in our in our virtual user generator for a web HTTP script, we will be using if else statement extensively whenever we are trying to implement some of the complex scenarios. So make sure that you are thoroughly properly planning and thoroughly following up this if else statement and if you are able to understand it, it would be helpful. Now let's look at other control structure that we see in first statement. So let's say you are trying to print something five times or repeatedly if you would like to do something, some activity repeatedly. So for that purpose we will be using first statement. So First statement basically divided basically takes uh, three things. The very first one is initialization and test condition. And after that, it would be either increment or decrement. So we need to decide which what we want to do. Okay, now let's do one simple activity. Let's say we want to print hello 10 times in, in our output log. So let me write a simple code for that. So to write to, to write that, so we don't need to use any of them. Instead, just we need to have a one simple variable called loop. So here we need our target is to print our target is to say hello 10 times. So where we need to start, we need to start from the first iteration or first we need to start from the printing first statement. So until how many times we want to print we, we need to print unless until the value becomes 10 so what we need to do here since we are starting from the 10 and we need to print it 10 times mean so we are in, we need to increase one after the other one by value one by one the value we need to increase for the loop so just copy the value loop and just loop plus plus it means the value will be increased so plus plus is an operator which will be by defaultly incremented by one so loop plus plus is the statement so which increases the existing value of loop existing value of the whatever the value loop has by one so for the first time it would execute the loop equal to one and then it will go and print underlying statement of the for and for and it will go and check the condition if loop less than or equal to 10 means one less than or equal to 10 then it will go and increment the value so let's look at whether it is print really printing or not so in output statement i'm writing something hello here okay let me run it whether it is really printing the hello here 10 times or not if you look at so hello here has been executed or printed 10 times so first statement is also one of the mostly used statement or we will be using this is extensively in our web http script whenever we need whenever we're trying to create some of the complex scripts now let's get into other control structure that is nothing but while while is also works similar way like how for loop works but in for loop we mention the condition in your bracket itself but in while loop 
we can explicitly mention condition when to break your while loop while loop so your for loop will execute until you were increment or your condition fails but in in case of while while execute unless until you say it to the break you you need to tell you need to explicitly tell the while loop to break the condition or break come out of the loop unless until it won't never it will never come out of the loop it will keep on iterating so let's take an example so i'm trying to print the again 10 times so loop not e loop equal to so while we'll just simply take the condition so while loop less than or equal to 10 so what we are trying to do we are trying to print statement some okay hello here similar statement we are trying to print here so whenever you are trying to do this so while loop will never exit it because we have to explicitly assign out of the loop for the whatever the variable that you are trying to use in while loop so here I am assigning loop value equal to 1 so you need to explicitly as I said you need to explicitly mention the condition otherwise your while loop will never come and exit and it would get into infinite loop so here I have not added any condition to break the while loop so let's look at how it breaks to break the condition so it would be executed only for 10 times to to validate that condition so i'm automatically I'm, i just have added one more one more statement so called as loop plus plus it means we are incrementing value for value whatever is there under loop and it would be incremented and verified every time for each and every iteration it would be verified and uh, if it, it would be checked with the condition called number less loop less than or equal to 10 so whenever this loop value reaches to 10 so it would be breaks okay whenever it, it okay it's not 10 it's 11 so whenever the value reaches to the 11 this condition will break and it will come out of the loop so this is one way to break your loop so let's look at whether it is breaking or not after that we will be looking at the other way of breaking your while loop so here so it has executed 10 times then it was broken so sometimes instead of executing it 10 times i want to break my while loop at fifth statement itself or i want to execute before 10 actual condition needs to break so now i want to break my loop at whenever loop value becomes 5 so for that i have added one special statement called break so break is used to explicitly break your while loop before reaching the end of the statement or if you want to explicitly break your while loop and it, it if you want to commit out of the multiple iteration so you can use break so here i have used if condition within the while so what it will try to do if condition it will if condition will try to compare the loop value with 5 so whenever the loop value becomes 5 then it will come and exit the loop so let's look at whether the break is really working or not so it's done so we have printed it has printed hello five times only because you have added the condition loop equal to three loop, loop equal to five so when the condition met and it broke in the while loop. so this is how your while loop works similarly there is one more control structure that we have already discussed about that is nothing but do while so do while is the statement which is similar to while instead of that while loop executes whenever your condition satisfies only the while loop exit go and execute the underlying statement so instead in do while loop it would execute at least one times the underlying statement whatever you have written under your do under your statements let's say hello here so the only difference between while and do while is do will be executing the output output statement at least once without checking any conditions so let's say after that i'm putting loop plus plus whenever loop reaches to 10 it needs to break so here it would at least without checking the condition it would print the hello here at least once based on that again it will go and continue with the loop so let's check it whether it is happening or not see here 
this output hello here is executed at least one time so let's do a count so this three three six and uh, this is totally executed 10 times so this is how a do while statement the only difference is it will execute this statement at least once where while loop doesn't execute without passing the condition so these are the some of the basic control structures and uh, some of the basics about uh, C language that would be used very widely in your C language in your virtual user generator scripting thank you welcome to helpingtesters.com in this session we are going to learn in detail about how to record a web application using the web HTTP protocol and various recording options available with the web HTTP HTML protocol let's look at what we can do with this as we see in our previous session just to create uh, how to create a web http protocol so let's look at let's start with the web http protocol for recording a functional flow so i'm just selecting web http protocol web http html protocol here so i'm just naming it as a demo script so my script will be saved under uh, c drive and the script folder so let's create we have already seen what is the use of various controls available in this virtual user generator protocol let's look at how to record a protocol see in our previous session we have discussed this record button is used to record the particular web flow whatever we want to script using this web html protocol let's launch so you can alternately either you can click this or alternately you can click you can use a keyboard shortcut or control plus r so ideally let's go with the record with this so I just click I just clicked on the record button so as soon as you click on the record button it will launch a window so which will be asking some basic inputs from you to start your recording so let's look at the very first one is record into action so you can here select v user in it action and v user in. so what are these as we discussed in our previous session so these are comes from here so these are the various default actions available uh, which has been already created by the virtual user generator v user init action and v user init so if you select whatever the option that you select uh, though whatever the script that generates will be get into this particular action so i am right now i am selecting the defaultly as action so whatever the steps i am recording everything will get into the action method and here you can select which browser that you want to use either it may be the browser or if you want to select any windows application or if you want to uh, use the load run as a proxy or if you want to do something else so don't worry about all these options at the moment just since we are we want to record the web application right just select the web browser and the next option that we have is so since you select the web browser right it would be asking for which particular web browser that you want to record so here i have various uh, browser options that are available so by default internet explorer which comes with the windows machine so as a first priority it is showing the windows internet explorer and along with that uh, by default load runner will comes with the firefox which is already installed in the load runner installation directory we will look at about it later but if you want to go with the firefox browser you can select and if you have installed a chrome browser if you want to record using the chrome browser you can select that respective browser here so all the available browsers that you can uh, select if if the particular browser is available so it will show up here otherwise you can go with default internet explorer and make sure that whatever the application that you are planning to record should support the respective browser that you're selecting okay so let's get it and the other field url address so this is the one where you input what is the first page that you want to start with the respective application so here I'm using a demo application demo out dot .com. so this is one of the sample applications that we have available on the internet so here I'm giving you need to give the complete address of the way the very first page where you want to start so this is my first page and you have two options so one is the immediately and another one is the delay mode so if you select the immediately so once you clock click on start recording immediately the browser launch and it will start recording from the moment when the browser launched so if you want to go with uh, with this option so it will immediately record all the traffic as soon as the browser launch so here if you select the in delayed mode so you though your browser launches it will not immediately start the recording 
unless until you need to explicitly go and enable the recording option once your browser is launched so some people use some people prefers to use this some people prefers to use this so let me go ahead and use the immediately mode so since i have given uh, to start my i'm instructing the my browser to already as soon as you launch just go and go and open this application url so that's so that's why i don't want to put any delay as soon as the browser launch and this is a working directory so you, we will look at about it so all the your script temporary whatever the temporary files that have been created for your script so will be saved under this working directory so we don't need to worry about it so we we don't want to change it let's go with that and just say click on record okay just before getting into this so there is one more option called record options okay so let's get into it just i'm not going to show in detail of it as of now just i would like to go and show only one option for this based on the browser that you select so if you select mapping and filtering so this is the one option which will be useful if you are not able to record properly and everything so you can select the networks network level of settings either you want to select only windows net interface on your windows machine or if you want to select socket level information so based on the settings the level of traffic is being captured by the load runner so here right now i'm just selecting socket level and vnet level data capturing so you don't need to worry about what are the options available here i will take you through in our further sessions okay so just just keep in mind just okay whenever you try if, since it is a very basic session that i'm covering so you just go and select vnet and socket both together now just say click so that uh, that window will be disappear so now let's go and just say start recording and there is one more important thing since we select that internet explorer right so we should not be already having any instance of internet explorer already open because if it is already open your load runner recorder will not identify the whatever the new browser instance that is launched because the pro browser proxy will not be diverted through the load recorder so that's why make sure that so whatever the browser that you are trying to record with make sure that it is not already open so let's go ahead and record it so the browser will be automatically launched here yep so and uh, it will also open whatever the browser whatever the application that we have instructed to open so it is automatically launching that whatever the application that we have given demo or dot catalan.com so it is opening the browser and make sure that before you are trying to perform any action on the browser may you must wait until this browser loading completes okay otherwise we may be missing couple of requests from the browser okay so once you started recording so it will launch a gui it will launch a recorder window for you okay so let let me take you through what are the various options so once your script is completed you must click on stop okay so then the your script will be generating and your browser will be closed okay and your script generation will start and if you want to do some debug whenever you are trying to record unfortunately let's say some feature is not working or if you want to make sure that uh, that particular debug process is not being recorded by the load runner so in that case you just go and click on this pass okay so if, if you want to resume back the your recording process instead of stopping just click on this record so it will resume and this will cancel the recording means it will not whatever the what are the requests that have been captured so far everything will be about it so just the difference between stop and cancel so this will once you click on the stop it will generate whatever the request it captured so far and if you say cancel uh, it will not generate any script for you and here since we selected our recording pointer in the recording options see we asked the view gen to record everything into action so it has started it has it has highlighted and it is showing that okay i'm recording everything into action method okay and this is for creating any new action so i will cover about it a bit later and this is the further start transaction and end transaction and this is for creating any render bus point we will also get into more details about it later and this is one of the very frequent that we use the insert comment make sure that once you started your recording process you are always giving a comment for whatever before each and every step that you are taking on the browser so let's say 
I'm trying to click on the make an appointment step now. So what I'm trying to do is just I'm giving an hint for that. Uh, just I'm, I'm going to click on the make appointment. So I'm just writing the command here. Okay, click make appointment. Okay, so I'm just clicked in it. So I'm just clicking on this make appointment. So now we are on the next screen. See one one thing if you observe. So as soon as we are into the other page or as soon as any page has been loaded. So okay, while the page is been loading, you will see this number of events have been increasing. So in the previous session, in the previous page, whenever we were in the previous page, we were approximately 200 plus events. Now it has gone to 400 and plus events. So this means if you see the events are increasing, so that means you are able to capture the traffic. Okay, so if you're still one though you are navigating through the application if still events are not recording for the different set of pages though you're navigating so it means your recording process is not going in a right way. So though you stop the script it will not generate any script for you. Okay, so now let's get into other step. Okay, so here we need to fill the entries username and password. So for this applications we have already here. So what I as I just previously so we must give any comment before we are making any action on the browser okay so here i'm giving login step so i'm giving input for username and also password so now i'm going to click on login button so as i just said you must wait until the page load completes if you look at here so it is not this this role this role is not uh, continuing so since the page loading has been already completed so we don't need to worry about to give any comments now so let's get into other steps so here i'm going to select some of the options from here and any options one more option from here and i'm going to click on the book appointment so let's look at just i'm typing i'm giving the comment as fill inputs okay just i'm randomly selecting one of the option and uh, i'm selecting the apply for hospital readmission and just i'm selecting medicaid i'm just selecting the visit date uh, let's select somewhere in 20 seconds and just giving comment okay this is a demo of appointment okay just i'm clicking on the book appointment okay and after that I'm going to click on go to home page. So I'm giving up comment for it. And just say log out and make sure that for each and every step that you're trying to do, you must give a proper comment. So I'm going to log out. So there is one more thing which I would like to also explain. So just by looking at okay, we are we are sometimes we need to make sure that okay whether the application or a virtual user gender is able to capture the application traffic or not. So we just we are we are getting we are depending on this events right. Sometimes we also need to cross check with. You just need to go back. You need to go to the recording log. So we have already seen about this recording log in our previous session. What it contains? I have already explained. So just look at your recording log and it is it is it, it 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 would be showing something some data and it will be showing something like it has been recorded and it has been generating some events and you will be finding the urls that whatever you have visited so this is the way you can make sure that you are able to capture the recording let's get back to the browser so once your recording process is done just i need to say log out Okay, once your recording process is done, okay, you just you need to say click on stop. Now it will generate the recording process. Sometimes the browser will automatically close, or sometimes you need to close it explicitly. So don't worry about it. So now it will generate. So far, if you see uh, there was a wizard coming up showing that script is generating. Okay, so now the script has been completely generated, and we will look at all the respective application urls will be available here and i was just showing some comments right so those comments will be shown up here so comments can be found out by dot uh, slash star say this is the one of the comments that i have given as a very first step so likewise you can all the comments 
will be shown here so why we need to give the comment here just one important question see if you don't give any comments we cannot segregate the respective actions for each and every page let's say we have launched the application demo dot uh, demo dot catalan dot com so if you don't give comment so login steps and everything will come together as a single entity or we don't identify whether these requests belong to one particular page okay so this is very basic way of recording the any app any web applications so let me take you through the in our next session let me take you through the other advanced options available for recording using the various browser thank you now we are going to see about the advanced recording options available with the web html recording let's look at what are they so these are the advanced recording options available i will take you through each of them the very first option available is the recording let's switch to the virtual user generator you can launch this recording option either from your virtual user generator menu option okay this is the one way that we can launch it recording option and the other way so whenever you start recording button so there from you can also switch the recording option okay let's get into this recording option so the very first one is the recording see this is the very important thing that we must remember so basically once your recording is done or while you're recording the whatever the load runner apis it generates or the script it generates can be generated in the two basic ways one is the html based recording another one is the url based recording so let's look at what your load runner by default gives some hint what does it mean by okay so it generates a html content based or it html based script is nothing but it would be a context based script generation okay let's it has an advanced option let's get into that what is a what is it contains okay so again this html based script has two different type of categories so based on this different type of categories we again get into different set of load generating options with respect to the static resources so this below steps contains static resources or some extra resources apart from the main url that we are hitting it so let's look at this later let's look at it first this very first option a script describing user action so if you use this first option it will generate the apis for the load runner using the web link and web submit form for example if you have opened your link it will list out that link name instead of giving the background url of it okay and if you select uh, if you select this option and for if you are submitting any form post parameters and it will generate only the form post content of that particular script okay let's get into more details of it this about html based script and in advanced what how the script will be generated if we select this option okay, let's get back okay in our previous session we have already seen that if your script recording is done and you have made some changes and if you, you don't want to make any you don't want to to keep whatever the changes that you want to, you have done okay and if you want to put the script back into the fresh recording like this will regenerate this this regenerate script option will helpful in the in this case so whatever the changes that you have done on your script everything will be wiped out and it will create a fresh script okay let's create this option so this will also create this will also provides the again recording options the similar way so i'm going to select as i just said so let's look at how this will be generating the script okay just i'm regenerating the script so it will take some time a uh, few minutes or few seconds to complete based on your script length see the very first url just look at okay this is the web submit form which is generated this api is generated by the this recording option so it is a context based okay it clearly says web link and web submit form so here the difference is instead of giving a complete url of what url of whatever you have submitted just it will provide the form post of it nothing but the background form post name of it okay it will not provide the complete url of whatever you are submitting just it will provide the context name of it likewise for whatever the form post that you have done everything will be shown with that respective form post context and i also shown right here for it will use it will generate web link 
So in this web link, instead of giving the complete URL, it will only provide the front end text for it. Since we have clicked on Cura Healthcare button, right? So or Cura Healthcare link, it will show up that link only the link text. Okay, so these two APIs will be generated by the this particular recording op recording option or this particular level of script generation. Okay, let's look at. So we already just seen right. So it will generate only context based. Let's say we have clicked on some particular link or we have selected some form. Only the context of that form will be selected. Okay, and the second option is explicit URLs. It will generate the complete URL in background of it. Instead of giving some foreground foreground form name, it will generate complete URL which is behind the foreground text. Let's see how it generates. So let me regenerate. Go to option. URL advanced. Say OK. Click OK. Click OK. So it will regenerate the script again. So whatever the changes we have done, once you regenerate, all the changes will be gone. See now if you look at so so far so previously this was given as a just only this name here in the previous in the previous selection of script generation it was only given like this okay this only this particular context has come but here it has generated a complete url which is there in background and it would be the same for all the script content so, and here in previous session it was shown like in the web link it was only shown like this instead of giving the url it was shown only the foreground link name okay but here in this case it has generated the complete url which is there in background so this is the basic difference that we can uh, get through as soon as we regenerate the script or while we generate while we recording the script in this respective recording option and so we just seen right so this will generate web link and web submit form and this will generate web url and web submit data and what are this so this is useful for generating the non html content like apart from your whatever the main url so there may be some background uh, images background urls or the background request which will be rendering as part of your page nothing those are nothing but it may be the images javascript vb scripts or um, activex applets anything okay apart from your main request so everything will be considered or extra elements so those extra elements whether you want to record them uh, or do not record them or record them into groups okay let's get into it let's look at each of these options so just i'm selecting record with current script group just i'm regenerating the script let me regenerate record within the current script group click okay See if you look at here the very first URL previously these extra results were not there because we didn't we, we have asked the uh, script generator do, do not to consider these extra results or this non HTML content. Okay, that's why we didn't see them in previous case. But in this case we have told them like please generate any static content as extra resources. Okay, so this is the option that we selected. So this is how it has generated as an extra resource. Okay, now let's look at the other option. HTML advanced, record, separate step and concurrent groups. Let's look at how it generates. See here, it has generated an extra step called web concurrent start and web concurrent end. So under that, all the extra resources all the extra resources have been come as part of concurrent urls means if you if your script generated like this you are along with your main request so these this web concurrent start and web concurrent end these method says fire all these requests together in one single instance so instead of loading them sequentially one after the other it will instruct the load runner to fire all these requests associate requests together as a single entity okay this is the option generated by 
record in separate steps and use the concurrent groups so this is a very common option that majority of the industry will use in order to mimic like a real browser activity because whenever you started using browser so though you are seeing one page in front it may be containing lot of background requests like css javascript pages and images so you don't need, you, you are not asking the browser to load all of them but browser knows it because it is internally the main page contains it so those will be loaded as a background concurrent part of the request okay and the third option do not record just if you select those extra results will not come as part of your script just i'm regenerating the script just look at it so i'm just going to the home see now you didn't see any extra results like images javascript css blah 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 nothing was rich. it's a plain main request so everything you're seeing the plain main request no extra results or no static resources nothing was found here now let's go back and see what the other option we have okay we have already covered all these two options now let's look at the url base again url based have some advanced so by default this will generate everything as a url like this so what if you select this it would also it would also generate the web url and if you select url based this will also select web url but there is one more advanced option like create a concurrent groups this is also some similar this is this is also something similar to the html advanced generate only urls but there is one more advanced option use web custom requests okay so this is a special case whenever your web web url or web submit data is not able to not sufficient to generate to request generate any request in that case this if you select web custom request only then it will select if it will generate the all the script content or all the requests as a web custom request parts okay just click it and we will see how this will be generated just click on okay just click on okay so instead of generating web url and web submit data we will see everywhere web custom request see how it is generated and also we have selected one more option there generate concurrent requests using the web concurrent starts and web concurrent end again this is something similar to the previous previous recording option in html advanced okay this is something similar to this just in this case instead of generating web url and web submit data for every request it may be get request or it may be a post request in all the cases it will generate only web custom request now let's go back what is next available in option the script part let's look at what this script option contains in older version of load runner until 12.5 load runner generating the script only in the c language now since 12.5 it has the capability of generating javascript events in your load runner code and also in this script option we have some advanced option but which we would likely not to use very frequently generate fixed thing time after end transaction so we'll see in our later classes what is the meaning of thing time and generate recorded event logs and also this 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 we don't need to worry about it and generate thing time greater than threshold so we will also cover about this later okay so this most of the options which we really do not uh, use as much whenever we try to record either it may be very low level recording or basic recording it may be advanced recording we won't be used this much uh, we won't be using any of the options in this except only for the thing time so that we will cover in our later classes and now let's look at the other one is the protocols so here in protocols since the load runner has a multiple set of protocols basically it has divided into single protocols and multi protocol model since we are only selected only web http html protocol you are seeing that respective protocol in some cases if you select multi protocol format all the set of the multi protocols will be available whatever the protocol that you selected everything will be displayed so while generating the code if you want to select one particular type of the request for any protocol you can select that particular one and you can leave 
rest of the protocol which you don't want to generate script for that okay as of now since we are only looking at the web html protocol so we don't have much options by default we don't need to uncheck that we just just keep it checked and we don't need to change any option for this in this session we are going to cover about rest of the advanced recording options now let's start with the code generation so here the code generation basically contains two options correlation scan and async scan so correlation scan is nothing but it will automatically generate any advanced dynamic parameters the script has it will automatically handle them so we don't need to worry about at this moment about the correlation scan because it is a more advanced option and the next thing is async scan okay let, before looking at this let us understand something like synchronous request and asynchronous request in case of synchronous response whenever you request to the server immediately it may be success or failure you will get a immediate response back from the server but in case of asynchronous request you will first immediately notified by the server says i have received the resp i have received your request and after some time when processing completes on the server side it will send back another response back to you says this is the actual response so this is a synchronous and asynchronous difference let's look at what does it mean the synchronous scan is nothing but it will generate some of the options for your it, this is related to generating the request for your sync asynchronous request so we don't need to worry about it at this moment we will also look at in our further session we will look at using some examples and the next option available with the code generation advanced recording option is correlations and configurations so in correlation configurations we have several options here so the very first one is rules scan record scan replay scan so these options will be applied if we select these options will be helpful if you want to complete some of the automatic correlation activity okay and the next option that we have is record replay scan configuration so whenever you try to do automatic correlation it will decide based on your selection here if you say automatic correlation should generate webridge save parameters if you select this it will generate correlation using webridge save parameters and if you select this webridge save parameters rejects automatic correlation will generate using webridge save param rejects expression so we don't need to worry about this moment we will look at more about this will come under as part of correlation concepts so we don't need to worry about it and we can ignore and record scan configuration so this will also one part of generating the automatic correlation and this is also part of automatic correlation so these options will come as part of the correlation so we will look at whenever we are doing the automatic correlation and the next one is rules so these rules are some some of the contents which are already defined by the load runner to complete automatic correlations so it may be load runner also load runner has some internal mechanism to generate automatically by default some correlation activity using the internal correlation mechanism so this also we don't need to worry about it because this relates to automatic correlation concepts and next look at http properties advanced okay the very first one says reset context for each iteration so this option will instruct the view gen to reset context for every action whenever it requests to server so we don't need to worry about this by default it will automatically perform that option and this second option is generate webridge find function for page titles so let's say we are trying to navigate to an application if you by default if you select that particular option to generate webridge find so it will take the page title as a validation check for this page okay let's get back to this so and add comment for to script http errors while recording and it will generate some comments whenever if it sees any http errors while recording and support character set so we don't need to worry about it it may be generating in utf and ucjp so we don't need to worry by default it will generate U utf8 and a parameterize server name so if we select this option let's get back to the script if you select this option so we are seeing that actual server name is demo.catalon.com it will generate demo.art 
auto, auto catalon dot com as a parameter by default so we don't need to explicitly parameterize it we will see what is a parameter in our next classes and the next one we have generate web add cookie function so if your browser is setting any explicit cookies for the request so those cookies will generated using the web add cookies function and also it will if you select this option generate steps for the web socket traffic so basically we will see about this in network mapping and filter so what does it mean generate steps for web socket traffic and replace passwords with encrypted parameters so if you select this option so passwords will be automatically encrypted and will be created as parameters okay. and the, the next one is generate steps with missing responses sometimes for all the requests we may not get the response from the server so if you select this those server is not responding or those server is not giving back any response for any particular request so if you select this option those kind of requests will also be generated as part of your script and generate api calls for specific https code so this will say about for example if you would like to only generate script for generate script for let's say some particular http response for it may be 200 or 300 or 400 so if you want to generate the request for those any specific response ports or stay any space any specific status code so that will also be generated as part of if you select this particular option and a proxy recording so we don't need to bother about it so this related to if you want use your load runner to set as a proxy for any external application and the next options we have recording schemas there is nothing but you know headers content types and resources and if you want to use any explicit headers while you are recording so you can set all of them using the headers option and if you want to set any specific content types you can use this option by default we don't need to use any of them load under will automatically take care of some of the important headers and the non resources if you do not want to record if you do not want to work on any of the non html resources those can be controlled or if you want to select only one type of request one type of non html resources to be recorded as part of your request so the, those you can explicitly declare here by clicking on you you can select what is the content type for it may be uh, application slash json json or application uh, slash xml or doc so you can explicitly mention so as of now we don't need to worry about them and the next important thing is mapping and filtering so here in mapping and filtering we have three different type of options and uh, we have something like network level server mapping for and we have some of the exclusion exclusions let's look at what are they okay let's start with first uh, capture level so here in capture level we have three options socket level data vnet level data and both together vnet and socket okay so whenever you're trying to deal with internet applications internet explorer based application let's say you're using internet explorer browser so vnet is a default interface to communicate with the network and if you're taking other browsers like firefox or chrome so defaultly communication channel goes through the socket level communication but if you the best option is to select socket level and vnet level because if you are uncertain the level of communication the browser made the browser makes just you go and select socket level and vnet level of data communication okay and the next option is network level server address mapping for this option is only if you want to generate requests for any kind of specific servers that you want to add as part of request so this is only for include only servers and this is if you want to add some of the servers to be skipped let's say these days you will be having lot of ads coming as part of web application so if you want to exclude any kind of applications uh, any kind of some ads or any kind of server that you don't want to add that you don't want to come as part of your script so here i don't want to generate script for google analytics.com bing.com so you can define them just by clicking new entry so you can fill all those details here and you can say complete and okay so once you generate the script so those will not come as part of your script 
okay so this nothing but we call it as a traffic filtering okay and the next option we have a dfe so whenever you're dealing with some of uh, advanced server side frameworks like gwt and uh, sap web frameworks so those kind of frameworks need some extra specifications from load runner to generate the request for those kind of so as of now we don't need to use it because our application is a very basic application so which has been uh, generated using java so we don't need to worry about it and the code generation also look the code generation is also part of the dfe so we don't need to worry unless until there is an explicit request explicit requirement is created for this request so these are the various options that we look at while recording any web applications using the web html protocol welcome to helpingtesters.com in this session we are going to learn about various http methods available how these http methods can be implemented and how we can correlate them in terms of virtual user generator so on a high level http methods can be classified into these categories the very first one is the get method get method it requests some information or some resources on the server let's take an example and look at some example on the get so here i just opened up a browser so i'm just requesting for a specific url so this url is requesting some resources nothing but a page from the server so this would become a simple get request i will also show whether it is a get request or not just if you are using the chrome browser open up the developer toolbars by just by pressing f12 it will open the developer toolbar and just reload the page and it will show up what are the respective methods or what are the various methods whenever we are trying to call this method call this urls so those methods will be popped up so i'm just refreshing the page so if you look at just let me open up the first url so if you look at here it is showing it as request method as get it is requesting first some information from the server nothing but this is the page that we are requesting okay this is an example for get now let's look at about post post just we are trying to post some information to the server either that server may be using that information or it would use it would be processing that information okay so the main difference between the get and post so get is just we are requesting some page whereas for the post we are sending some information to the server let's say just as an example if you are trying to log in on some page so in that login page we will be sending your username and password to the server so let's take and look an example on this so here in this example we are sending username and password to the server so it would become a post so let me click on login so it will send this username and password to the server so that server will process this username and password based on that it will send the proper page let's look at okay so i'm just clicking on it so this is the post request so here the request method says is as post let us look at what the information that we pass to the server see here we are passing user information username and password like username equal to john doe and the password this is not a password okay so like this these were in post we will be sending some extra information along with the requesting url so that server will take the whatever the parameters are form post that we are passing to the server and it will process it further and it will send back the right response based on the request processing now let us look at the other http method put so here the simple definition for put is we are just trying to update some resource on the server or in simple term put is nothing but update so we are trying to update some page or some content or some of the information on the server so let's look at how this put works here i am giving some simple example let's say on the server side you have the username and password let's say username is nothing but test user and the password are demo password so let's look at so whenever user sends a request with an update statement so in the update in the update we will be having the whatever the information that we want to 
update we will be passing to the server let's say if you want to update the password so we will be sending the updated passwords and just by saying okay i want to update this password we will send all those information in the update request and it will send back to the server so server will update the respective resource it may be the password it may be some any resource on the server so server will update that particular resource and it will send back that information to the user and the next http method is options so this is very rare options uh, one in hundred only we will get these kind of requests so options is we are requesting the server hey boss can you tell me what are the various options that are available from you like let's say it may be server will be responding boss i have my dear client i have get post put delete uh, it will list out all the available http method types based on the option so let's say you're trying to request for a particular resource okay we don't know the what is the method for it so if you request the server with option so it will respond back you with appropriate method type let's say you don't know what is a get whether it is a get method or post method for a particular request so it will send back if you request using the option so it will respond back you with it may be get or it may be post it may be put or it may be anything else okay so it will respond back with the appropriate method information and the next one we are going to say about delete so delete is a very straight method so we don't need to have much explanation for this see as this method says we are requesting the server to delete some content on the server or we are requesting the server kind of the delete operation or some kind of delete process on some of the server content let's say if you want to delete a username or if you want to delete a user account so that particular method type can be implemented using delete and we will see that server response back with you know appropriate right response either account does not exist or account deleted kind of message will be getting back and the next http method is connect so connect is nothing but it creates a tunnel to the whatever the request on the server nothing but it will create a tunnel to the server let's say we are trying to request for a page x on the server so connect is used to create a tunnel between the client and the server for that particular page so connect is a very rarely used not even 0.1% in 100 so connect we will not see much examples on this so we don't need to worry about so majority of the times we will be looking at most of the requests are implemented around get post and put http methods in some case we will see options but ideally delete has to be implemented but majority of the times all the delete operations can also be updated using either post or get so this is all about the http methods so why we need to understand these http methods while learning load runner because if you want to learn web http html protocol in detail and if you want to make a successful script out of it understand what is a get what it contains and what is a post what it contains what is put what is it contains and the rest of the http methods we don't need to worry about because it is a very rare case that we see them but these are the majority of the, the methods that we will find each and every script so let's go and uh, look at our script that we have recorded in our previous session this is the script which we have recorded previously just to show a basic recording how we need to do using the virtual user generator so if you look at there is some particular thing called method so each and every method that you see in your script everything it may be either get or post so as i just said so this is simple get get request so it is requesting information for this page on the server okay and let's take another example uh, post okay so before getting into the post so if you look at everything is a get so you don't see anything else other than get so far but if you look at uh, going forward you will see some of the let me scroll down here so let's get into the post method okay see I, what i was explaining in post so post will send some extra information to the user it may be the user information or some other information so we are sending 
we were we are sending some information to the server to do something on the server so server will receive these form post parameter normally we call them as a form post parameter server will receive these form post parameter and it will process and it will respond either if these form post parameters are correct so based on it will process and it will respond back with appropriate page either it may be successful login or it may be failure login so if you look at the whole script from the top to bottom you won't see anything else other than http post and http get so everything will be get and post in your load under scripts and it's a very rare case that you will see sometimes options nothing more than that so if you clearly understand what is a get and post you can easily customize your web http script in this session we are going to cover about script customization options and why we need to customize the script and we are going to look out various options that we need to look at while customizing the script so let's get into it so as a very first step once your script recording is done we need to take a backup and why let's look at it so this is the script that we have already recorded so here so whenever you start customizing the script so you may be adding some statement to your script so in some case if you want to go back and to see what happened in your script what are the changes that you have made let's say you have made some changes to your script so that is causing your script to break or that is making your script not to work okay so in that case better as a standard practice you go and always save a backup backup of your fresh recording so you you have just done our recording process so just i'm taking a backup using the save script as so just i'm saving this solution as c let's say i'm saving it as a backup in one folder so this is the best approach whenever you're trying to work for an enterprise application and uh, let's say your script is your whatever the script that you're trying to record is having so many n number of steps let's say sometimes when you're trying to record your scripts it may be taking 30 minutes to 40 minutes to complete the record since there are n number of steps called in your script so in that case if you make any changes use the script you create then in that case again there is no option that you need to go and record again so it is a waste of time so always it's the best practice to keep a backup of your fresh script that whatever you have recorded is just done okay so just i'm taking a backup now so i'm just saving my script as backup so you need to go and again i'm going to save this script as dev so dev means just i just am hinting this script to okay i'm going to customize this script so though if i make any changes and due to that if the script is corrected so i can go and get the script from the backup script and i can work on that instead of recording that again so if you look at here i would like to show something from the file menu so whatever the scripts that you have recorded so far so you can see everything from the recent scripts and solutions so instead of navigating you can directly go and uh, select the scripts from here this from this shortcut so you don't need to go and navigate that where you have saved so this will give you a very quick shortcut of the whatever scripts that you have done very recently okay now let's look at what is the what are the various things that we need to do as part of script customization so i will show that at very first step just i will show that i will replay the script once so once your script is recording is done i would recommend just go and replay your script once so if you click this your script so these steps will be automatically executed one after the other so if if any of the step fails due to some issue so your script execution will be immediately stopped okay now here i will show okay let the script replay completed and i will show you what you need to look at so it's taking a bit time to complete yeah now it is done so this is the output window that you can show here okay so in this output window you have various options like replay compilation code generation and recording so now if you want to look at the recording log you can 
select you can view the all the steps all the replay log of the recording replay log using this replay pan or replay output log so this replay log step says so whatever the request that it's that that is shown on your actions so those will be shown whatever the particular at which particular request this currently virtual user generator is trying to execute let's say if you want to navigate what is this step means if you double click automatically your cursor will populate on the respective request in the action let's say i am here just clicking on the web submit data authenticate.php right so the cursor automatically taken me to that respective place so this output log is mostly useful whenever you're trying to replay or whenever trying to customize your script it may be in terms of correlation or parameterization so we'll look at about these concepts in, in our, our, our later classes but as of now just remember so the your replay log will contain all the logs whatever that whatever the virtual user generated provided or created as part of replay okay so now let me take to other core generation log so core generation log is a very one important log that virtual user gender automatically generates so code generation log will contain some of the code related to how this particular or how whatever the action file or whatever the code in the action how it is generated so that information available in this code generation log so if you look at here you will again find the same kind of request information here along with their respective response so if you are seeing the web url the respective response will also can be find in code generation log so let's look at one by one so it will the code generation log will show some information like uh, request header and response header and also response body as i just said right so this is the very first response that we seen here so this is the response body right so this is the response body for the page that whatever we have seen for catalan home page so you will see all the response at the end until the end and so once your response is done then it will actually show the actual request see this is the first it will show in the pattern of first it will show the response headers and it will show the response body and it will show the actual request for which it is generated nothing but actual request for which the response is generated in the previously so just let's scroll bottom to top see first we got a request so this this request and this request both are seen and after that you will be seeing the whole response body from the server for this particular request and let's scroll up and you will also find the response header so as of now we don't have any response headers as much see this is the response headers so we don't have much now and the respective request header information so this is the this is the way that it shows the code generation log and you will find all the all the request related information in the code generation log let's say you have completed recording now and you you have completed recording and if you record again so the existing code generation log content will be wiped up and the new code generation log content will come up here okay so we just seen about code generation log and the next one is the compilation log so as soon as the you made any changes to script immediately you need to make sure that your script is not having any errors okay so how you can verify that so whenever you click on this button or if you can press shift f5 so it is showing the short key for it so shift plus f5 or you can if you click on this so it will show up what are the compilation errors the script has so as of now it doesn't have any script errors. let me introduce some errors so just unfortunately i just uh, i just press some keys okay which i don't know where this uh, uh, so wh whenever you're trying to modify your scripts you don't know without unknowingly you know uh, unknowingly you will be adding some key some extra keys some typos so in that case let's look at what your script says whenever you try to complete compile so here if you go if you, if you go back into your compilation log so in this compilation log it will show okay i don't know what does it mean a dsdk some, some what this is the text that i type so it doesn't know what is the meaning of it okay so this compilation log will show up the all the compilation errors and the other log that we must look at is the recording log so 
recording log is the one which will show the information information from the browser recording page so we have already seen about this recording log how it can be verified so this is mostly useful you know all our script can be generated from the recording log let's say whatever the code generation log that we just seen so that code generation log has been generated from the recording log so if you don't see any content in your recording log once you once your recording is done nothing but your script view won't be generated like this if you see recording log does not have any text like this or does not have any request like this so you won't see the code generation log and code generation log fails okay so this is all about the recording log so if you look look at the recording log it will show the you know back and forth the communication between your browser and the server about the various requests so this is all about the various logs available with your virtual user generator in terms of replay compilation code generation and recording logs so we just covered everything just apart from this script cleaning so what is the meaning of that script cleaning let's look at it sometimes your script will be having some of the unnecessary requests which are generated by the browser or which are generated by the application by itself let's say it may be the ads related or it may be analytics related or it may be anything which is not related to your actual targeting server let's say our targeting server is demo odd.catalon.com so if you find any request which is not related to this so this is a extra jank we call it as a script cleanup so let me regenerate the script again uh, to show what is that jank okay just i'm trying to regenerate the script script option html advanced so i'm just putting it like record within the concurrent test script so let me regenerate so let's me go to top if you look at here so in this extra resources so there are something which are not part of our application see our application starts with demo odd.catalon.com so if you find any request which is not belongs to our server or which is not st starts with our server name so that we can consider the jank jank request so script cleanup is nothing but deleting such kind of the jank request is called as a script cleanup so just i'm going to clean up this so this is we don't need to keep them with our script so i'm deleting the bing.com and uh, let's look at other things so this is cdns.cloudflare.com so we don't need to worry about it because say why we need to do this cleanup because we are, our main motto is to test the test the performance of this application demo.catalon.com but not any other server right so because let's say if you keep that request so we will also measuring the performance of those servers okay but our ultimate target is to stick to only the respective server that whatever you're trying to test okay so let me clean up the other requests if i find any let me scroll up top to bottom so these are the requests so far i don't have anything else apart from this sometimes you may be seeing the bunch of bunch of server okay there are some other extra extra requests see these are also some of the extra requests which have been generated so we don't need to put them because this belongs to gstatic.com so this is a google static.com some it trying to download some forms into the application so we don't need to worry about because this is not our targeted server so gstatic.com is not our targeted server so just i'm trying to delete them make sure that whenever you're trying to delete them you are not deleting any of the script content otherwise your script will throw an error or your script compilation will bring up lot of errors let me show some examples let's say i'm trying to delete some text let me undo that so i'm trying to delete some of the content unfortunately i made some mistake here see okay instead of deleting the line by line so i have deleted some extra I have deleted some extra double code here see i have deleted double code so when you say compile so it will show up error compilation so syntax error unexpected okay so illegal statements skipping blah 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 lot of unnecessary statements it will throw as part of compilation error so make sure that whenever you're trying to delete whenever you're trying to delete some of the information from your script 
make sure that you are deleting them appropriately. Otherwise, it leads to a lot of errors into your script. So this is about your script cleaning process. Make sure that you must be cleaning your script as soon as you complete a recording. Welcome to HelpingTesters.com. In this session, we are going to see in detail about parameterization. So let's look at what are they. So we are going to learn about what is parameterization and how it can be implemented and various options available with parameterization. Now let's look at what is the parameterization. We are passing some values from a data file or some values which may be user entered or some values which may be generated by the script sometimes. We will be passing them as a parameter. So these values will be substituted as part of script. So these will solve the complexity of generating multiple values for script. Let's take an example. Now we are on a page for automationpractice.com. So here we are going to log into this page. We will be entering the credentials and just we do log out. Okay, I will show in, in this case which things that we need to go for parameterization. So let's re quickly record the script using virtual user generator. Now I am recording the script. It will launch my browser and also it will open the respective application whatever I have given there in URL parameter. As we seen in our previous session, so if you want to make sure that your script is recording or not the request, you can see this events are increasing. So this is the one way of we can confirm that script is able to record by the browser or using by using the your virtual user generator. And as well as if you look at here, it would be generating these get our post events. So by this you can make sure that it is generating the scripts. Let's go back to the browser and make sure that you're giving some command. Let's say click on sign in link. Just click it. Let me complete the sign in process. And after that, we are just simply signing out. Let's stop our scripting now. It would generate the script. So whatever that you are seeing in our action files. So all the script generated by this generating process. Okay. Now let's complete the script cleanup process as we discussed in our previous session. So we can delete whichever not related to our application. So I'm just I'm deleting all those requests. So the Facebook URLs and all these are not part of our script or not part of our targeted application. So I'm just deleting it. Now the script cleaning is completed. Now we are only having the request related to automationpractice.com. So if you scroll down here, you will see that whatever the values that you have entered as part of sign in, username and the respect to the password. So here the username is helping testers pt at the rate gmail.com and the password is the rate 14. And if you want more user credentials, you can go and register there with this application. But make sure that you're not putting any test on that application, otherwise it will crash. Okay, now let's see and implementation implement the parameterization com, parameterization activity. Now, as we just discussed, so parameterization is nothing but just we are creating some files are uh, creating some files and linking it to our script so that whatever the values that we wanted to pass as a parameter so that we can link them to with the script. So parameterization can be done using the parameters window. So this parameters window can be opened in multiple ways. One I'm using the option which is available under solution explorer, nothing but the parameters. And alternately, I can use control plus L. It's a short keyword for opening the parameters list. So this is a window for the parameters list. Here you will see the all the list of the parameters that are available right now. Since you just created your script, right? So you won't be finding any parameters. 
let's create parameters for username and password first one is username so i clicked on you new new button so and it will add some placeholder for parameter so i'm just giving a name for it just click on that create username okay just i'm creating a parameter called username and after that by default all these values will be whatever the values that you want to create will be saved under this dot file by default this dot file will be created in your script folder i will later show you where it will be show where it will be stored on your script folder let me let me create it, that first okay so in order to create this user parameter dot file as of now it is not created so once you click on the create table it will create that parameter so whatever you seeing so this is a header name for it so you this file will be containing the header called username and you can supply the value here so i'm just closing this window and i'm just copying it or you can do it multiple ways the simple thing is you can copy that value and put it here in place of it otherwise i'm just not saving it here otherwise you can select that value whichever you want to pause it as part of username select that value right click and go to the replace with parameter so once you create any parameter you will see all the list of parameters available here so just i'm telling it to the username or the email address just go into the username parameter so when you say it it will try for it will it will try ask you for what are the various instances available with that email or with the username available in your entire script it will try scan the script and it will automatically replace in all the places so if you look at here so once i whenever i click down that whenever i click down the username field so it has automatically passed my parameter name within the brackets it means your parameters can be substituted within the brackets with the respect to parameter name so i'm going to replace all the occurrences of that whatever the email id helping test or spt at the rate gmail.com so it will now go and find in every place of my script and it will replace as of now it has only one occurrence right it is only in the place of submit sign in so it has only replaced here now let's go back to the parameters what happened so by default it was not appending so we can all we can we can we can command paste our paste our username here so if you want to open it in a notepad file when you have bunch of values that you want to add it for this username so you can come in here you can enter whatever the values that you wanted to pass as a parameters so helping testers pt12 pt1.com and pt2.com so likewise you can add n number of parameters here so right now i don't have these accounts these two accounts just to, so that's the reason i'm deleting now so just close it close the notepad so it would be reflected okay so you you have created the parameter called username let's don't worry about rest of the parameters i will take you through and also what else we need we need to have one more parameter called password so let's create another parameter called password i'm just creating a password here one thing we need to create in terms of relationship see this username and this password are associated together because this particular password belongs to this helping testers pt@gmail.com so we don't need to create we don't need to map this password for any anyone else so that's why to create that relationship in parameterizing concept so what we need to do is we need to go and browse for the actual para parent parameter file that is nothing but the username here parent parameter file name is dot param username dot dat because this password is always dependent on username so that's why i selected username as parent parameter file so here what you need to do see it is not at appended to the file so what i'm trying to do is i'm just saying add column so automatically the recently created parameter name will come as part of your new column whenever you press click okay it will be automatically appended as part of your username dot dat file just check it out so it has automatically added one more parameter header let's close it and we can add the parameter we can add the password parameter here so what was the password parameter so password 
at the rate one fourth. So this is the password that we have. Now just okay, we have created both of them in one single file. Okay, you may be having n number of your credentials and passwords in your file. So there is one more option that I'm going to say here. You need you need to create a link up with pin your password and username. So that's how I'm going to tell. Select same line as username. It means whenever your username you pick your user username value has been picked at the same time your password value will be also picked for the respected pick for the respected username so that we are completed now a relation between username and password let's close it so now we can replace here select that password replace with path re replace with a parameter say password so it will try find in different locations that are available in your script so it will replace everywhere so now let's see so this is the password parameter so it's been enclosed with the two brackets or the parentheses this is the way how we do parameterization in virtual user generator so this is the very basic parameterization concept let me take you to some advanced so here as of now we just seen about okay where is where you want to save your parameters okay and how to add multiple columns in one single file if you look at here there is one more option called by number or by name let's say if you have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 multiple like 1 2 3 4 5 multiple columns either you can change the number which column to be picked as of now the username is the very first column in the file so I'm just hinting it to take the first first column Otherwise, the best approaches and the best practices always try to select your column by whatever the name. Okay, so whenever I say by name, so you can come down and it will show all the list of parameters available. So since you are setting it for the username, so you can select the username parameter here. And if you want to generate your parameter file as a comma separated, you can select a comma. Otherwise, if you whatever the delimiter that you want to differentiate between username and password, so you can select the respective delimiter. So right now I'm using the default delimiter that is nothing but comma. And this is the first data line. It means let me add some more values. Then you will understand about what is that mean. Okay, so I just am giving two and three. So I'm, I have added three parameters here. So if you look at first data line means as soon as you change this, if you if you mention here one, it will point to the first value in your parameter list. Let me change, then your first value becomes helping testers to means your second second row will become your first value to be picked in your script. Okay. So don't worry about these now. So let's be let me close it and verify so as soon as you completed one parameterization activity just you verify whether it is replacing or not so now i'm running the script so the right side whatever the window that has been popped up to runtime viewer if your request is capable of showing some html page so those html content will be shown up easier so this is how your browser shows the various pages that will be rendered the same thing here but this is not a browser okay so the first page has been launched okay just we have been clicking on uh, login and we just submitting the login okay we have completed the login part and we are now we are logging out So your replay is completed. Now let's look at where you can find those values in your script. Let's look at our replay log. So as we discussed in our previous session, replay log is the one which shows all your script replay output. But if you look at your username and password here, so let's look at what is the username here. Helping testers to address gmail.com. You won't be finding your username here because your replay log has to show the statistics of what are the parameters that you substituted in your script but it is not showing so to ensure that your replay log is showing the parameters name 
you must go to the runtime settings from here and you go into the log option so there you need to enable extended log and parameter substitution so if you select extended log and parameter substitution whatever the parameters that are part of your script so those values will be shown in blue color so let's select it and complete it so let me save the script as soon as you make any changes in runtime settings you must save those settings i'm just closing it now so let me replay so let me put the right account now so and because these two accounts are not there so this is the first account is there in our uh, web application registration so i'm just changing it let me replay it again If you look at here in the replay log, so now we are seeing some blue color text which is showing like which parameter is being substituted in your script on the respective steps. See if you look at here, so username has been substituted as helping testers.com. So okay, this window will scroll down since your script replay is still going on. You can scroll down or scroll back to see where those values see. Okay, let's complete the script. Okay, script replay is completed now. So let's check with the whatever the username that you have passed as a parameter. See, your parameter value has been shown here. Says, I'm substituting in place of username with this value. So this value will be go go and substituted here by the virtual user generated and the respective password. Okay, and I was also referring to some something right so here username values will be substituted as helping testers pt.com so this is the one which i was referring to here so if you make if you put if you select this option it will clearly show your username value has been substituted but if you select by number it will show value for the index one has been value for the column one has been picked like this so this is how it will be but as a best practice you always select the by name so you will be easily able to correlate with username and with the respect to value that is being substituted in your script so this is the simplest way that you do parameterization likewise you can parameterize n number of values so as of now if you look at here email and the password these things that we have entered but there are some other value which will not be changed and those these values will be static so even i can change this value will not be changed for a while so i can copy this value even i can make my I, I can make my account as a parameter let me do that so i'm giving name for it back option you can create another dat file for it or you can combine that back option as part of your username right now i'm just trying to create it as a separate entity so let me enter it here i'm just selecting by name back option just click on close so now i can go and replace that value also here back option so whenever you replay your script so this value will be also substituted now let's get into some advanced options available in parameters so let's say we are started we are trying to execute this script for three users and what happens whenever if you are executing your script for three users let's see how these values will be substituted for each of the script so for that option we can use the simulate so here if you look at select next row is selected as a sequential so select next row has various options sequential random unique and same line as a back option so let's look at the sequential okay so by selecting sequential let's look at simulate parameter so just we're going to have uh, three users and only one one iteration just say simulate so what happens all the users will be picked up the very first value in the parameter list if you select sequential option if you select the sequential option all the users all the three users whatever you want to execute so these those three users will be picking up the first value so though you put 100 values those 100 values will be 
picking the same value because you have selected the sequential for the first iteration means let me tell you one thing about the iteration so iterations are nothing bad how many times you want to execute this these steps one after the other let's say if you make the iterations as two these all steps or whatever the actions that you mentioned those will be executed those many number of times nothing but two times if you if you make it as a two okay let me show you where you can set that iteration settings go to your runtime settings here if you select number of iterations as two it will go and take your respective action file into two times so we don't need to worry about it i will take i will take some advanced class on this runtime settings as of now just remember it as it will we have mentioned here number of iteration as two so it will execute this respect to action for two times let's close this we don't want to make any changes let's go back to the parameters so here we are mentioned here number of users as three so if you simulate so since we select a sequential it will get into each user will be the picked the very first item so all the users will be taken same value for the first iteration let's say user having the two iterations okay so we are mentioning the two iterations are two times will be you know users will be doing the iteration so let's say simulate see here for the first iteration all the users will be taking first value and for the second iteration second value and third iteration third value so if you mention sequentially all the users in each iteration will be having the same value okay now let's look at the other option random random is nothing but some random value will be picked up based on your parameters so let's simulate this random so we, we are not certain about how it will be picking up the random values so we do we cannot determine how it because it's random okay let me simulate it for the three users again for the three iterations so that we cannot determine it will pick some random values out of it so if you look at it here it took sequentially but it is not sequential so if you look at the second option second iteration see it has to script to script uh, helping testers pt at the gmail.com the two times and uh, second email as two times and if you look at the third so it has to at a different instance randomly so randomly will pick these values randomly and the next one is unique let's don't worry about the unique now go to simulate parameters here we are trying to simulate unique with three users and three iterations uh, right now it is showing values for only first iteration because whenever you select the unique it will pick each value for each user so right now we are trying to simulate it for three users for three iteration since we are only having the three values so these values number these three values are not sufficient to be unique for the next iteration because you should be having another set of three values if you want to get for the second iteration and also if you want to get for the third iteration you must be having another set of three values so unique will be unique will be considering each user gets a unique value for their iteration now let's look at the other option update value on see we are trying to say three iterations right so in this three iteration we don't have we are we are not having multiple values so that's why those values are not sufficient for next iteration but if you select each occurrence each occurrence means in your script your script may be having n number of places let's say we are submitting username here and in some place of your script we are having you again your username substituted let's say we are trying to put here so if you select this option unique with each occurrence it means whenever you see the username field it will try and substitute a unique value there so since here we don't have multiple occurrences we are we cannot show it accurately but going forward you if your script is very big and you may be having multiple situations so that in that case it will be helpful to simulate like each occurrence so whenever as soon as it finds a place in particular iteration it will 
find it will try find and substitute new value at each place and the next option is the one so whenever you select the ones for the simplifying i just have added few more users nothing but totally we have nine credentials let's do simulate now with the unique and ones just click on simulate See for the first user, though it may be n number of iteration, it has took only one value. So for the first iteration, it took only helping testers PT, helping test for the second iteration, it took helping testers PT, and for the third iteration, it took helping testers PT. So though n number of iterations, if you select unique and ones, it will take only the one value for all the iteration. Okay, but in terms of the user let's say for the user 2 it has a took different unique value and and for user 3 it has took different different unique value so whenever you select unique ones it will take unique value for each user but not for the each iteration see for the first user second user third user it is unique but for the in number of in terms of iteration See first user for the first iteration, second iteration, third iteration, each user has got the same value. So these are the various parameters or parameter options available whenever you want to simulate with a different set of conditions. It may be sequential, random, unique, and same time. So in the username and password creating parameters, we have already seen how to create an association between your parameters. So this is the password parameter let me try substitute here i forgot to do so you are going to substitute here to create your password your password field to depend on the username so whenever username gets so the password will be automatically picked from the same line so this is nothing but an association mapping with the username and password okay so these are the values how you can do parameterization with the some external data source i just mentioned we can i can i will show that these data files will be part of your scripts either you can you can put this data file somewhere and you can import using the import parameter or if you create like just we created we will be seeing them as part of your script so let's go back and see in your script folder If you look at here, this is the username.dat file which was created as part of your parameters. Likewise, your script may be containing a number of values that you may be entering or you may be having some static values as part of your script. So using parameterization, file parameterization, we can substitute all those values in a file and we can pass it to the script. So so far we have learned about file parameters so in our next session we are going to learn about various parameters built-in parameters that are available with the virtual user generator parameters so far we have seen about file parameters now let's look at some of the built-in parameters sometimes there will be a situations like you need to substitute data and parameter data and time values as parameters so in that situation you can select data and time parameter so this will help you to generate data and time value dynamically using the virtual user generator data and time function so let's look at how this will be substituted so by default it will show what is the sample time right now it is running so it is throwing it is showing me like right now my year and date and the what is the time Okay, so based on the values, there are the various formats that you can apply. So if you want to only hours and minutes and seconds that you can come down here and select. So it will only select hours and minutes and seconds. So let me create another parameter. Date. Time. Or just let me take the date. So if you want to, there is a situation like you need to substitute current date. So what is the problem if you create a file parameter in file parameter as a date so what happens you need to every time 
whenever if you want to substitute the current date you need to go and edit the file parameter if you want to substitute current date but the but default if you select the date and time so by default you can pick whatever that date and time parameter that you wanted to substitute so you don't need to go and update anywhere so it will by default it will take your current system date and time so right now i'm just trying to print the current date in some format so that is month year month day and year so let me take that so percentage d refers to the date percentage m refers to the month and percentage y refers to the year so let me change the power format in us format just selecting it so here it will show 038 18 and if you want the full full year you can select the y so you can explore that what are the various options so if you select the small y it will show only the two digits of the year if you select the full capital y it will show the full year likewise you can generate the date so also let's look at the something called time i'm just creating the time so let's go back to the time go date and time parameters here you can select hours minute and seconds sometimes you may be needing milliseconds so in that case you can select dot zero 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 so it will sh even show your time in milliseconds and the del delimiter whatever you want to put here either you can put semicolon or you can put dot or you can put hyphen so based on the delimiter it will automatically bring up the date and time parameters so these are the various date and time parameters so you can add whatever the format that you want and next parameter we have group name so group name is applicable whenever you create any controller scenario so this comes as part of group name so we will be covering more into whenever we're trying to create a controller scenario on that component so as of now just remember group name is shows creates shows the name for your group so which will be substituted as part of your script so we will mainly use this for the debugging purpose whenever you're executing in controller and the next parameter important parameter iteration number so it we have seen previously in runtime settings we can change the number of iterations it may be one two three or n number of iterations that you want to set so if you select the iteration parameter it will print the current iteration number so let's say you're in current right now we are not running but it will by default show the one let's say you're running your script for multiple iterations so it will show the value for that iteration if it, if you're in second iteration and if you're trying to substitute this value somewhere or if you want to print somewhere this value it will show that value it will show that iteration number using this iteration parameter so let me create that iteration parameter iteration number so you can give that parameter as iteration number let me select the iteration number and you may be have you can, you may be printing with a direct number or you may be ha having you may be want to print some pre pre, pre uh, preceding zeros let's say i want to put some zero before the iteration number like if you want to put as many as zeros okay if you if you want to put some three if you want to put some three zeros before your script so you can put percentage zero 3d so likewise you can put as many as you want it means including the your number it may be let's say this is nothing but you know how we check in the round format the similarly it will add some preceding zeros including the number of iteration let's say your now i have selected percentage 060 so the total digit count will be six and it will append it will pad whatever the number of zeros to fill the six digits so this will be useful whenever you are trying to put some advanced concepts or para parameters as of now just remember it and load generator name so in the previous session of architecture of the load runner we have seen like how to map load generators how load generators will be used in the you know with respect to controller so if you want to print any particular load generator name in your script so this load generator name parameter will be used so let me create one more parameter for it load generator name 
so you can give whatever the name here for the parameter so uh, let me just select load generator name okay and in sometimes you may be in situation like you need to generate some random number so that flexibility also available using the parameter type called random number so it will give you a range it will ask for a range okay with, between uh, between within range it will you want to generate a random number so you need to give the upper upper limit and the lower limit so you can so you can, it will generate the value randomly so you don't need to worry so here there is one more option again similar to the other concepts of the parameterization for each occurrence each iteration or one so you can give starting number and ending number and there is one condition like you your uh, starting number should be always lesser than your ending number so it will generate any random number between 1000 and 100 so here you can add any preceding numbers like uh, any pre any append any padding zeros let's look at other parameter type table so this table we will be going into some detail session about it so this is very rare case that we use so let me find some real time example on this and we'll explain you let me take another parameter unique number unique number will generate unique number based on the parameter based on the options that you select so unique number will always take only one value that is nothing but from where you want to start values and there is one more option it will take block size for user let's say i'm trying to test i'm trying to execute the test for three users and i mentioned block size for user is as 10 means each user will get 10 value 10 unique values so totally 30 unique values will be allocated if you put three users let's say for the first user it will take the values from 100 to 109 and for the second user it will take values for 110 to 119 and for the third user it will take from 120 to 129 so likewise each user will get block of 10 unique values and the next option available is user defined function so this is the very this is also very rare case that you want to use the user definition so here you can create a function in uh, you can generate a dll for it you can generate that function in uh, c, c c sharp or uh, c plus plus using the visual studio you can generate this dll for dll library and you can mention that function name here so as of now this is a very rare case so not even 0.1% in 100 many not many people will use this option and we user id this is also one of the important parameter option that we need to learn about and these will be also used in our day to day performance testing life so let me create a parameter called vuser id so if you map it at map it to vuser id let's say we have three users for your test so the first user will get an id called vuser id equal to 1 and for the second user it will get to vuser id as vuser2 likewise vuser id nothing but it will show the what is the number of that particular user which you are executing if you are having only one user definitely the vuser id value will become 1 and the last option is xml uh, it is it is if you want to extract some value from the xml or if you want to put some values from the xml this option will be used uh, but it is very rare case people will use so you can set the values in xml so those values can be parsed through the your parameter let's say sample element i'm giving it as a username so i can set the username value as tester so likewise you can create all the set of values so here you can you can map it via whatever the parameters that you can create so that is not but xml username sometimes you may need to supply your your parameter values as an xml so in that case this value will be used so you don't need to create some external xml you don't need to create you don't need to build any in any xmls explicitly so if you want to use any readily available test data 
or readily available parameters which are in form of XML so that you can import them into your parameters list as an Excel for XML format. So those respective value will be extracted by this XML parameters. So those will be substituted. This is also very rarely used parameter types. So these are the various type of parameter options that we can use in our VueGen scripting. Thank you. Welcome to helpingtesters.com. In this session, we are going to learn about correlation. Let's look at what we are going to cover about. We are going to cover about what is correlation and various correlation function available in the load runner, various debugging process to handle with the correlations and advanced correlation options and we'll cover about some examples. First, let us understand what is correlation and uh, how it would be handled in the load runner. So if you look at here, so we are having the two entities here. One is the client and another one is the server. So the navigation for a flow will be goes like this. So the very first thing is client request the server. We call it as request one. And for the request one, we will be getting the response. So we call it, we are calling it as response one. Likewise, there will be a sequence of requests and response flow that is being happening between the client and server. So we already know that what is the request. So, so request is nothing but whenever if client wants to send something to get some information from the server. Let's say we are trying to get the information for Google. So we'll type the information on your browser like google.com and server will send back as a response. Let me show you that. Here I'm requesting google.com. So double double dot google.com is a request that we are sending it to the Google server and whatever you see that as part of this Google search page this comes as part of response so here we made a request Google server sent us back with a response so let's look at what respond it has shown us so right click and go to the view page so so this is whatever we are seeing the whole entire thing this code or this page source is the one which is sent by the Google as a response. So likewise, whatever the request, whenever you try to send for any server, it will send back with the appropriate response. So understanding the request response pattern is very important in the correlation. Let's go back. Here we have named various requests and response with an example. So let's say this is a navigation into a Gmail or any email application. So let's look at what are the basic steps it will do it. The very as a very first request, we will be launching the respective application URL and server sends back us with the appropriate response. And after that, again, we will be submitting our credentials and we will be getting a right response. Either if it is a successful login or a failure login, we will get an appropriate page. Let's say we got a right response from the server. Okay, so whenever we get any right response, server will send us back with a session, okay, which is also part of your response. So for any further request, we will be using this session to request and to say server, okay, this is me, I'm the user, okay, which I have sent uh, previously my submitted login credentials and I made a successful session. So based on your session, clients will, client will, server will identify that, okay, this is so-and-so user. This session belongs to so-and-so users. He have, is having a valid session with me, so I can take him to the requested page. Otherwise, the server will again redirect back to the login page. Since in this condition, so we are already having a valid session. In this valid session, we are trying to request with a session as a creating a new email. So server will send us back, you know, with the right page, uh, with the right response, say, okay, we have a created any new email for you. So here, we are seeing some some new thing here, like nothing but the session. So how they start request number three will know about this is the this is the only the user which is already having the login. So based on this special response, based on the previous response, we took session and we request uh, we carry forward this request to request three to 
to make uh, to tell the server that okay this is the user which have already having a session and take this my session and uh, validate me based on this session server will able to identify the request so this is whole thing automatically taken care whenever you try to navigate with browser but whenever you are trying to log in or whenever trying to use a virtual user generator your virtual user generator is not smart enough to set sessions automatically if your request needs a session you need to manually extract that session and you need to send it as part of request tree whatever extracting the session information from the response to is called as a correlation just to be in very simple english so correlation capturing some values from the response and putting it forward as a request or putting it at, putting it as part of the request so correlation will get and will be used in many situations so here in the situation handling the session is nothing but a correlation so likewise you may be see we, we will be seeing various examples to handle the correlation so let's go back to the view gen and uh, there we will see how to handle this here in this flow we are just using the default demo application which comes with a load runner so there's nothing but a web tools i will show you how to use web tools application and how to start it so go to your uh, once your once your load runner setup is done uh, which we have already seen in our previous session how to set up the load runner so once your setup is successfully done we will be having a default app which will be installed into your system so let to, to launch that application just you can go to the start and search for the web tools so let me do that so web tools is the one so here if you look at so web tools application we can see that there are, will be two then so the very first one is the start h web tools to and second one is the hp web tools application so this first one will open the application in your browser second one will you will be useful to start the web tools application so it's a small server first we need to just click on the hp web tools as soon as you clicked it it will pop up a window then you just click on the hp web tools link so the default username and password will be the jojo is the username and the password will be bean b e a n so let's do login i'm showing the flow what we are doing now with the view gen once your logging is done just click on the itinerary so by default i will be i'm having two itineraries two two bookings already there so here my flow is just select one item and say click cancel and after that just go and sign off so this we are going to achieve with the virtual user generator now so here we are going to show up how correlation will be helpful and how to handle the correlation here let me record the flow correlation one and just go in the record so here you can give the our application url so which we just seen just say login click continue okay so it will launch the browser for recording so therefore i'm just going and completing the scripting now recording is done now so we can see the various steps which we have already created so let's get into that and uh, as we just discussed in our previous session as soon as your scripting is done just run it once so i'm just clicking it and uh, replaying it once and we will compare the re we will the compare the screens one after the other now let's look at compare the we have already done our replay now let's compare the screen by screen just to compare the screen by screen just click on the snapshot pan so here you can split 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 will provide it will provide recorded and replay screens side by side so now we got the side by side screenshot comparison so on the right side we just can select the replay so let's take a look at it okay it is not providing so let, let's rerun it so since your replay screenshot is not running up let me re replay it again now our replay is completed so now we can go to the snapshot pan just let me click on it so click on the page when either side see page by page we can compare so this is a recorded response and this is a replay response um, 
let's go back and uh, check for the second screen see here if you look at the recorded recorded screen has got for the second request we got the response as a welcome jojo and blah 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 but whereas for the replay response as we just did it doesn't get the appropriate page it means we does not have a valid session with the request so here if you look at it is also showing like you have reached a page incorrectly probably bad session value please use link it means it is it is sending a in, incorrect response says your session doesn't handled properly so this is the way just we can compare page by page and we can compare page by page let's look at so the third request we got another response on the right side for the replay and the sign off anyhow we got some pages been missed on the re recorded so anyhow we don't need to worry about the sign off so but here one important step let's take the second request submit login here in the submit login it says you have reached the incorrect parameters okay so this is the one of the way like we can verify whether your replay has been successful or not let's look at what we need to do correlate so in order to do correlation successful as a initial steps we must record the same flow at least two times to make your script or to to identify which particular part of the script that you need to correlate let's do the second time recording make sure that you are doing it for for two times if you want to check which are things are changing as part of your request it is very helpful if you are starting with the load runner you are very much familiar with the load runner already you so you don't need to go and record multiple times to compare so now let me do other time so this is the correlation one let me do it let me re-record another script it is nothing but the correlation two so i'm just creating the new script new script nothing but correlation to so let me complete the recording for the correlation to script our second script recording is done so as soon as your script recording is done for the second time you just go and compare these two scripts by default load runner gives a comparison tool which already exists so let me show you how you can do that so i'm selecting the script one as the first one to compare and the script two action this week we'll be comparing action to action so that it will show up the differences that we have so let me do that so to do comparison just go to the tools compare and if you have already visited the script two so it will show up which you need to select here which file to compare okay sometimes selecting the file to compare doesn't work in that case just you can click on external file to compare so there from it will pop up a window and it will show up where is your script you need to select the where is your script just you need to navigate c and the scripts and if you want to compare with the correlation to script and action dot c so we just selected two scripts see here it has shown left side is your script one and right side is your script two so which we just recorded so it, it is showing something highlighted in yellow color so it is nothing but the differences between the two files so let's look at line by line the very first one is a highlighted an empty line it looks like there's some there is some extra space but but we are not going to worry about it so let's compare the request one so do the request have one having any highlights no now let's go to the second request see here in the second request it is highlighting something at the user session means the user session value has been changed here if you look at closely see user session value has got one two three two three zero dot eight x some x x x so here if you take on the right side so this value has got a different value after dot it has got two different values so using the different using the win merge tool that we can show differences and also there are few other things that it has uh, different values like login x and login y on the right side this is the way how we compare the one script with each other to show the differences so here we have identified this value as a 
changing for each and every time when we record the script so here script for the script 1 and script 2 it has changed so we can think that okay this is the value which is changing so we need to correlate this okay so to say this is the value which is changing this is nothing but a session value so we need to handle this to correlate so this is the why this is the reason why we are seeing a difference in recorded and replay window see here on your left side is a recorded and right side is a replay so the value is getting so we can do and correlate this value so let us see how to correlate this value so there are some steps everyone follows their own method to correlate let me show how i can do that so first in order to correlate you must select the which is the whichever the value which is changing just copy that correlated value which you want to do and go to your output log there from go to your code generation log and you must go to the top of the correlation value so for code generation log so just by clicking on the control home you can go to the code generation top and therefore we just go and put a value whatever you want to find in the code generation log so let me tell you what are the steps first so since this is a value which comes as part of the request you know so this value may be occurred in any of the previous requests so we need to capture this value which is this may be coming very dynamically so that's why this recorded session is not sufficient to handle the right response or to to get the right response so what we are doing is we'll be going to do capture this value as part of the request one or we will be finding where it is occurring for which response it is occurring and we will form a correlation value so let's do that so i'm going to the top of the correlation code generation log and i'm just clicking on the next so it may it is showing me this has been occurred for this line so we are seeing that value here so let me show you that again so i just pasted that value here whatever we captured from the script and i'm just clicking on next so it will automatically highlight where that value sometimes though if you search for that you you may not be seeing that value appeared in the code generation log code generation log so means it may be not part of your response sometimes these kind of values may be generated as part of your browser script so the values if generated as part of your browser scripts those cannot be identified in your code generation log so right now it has been identified in our response nothing but we are seeing that the whole line here just copy that line now we need to identify for which request it has been coming as part of the response so as we see previously seen in our session so every request has been identified by a unique snapshot okay the very first request which comes as part of snapshot so that snapshot name is t1.inf and for the second request t2.inf and for the third request t3 so for every every request is uniquely identified by a snapshot number so we can we can some we can make use of this snapshot to identify which request it would be before going to that steps i will show you for which request has been occurred we may be have already seen uh, how this code generation log will looks like and how response and then request everything will be formed from here let's scroll very slowly and look at for which request has been occurring now i'm showing one way to identify for which request it has identified so what we need to do is so once you are once you find that respective value in your response then select then again in a search box press dollar dollar so then you your cursor must be here your cursor must be placed after the whatever the request value that you want whatever the value that you want to identify so this value has been identified here so i'm putting my cursor here then go to your search and put dollar dollar so it will go and find the appropriate request url where it has been identified okay see you we, we got the dollar dollar here so if you scroll down a bit it will show for it will show you for which request it has been occurred see if you look at it has been occurred for cgi bin welcome pl dot uh, welcome pl question mark sign off equal to true so you can copy this and you can search it in your script from the starting so i'm going to my script starting and 
pressing control F I'm searching for the URL see it is showing me that okay this URL is occurring at very first place so here is the place that you need to handle the correlation means for this particular request this dynamic value or this session value is been occurring okay so we can form the correlation value for this request okay if once we once we form the correlation so your correlation will capture this particular value dynamically and after that we can pass it to your second request okay so before implementing it so let's look at what is a correlation function that we normally use in our day-to-day -day life to handle the correlation we are having three kind of correlation functions the very first one is a web bridge save param function this function is being used for a while okay which is been occurring from very earlier versions of the load runner so recently they have introduced another two correlation functions web bridge save param x so this is the second correlation fund which has been coming from the uh, load runner 11 version and web bridge save param rejects which has also been introduced in the recent versions of the load runner so let's look at we will be using web bridge save param at first as we just seen we will be using here web bridge save param x function since we identified previously so our correlation value so this value which we need to correlate so this has been occurring as part of first response okay so we are going to go we are going to form the correlation here using the web bridge save param function so we can select web bridge save param we can write the function here web bridge save param so this is the function web bridge save param function takes some arguments i will show what are they so by default the very first one is the parameter name like if you want to give some name to the web bridge save param so we can give it as a very first very first parameter as a web bridge save param is a parameter name what is the name that you want to give for the correlation value and it will take the next argument as left boundary and the next argument as right boundary and last so this is the function terminator to say no more arguments available after this so web bridge save param by default we must supply all these the values so it is nothing but the parameter name left boundary and right boundary and the last so the last is a terminator so we, which we must include now to complete the correlation let's go back and we can capture the whole line from our record generation log so here to to capture this particular value you must get you must capture the whole line where you found it see here we found this value here and I'm just right now I'm copying the whole value where it is occurred and I'm putting it in my request and just coming it commenting it out okay so I'm just copy I'm giving a comment with the slash slash so I'm putting that value here so it will not impact my script to get any errors or warnings so now what we need to do here if you want to ident if you want to do correlation for this value whatever the value before to that value will become as a left boundary see now right now i have highlighted the left boundary so this is before to the value and after to the value will become a right boundary now let's look at how it can be formed i'm selecting the whole value before to that whatever the value that we need i'm putting it as a left boundary i'm putting in the place of lb after lb equal to that value and here if you see that it is showing something like some syntax level uh, color, coloring matching so we must one thing we one thing we need to remember here so whenever you're doing the correlation if your correlation is having any double quotes if your correlation is having any double quotes we must escape them using slash so before substituting itself i'm escaping in our commented section so wherever you see the double quote you must escape with a slash look at here i'm put escaping each and every double quote with slash so instead of instead of putting that instead of pasting this value in the left boundary and submitting it submitting, submitting the slash with escaping you must before escape there in our example and then you can substitute your left and right boundary so that will not show any 
that would not throw any special or that would not throw any um, syntax errors. Now let's copy the right boundary. Just say okay. So you, we have copied our right boundary. So as soon as you complete your correlation, you just simply go and click on compile to show up if we have any compilation errors. I will show if we are not escaping any double quotes. It will throw compilation errors. Let I will show you now here. So let me remove the double. Let me remove the escape values for the double quotes and submit as it is. It will show up some syntax errors. See, I just submitted and I'm compiling now here. See, it has thrown up lot of errors. Right. So make sure that whenever you try to put any double quotes in your correlation, you must escape them in slash. So now we have made a correlation with a proper left and right boundary. So, so I'm giving a call name for the correlation as a correlation. So what is the appropriate name that we need to give here in your real time situations? Like you don't need to give whatever the name that you wanted to. It is a best practice to the give whatever the name that you see for that value. See, see here user session is the name for that value. So I'm going to put the correlation name as user session. Now let's as soon as you complete you completed forming a correlation value, you just need to replay once. So before replaying once, there is one setting that you need to identify that you need to enable in your runtime settings. Just go to the runtime settings and in log you must always select extended log. So it will show up the correlated value if it is capturing anything as part of request as part of response it will show up the value so you must you must select extended log and parameter substitution so that it will show up the whatever the values it has been captured in your replay log so your replay log will show up all the correlated values in your replay log okay it will show any blue color so let me i just enable the advanced settings for the replay log let me rerun it The replay is going on. Yeah, it's done now. So let's go back and look at the replay log one after the other. So replay. See here, what as as I just earlier, your correlations will appear in the blue color. See, user session the value whichever we just correlated is been occurring in our replay log means our correlation is successful. So you are able to capture that value, but Let's look at as as we just discussed, we have already captured the correlation, but it is not able to show the appropriate response in my replay. Why? Because we captured the correlation, but we never substituted in our request place up in appropriate request. So our next step is to substitute the correlation. So copy your correlation name and go back to the request wherever it occurs. Just replace it with between the curly braces as we previously seen it for the same level of curly braces for the parameters or parameterization. So we do the similarly for the correlation. So in the place of whatever the dynamic value that you are seeing, just put it in a, put it, replace it with a user session. So this is how we do correlation and this is how we do the substituting the correlation. So the first step we are capturing the correlation and in the second step we are substituting the correlation. So Likewise, we need to substitute everywhere wherever we are seeing that value. So there is a short way how to do that. So select that value, press Control H, and put the replace, replay, replace with option and replace all. So it will go and replace everywhere. So this is how we capture and substitute the correlation. We just seen how to handle the correlation, how to form a correlation and how to substitute it in the request. So let us replay and verify whether it is helpful to get the right page. So now we're replaying our script. So let's replay once and see what is the response that we're getting after substituting the correlation.
make sure that sometimes you are whenever you are replaying your virtual user generator may be freezing so but don't worry it may be it will be automatically come out after couple of seconds but do not close unnecessarily if it freezes otherwise it would be lost to your script okay let's go back and verify this second second step or second request so if you look at here so it is recording now and it is a replay now see if you look at after handling the correlation we are able to get the right response it means we are able to supply the right session for the respective request so we are sending the right session for the request to here okay this is how we handle the correlation so there is one more important thing that we need to make sure that so as a standard practice so better you should never leave you should never remove this value instead of that you can put it as a comment you can just copy that value and put it as a side in a comment so that if anyone else is going to use in future okay they will come to know that okay this is particular respective value will be copied here so they, they will understand okay this is the value which is coming up so that they will take it as a reference so it is the best practice whenever you are doing any correlation so directly do not replace first copy that value and put it as a side put it aside in the comment section and you can substitute with the actual correlation value actual correlation name in your script this is very common standard best practice that you need to do now let's go back another request to do correlation see here we have completed the login part so we don't need to worry about it now so let's look at the other request that is nothing but a delete a booking so here there are some it is showing some differences this is the value one and this is a value two so it is deleting the whatever the respective flight id it is having in itinerary okay so now let's let's do correlation for this so today in order to correlation you must copy the value first in your script let's go back to the script so we are going to correlate this since we find this as a value that needs to be correlated so again the do the same process so go to your code generation log home page by pressing the control home and copy the value whichever you want to correlate now click on the next so it, it is coming up here so it is showing up the value here now you copy the entire line and after that just select dollar dollar just say next so it is been appearing for cga.login.pl in that too specially it is happening for it is happening for itinerary so if you look at the second request the, the, you, know, you always need to select the last request in your frame or in your in your in your in your, in your uh, frame of the whatever that you have set it for you must always select the last url see this is the url page equal to itinerary so here this is the that respect to page otherwise just you can go and copy that and set again in your request so it, it is saying that okay this particular itinerary value whatever the flight id okay that has been occurred for this request so now let's go back and capture the value capture the whole line or copy the whole line here select the select and we just go here and substitute here substitute here so now we need to form a correlation for this again select and we need to write the correlation function web bridge save param with first you know whenever you are trying to do correlation if you want to do a best practice first of all create a template for, or create a syntax for the web bridge save param function so this is the I have created three set of parameters with one one last parameter as last so first lb equal to and rb equal to so if you create this kind of standard skeleton it would be really helpful for understand initially to handle and how to form a correlation properly so as i just said first of all whatever the double quotes that you have in your script just escape them and here i'm just escaping everything there whatever and just you need to substitute appropriate left and right boundary so whatever the thing that is that is before to your value is become as left boundary 
and whatever the value that is after that value becomes as a right boundary and what is the name that you can give here either you can take it from your script so here i am taking the name from your script nothing but flight id so this is the completed correlation value okay sometimes you don't want to replay the whole stuff whole stuff means you don't need just you you want to only replay until the step where it is occurred and you don't want to go and execute the further steps so in that case we use the debugger so how you invoke the debugger means your script will execute this particular step and it will come to the debugger and it will pause your script so let, let's use the debugger here select wherever you want to put the debugger and press f9 at that particular step so debugger will be enabled debugger will be added in your script you can add multiple debuggers or multiple breakpoints okay here I have already placed a breakpoint here how to remove this if you again put the cursor in the same place and if you press again f9 it will add the it, it will remove the breakpoint see otherwise you can also click on your respect to just end of your line number and you can just click on it it will add or remove okay so now i have enabled the breakpoint here so let's run it your script will not execute further it will just come up there and it will stop see here we found that correlation value here so this is an easy way if you put the debugger here it debugger will always you know otherwise debugger will always put after the value whatever the value that you want to correlate so it will not go beyond your request so it will it won't get any confusion okay you don't need to again search back and forth in the replay log to see whether the correlation has been captured or not so i have enabled the debugger here so it has come up and stopped means i'm lively able to see whether the correlation value has been captured or not so i'm just stopping the script so we can prevent further execution of the script so it will save some time for us so we captured that value and we need to substitute it now so i'm just selecting it and just go go to the respective value first take a backup for that value in comment and then you can substitute here with the name of flight id so i have substituted it now so if you replay it it will show up the value is whether if it is having any right flights it will show up otherwise it won't delete anything so there is one thing that i want to show up here so there is previously whenever the correl we will see the two blue color lines here for the user session the very first one is the notify saving parameter user session and respective value and notify parameter substitution means the very first value will be the where it is capturing the user session or the correlation and the second second blue color line will show up it is substituting so it is already clearly defined so saving parameters means capturing the correlation substitution sub, parameter substitution means it is substituting in the appropriate request so both the blue color lines will have a meaning so whether you can identify by if your correlation is capturing or not so you just you can look at the saving parameter the text called as saving parameter so using this you can identify and quickly search in your replay log if you are having multiple correlations to check in likewise as of now i just created a parameter created a correlation to capture so i have a captured here and i have to substitute so let me run it let me let me run it completely so it will show up recorded cap wherever it is capturing and wherever it is substituting so i have a debugger point here just run through it so on the right side pan whatever you are seeing here runtime viewer so this runtime viewer very helpful whenever you want to cross check whatever the screens that are coming as part of your replay so let me show it up it will show up all the screens whatever whatever the script show whatever the whatever comes as part of your replay 
so your first request let me show it up again so this is the this is the response for your first request which is approximately like your which is almost like your html page so the next next response and the next response see how we can compare so whenever the user clicks at first time itinerary we, we just try to delete one itinerary for right so whenever user click the itinerary we got two two we have two bookings in uh, in our itinerary and after that our our deleting is been done or deleting a one booking is done so we, we, we are seeing only one booking id here available so previously we have two tickets so whenever delete is applied we got only one it means our delete got successful so likewise we can you we can make use of runtime viewer to cross check whether we are getting the right response or not or right page or not so this is the how we how we do some basic correlation apart from these exist apart from these three basic correlation parameters there are some advanced correlation values let me show up what are they after that we will be going to see how to implement them in our script let's look at the complete parameters list that we have for the web bridge server so we already seen that name or whatever the correlation name that we wanted to give and the left boundary and the right boundary that we have already seen and last is also we have seen so next option that we are going to see about search search means where you want to search in the response so basically a response contains three things the very first one is the response headers and next one is the response body and dependent resources okay so here this search search field or search argument will say where you want to search in in response in any particular area of the response let's say if you want to search in the headers just you can mention here as headers headers if headers of the response and if you want to search in only the body instead of searching headers you can mention here sometimes you, you don't have any clue you can mention it as all all means it will go and try for with the left, proper left right boundary that you mentioned it will go and search in the headers body and some extra resources here resources is nothing but static resources it may be css javascript which we have already seen in our previous session so it will go and search in that respect to resources okay and next one is the ordinal so ordinal is one ordinal or ord we simply say ord ordinal is a one of the important correlation argument that we use many times and we dependent a lot of times lot of situations so ord means let me show an example ord will be used whenever you have a value which is having whenever you have multiple values with the similar left and right boundaries see if you look at here so this is the flight ids which we just correlated so i'm just i have I have other flight ids with the same left and right boundary see if you here the left boundary and the right boundary is common for all the flights so word is used to capture all the similar values with the similar respond similar left and right boundaries if you mention word equal to one it will go and capture the first value for your correlation so it will capture the first value 4 to 8 6 7 9 4 7 9 4 and jb it will capture first value if you put it as word equal to one if you want to capture the third value nothing but this one you can mention it as a word equal to three so it will capture this value and sometimes you may be in a situation you need to capture all the values okay so you can mention it as a word equal to all so it will capture all the values so let's take an example how it can be handled i will show you in our next session welcome to helpingtesters.com so in this session we are going to see in brief about correlation so let's look at let's continue with our previous session see here previously we have used word equal to all and we discussed it will capture all the values but let's see how it will be captured so i just pasted our correlation function which we created in our script so let's see how these values will be created so these values will be captured in your correlation by underscore one equal to the whatever the value one and after that 
likewise it will capture all the values whatever it finds as part of your response so here we have the four values right so we will be having four values with the proper respective index so here index 4 so let me put down all the values here so it will ca in in your in your uh, replay log you will be finding all the values like this so along with this extra it will also give some extra value for this correlation that is nothing but flight underscore id equal to count it means it will give the total number of occurrences for this left and right boundaries for this parameter so it will since we are having now four values which matches with similar left and right boundaries so it will give you the count as four okay so whenever you are if you want to substitute the respective value if you want to capture all the values and if you want to get any third value so in your script you can substitute like this if you want to get the third occurrence you can mention it as flight id underscore three so this is the case whenever you mention word equal to all but if you mention though there may be a number of occurrences and if you want to say some third occurrence directly you don't need to mention word equal to all instead that you can mention word equal to three so in this case it won't get all these values it will get directly like flight id equal to so let me type that flight id equal to and respective third value okay and we won't get any count though we are using word e it won't get any count because we are specially mentioning that which particular value that we want to capture so that if it is capturing it will it will show up the value otherwise it will throw an error like so and so value with the proper with the left with the given left and right boundaries is not captured so here what i want to say is if you use any specific number directly we won't get anything like this flight and flight id underscore count this is only comes whenever you mention word equal to all so this is exclusive case, exclusive case for word equal to all so word equal to all will give respective index with a one two three four or uh, n number of occurrences that whatever and the finally it gives the count for that particular correlation so let's take and let's look at how we implement this in our script so before implementing this we must be having n number of like we must be having multiple flight ids already booked so let me do that I'm booking multiple flight IDs under itinerary. Flights, book, book. So one booking is done. And flights, let's say some different locations. So I'm booking multiple flights. So we should be having multiple records in our itinerary. So let's go back to the itinerary. So here in our itinerary, we have three values. Let's look at how word equal to all will bring all the respective values. Okay, so here just we are modifying, we are adding some extra things so called as odd equal to all, odd equal to all. So it will bring up all the values with the respective index. Let's replay it once. If you look at here, see I just put a breakpoint here, so it, that's why. It has come to this step and it has passed my script. So if you look at as we just seen, it, it has given me all the possible occurrences with the given left and right boundaries with the appropriate index. So here we have manually seen that three, three flights are there. Similarly to match that, so we are able to capture with this left or right boundaries, we are able to capture three flight IDs. So flight ID 1, flight ID 2, flight ID And at the end, it is also showing the count of the how many occurrences. So here we got the occurrences flight occurrences equal to 3 now let's look at how to substitute if you are not putting word equal to all okay so instead of whenever you are explicitly mentioning word equal to some value let's look at how it is substituting or how to substitute it let me stop my debugger
so I'm mentioning here let's say I want to delete the third flight or third booking so I'm mentioning it here three so let's go back and run it so so far we are having three so once reply is done we will be getting only two let's stop it so unfortunately we got some error so we can ignore for it right now just I want to show that it is picking up the third value or not so we since we mentioned word equal to three so whenever you look at here we can go to the replay log see we got the it is substituting the value here so whenever you are if you whenever you seeing any parameters substituting or co create saving parameters if you want to go to the respective step I am going to show one easy step so if you want to highlight or if you want to directly jump into that particular request just you go to your replay log and double click on it so it will directly jump your script into that appropriate request so it means it is capturing that correlation value here and if you sub if you double click again here so it will it is showing that it is substituting that correlation value here so you, either this is not only the blue line you it may be any line so if you double click on your replay logs it will take you to the appropriate request where it is presenting so let's go back and verify so it has previously we have seen three flights right so if you have remembered the third value is a 1120 so here it is directly substituting the flight ID this is how we handle whenever you do the explicitly mentioning any value to capture let's go back to the word equal to all so if you use word equal to add and sometimes you will be in a specific need that out of these all correlation values you want to pick one value randomly to do that concept we call it as a randomization now let's look at how to pick a random value from the list of captured correlations so for that we will be using a special function called lr param array random lr param array random so this is the function by default which comes with the load runner or virtual user generator so we will make use of picking a random value out of this all the all the list of matching values so previously this is the lr param array random which we are using now from the load runner 11.5 so before that we have to use some random logic because before to that this lr parameter random function was not there so before that we we will be using we were using some random method to do that randomization but as of now we don't need to learn about it because we are already having one ready made function which is available so let's do that how to do this okay now let's look at what this lr parameter random will do and what it takes so lr parameter random will take whatever the correlation value which is having multiple occurrences okay so we need to supply the respective correlation id respective correlation name to the lr parameter random so the return it will return the whatever the string it will find it will automatically picks one random and it will return that value to your script so now there is something we should be having to capture that random value right so for that I'm going to create an array let's nothing but let me create care random flight ID so we already know that flight ID is not more than 15 characters so that I'm selecting it as a 15 or just for the safe side I'm just making it as a 20 now we're going to tell that LR param array random to save whatever the random flight ID it captures to save into this character it, it returns a character it returns a character it returns lr parameter random returns a string so we are asking it to save it into the random flight id character array. so let's look at how to save that value into the how to whatever the random value written by the lr parameter random into flight id so for that we will be depending depending on one more c one, one more c function that is nothing but str cpy strcp will always so this is a completed function strcp will always copy the values from the right side to left side so whatever the random value that is been captured by the lr parameter random will be copied into the 
character array nothing but random flight id so let's run it and verify whether it is capturing or not so far we don't know whether it is we we, we assumed that lr parameter random captures the random value but let's look at whether it is capturing it or not let's look at here so don't worry about the right side screen just we are trying to make out of this everything using the replay log so our replay is done let's go back to the end so either you can also go to the respective line in the replay log just by right clicking the right click right click on the which line you want to see and click on go to replay so it will be going there see it has randomly picked up this value nothing but it has picked automatically the first value so it is saving the value into random flight that we haven't seen that so in order to see that if you want to see some value which is there in one character array or in anything we will make use of one special load runner function called lr output message so that it will write the output into your replay log okay let's look at how this works so lr output message will be taking the two kind of either it may be two kind of or one kind of argument so the, let's look at the two kind of argument since we want to see the value whatever there in the random id random flight id so this is the way so here percentage just means since it is a character array so we are mentioning it as representing using this percentage s so i am closing it here and we need to substitute which we want to see so percentage the value will be substituted here and we will see the output so we can also make some statement here so the value n random flight id so this placeholder will be substituted by the random flight id so now let's replay it once and we will see whether the it has got the value or not so now we just seen one one more new function here lr output message let's look at it so replay is done so if you want to see whether it is re actually writing giving any output or not just right click select that statement go and right click and go to the replay log so it will take you to the appropriate line go to the replay log see it is showing that whatever the string that i have written there the value in the random flight id is flight id blah 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 right so we have learned two things here str cpy and lr output message and lr parameter random so this is one of the new thing that we learned to give some random so str to to get the some random value from the list of correlations and we also learned about str cpy to copy any value from one one character array to another character array are nothing but one string to another string and lr output message if you want to print something on your replay console or replay log we will make use of lr output message so in our going forward session we will make more use of lr output state lr output message statement or this method now we are going to see how it would be substituted in our request directly so we cannot directly re substitute random flight id this whatever the character array in our request because if substitute in your request it must be in the form of a parameter so right now this is a character array now we in our next session we are going to see how to convert this character array into a parameter load runner parameter which can be substituted in in your request welcome to helpingtesters.com in our previous sessions we have seen about the correlation and various options available with the correlation and we were looking about word equal to all options so we were also looking at how to do randomization whenever you are trying to capture multiple or multiple values using the word equal to all and also we have seen about str cpy and we have seen lr parameter random which will get a random value from the list of correlations and we are we have used str cpy to copy a random correlation value into a character array and we have also verified whether it has been capturing the value or not into the random flight id to include all the stuff whatever we have discussed so far in terms of parameterization and in terms of correlation we're going to use this example jpeg store so this is one of the online application which is available 
just go and try recording your you can try all your uh, load under correlation everything here so just let's look at the flow what we're going to see so we're going to select one random category let's say fish and out of this random out of this we will be having all the product ids let's say we are going to pick one random uh, fish category and add it to the cart and just go to the proceed to checkout and by default if you want to go and register you can register with your name and uh, you can continue with the existing default login so for your usage i'm giving the credentials demo and password password will be the password so just do the login so go to any fish category let me reiterate again the whole flow select any random fish category add to cart okay just go to the proceed to checkout so give any random value here one two three four one two three four one two three four so fill out all the details and I give some expiry date for 12 and 20 and just say continue and submit okay so and after that you can just can again sign it out so this is the flow that we are going to look at now using the we are going to apply all the that whatever the things that we have learned here now i'm going to record all the flow that whatever we have seen before until checkout and review your order so let's go ahead and complete the recording process so i'm going to click sign in let's complete whole recording process now i have recorded up to submit order so let's go to the my account and we're going to review your order from your orders list so my account and my orders and this is the recent one which i have created the order so just i'm opening that order open order and just a sign out so you, after completing this step so you're going to generate the script for your reference i'm listing down the website address and make sure that you're not putting lot of low just try it for the one or two users and also list of the steps that i have followed for your friends you can make down you can note it down and whenever it practice you can do the same so as we discussed in our previous session so we have we have recorded the same steps two times so the very first one is jpet store is the first one i recorded and the jpet store 2 is the second time that i have recorded so now let's compare so what are the differences that we need to find that we'll be finding to do correlation so let's do compare so i'm comparing the jpet store 2 script with the first one so if you look at here so it has been providing a lot of things so if you are locating your if you look at here so website socket option so this is a very special statements whenever you're dealing dealing with the HTTPS applications or SSL enabled application let's say our application URL is a HTTPS it starts with HTTPS right so to handle the HTTPS application so this website socket option is automatically generated by the virtual user generator so you don't need to worry about this statement so it automatically picks the right SSL version you don't need to worry about it and let's do compare so it is it is showing that uh, you do not work snapshot is a difference but you do not need to worry about the snapshot if it is showing the difference basically in order to compare with the which are which are things to correlate you must always look at the two things one is the url and another one is the if it is a web if it's a get request it is nothing but the web url okay you must get url place if your url is showing any difference and as well if you take any post request for the post request you also look at uh, you need to look at the url and as well as the form data or item data or whatever you are seeing here so for the get request just i'm reiterating for the get request only the url for the post request web submit data is nothing but post so for the post request it should be the url that you should be comparing and it should be the item data so let's look at one after the other so the very first request doesn't have since it is a get request it doesn't have any differences because url does not have any differences and let's look at the second request second request also does not have any differences here it is not highlighting anything and if you look at the third request see it is showing it is not showing anything in the request or the url 
okay url is not having any change but if you look at the item data or form post data which is showing a value which is saying the difference see if you look at the parameter if you look at the form post parameter nothing but csrf see the value this value has been changing for the first script and second script. so that we can consider this this script this is the value that we need to do correlation let's do let's go and do this value for the correlation okay so this is the third request so as previously discussed just copy that value and go to your code generation log at top using the control home and copy and paste that value here and click on next so it will take you to the appropriate line so you just copy the line keep it in your clipboard you just copy you don't need to do anything else as of now just copy that and put your cursor here okay previously we have discussed to search for dollar dollar right so let's go with that approach i am searching for the dollar dollar so it is taking me to the uh, some step let's scroll down see it is just identify the respective request so previously it was showing it was showing through some url so if you look at this url you you won't be finding here so the other alternate case to how to identify the correlation in your script you can you can scroll down to the respective request name see here this request name is uh, t12.inf see if you go back t12.inf this is the one so this is the one approach using searching using the dollar dollar there is one more approach so let me take it from the starting so you need to search with the appropriate value <clears throat> and you need to copy the line which you want to capture make sure that you are not copying anything else other than the line okay if you copy some extra space it may lead into your correlation failure so just only the copy the value just copy the value and after that put your cursor again the same instead of typing dollar dollar try type dot inf in small character dot inf so it will take you to the appropriate request where you want where you need to substitute your correlation so here it is saying it is showing like t12 dot inf is the place that you need to substitute the correlation so let me reiterate you need to go for the appropriate place you need to go to the code generation log you need to home of the code generation log and search for the value put your cursor after that value and also copy that line and now you need to search for the dot inf so it will show up the respective snapshot where you can substitute the correlation so it is showing the t12 dot inf now go to your script and find the where is the t12 dot inf so here is the t12 dot inf now you can form the correlation here so let's do that so as we seen in our previous session so web bridge save param function that we use for the correlation so let's form the skeleton for the correlation function basically we are having three three parameters to manipulate to add so lb and rb and also whatever the method name that you want to whatever the correlation that you want to do so i'm giving the correlation name as csrf and may, for them for to make any sense just always give the whatever the name that we have here for the correlation value as we discussed in our previous session so and also now let's go and escape the double quotes so i'm i'm escaping the, all the double quotes with a slash wherever i find it now i need to copy the with the respective left boundary into the left boundary section and the right boundary into the right boundary section so i have substituted so now i need to verify whether this value has been capturing or not so let me go to the runtime settings and enable advanced log extend a log advanced log now i am replaying the script to see if it is having if it is able to capture or not see it has captured we are seeing it in the blue screen so now you can substitute in all the places of yours if you look at here since it has a some correlation session so it is not allowing your script to go further unless until you you handle this value because it is invalid session and your script your server throws um, forbidden error okay so means that page is not accessible 
okay so now let's substitute the correlation everywhere wherever we see that value so one easy option to substitute it everywhere just select that value press ctrl h and replace with the correlation parameter and say replace all so it will substitute in everywhere okay so and we forgot to uh, put that value take as a comment backup i took a backup for it so that whoever user comes next for the performance tester uh, comes next so he can able to understand so this value should be was there okay so this is a correlation that we have done so if you replay now it won't throw any error so now for this login part it doesn't throw any error so it, it went well let's find out what are the other values that we have for your comparison So this is a JPEG store which we previously compared. Okay, so this is we correlated and we verified it is working. And what are the next values? So click fish. See here under the fish section. Uh, wait, let me show that. Okay, so this is the value. Though it is not showing any difference, our aim is to select a random fish product from the fish list. So let me do that. So I'm going to script back this is the fish section so this is the fish product that we select out of the fish so this is the fish product so i want to capture all the fish values with the uh, all the fish products with the similar left and right boundary so let's do correlation for this so go to code generation log and search for that product and uh, click next so it is showing me that it has found in appropriate place so you just copy the line and uh, copy and after that as i just stated uh, use dot inf to find where you need to substitute so it is it is telling that t t14 dot inf is the place so this is the t14 dot inf so now we come down here and now you form the correlation so webridge save param function this value is occurring twice in your uh, line whatever that you want to cook captured so here this is occurring after the products and it is also occurring here so just try take this as a left boundary so you don't need whatever you feel which is not having the value take it as a left boundary and you can take this small line as a right boundary okay so this is the way that you can find out so you can name it as uh, as of now we don't have any proper parameter for this so now uh, we can give any name here and you won't um, so let's say it's a fish products fish products as we previously discussed so we are we, we want to do correlation random correlation or randomization so for that we are making it as word equal to all so it will go and capture all the values randomly using the fish products correlation so let me put a breakpoint here so let me press F9. So it will add a breakpoint. So let me replay once and I will show the values, whatever it captures. If you look at here, so this this product has this fish products has with a similar left and right boundary. It has got four occurrences with the similar left and right boundaries. So now we are going to see how to do randomization with this. Welcome to helpingtesters.com. So let's continue with the whatever we have done in the previous session. So far we have done script recording for the JPEG store and we have selected a random fish product and we proceed to check out and submit the payment. After that we have reviewed the whatever the order we placed. So as part of it just we did the correlation for session ID so which we captured and we already placed it and after that we were left with correlation correlating the whatever the fish product that whatever we have chosen while recording and also we have we have seen that comparing the two scripts so whichever gets changed so let's continue with that so we have already captured the fish product using the word equal to all so we were able to capture all the fish products here so let's continue with the session now we are able to capture the multiple products which with the same similar multiple fish products with the similar left and right boundaries now let's do the randomization let's apply the randomization here so using the lr parameter random as we discussed previously so let's continue with that so as we already seen one example so let's continue with another example here so in order to pick a random 
fish product uh, we must be using the lr parameter random function so lr parameter random function let, let me implement that so the here for this function we need to supply respective correlation that is nothing but fish products so which has got multiple values like we have here it has got it has got four occurrences random value automatically so we don't need to worry about it again for the writing some extra function so this is function is enough to pick one random value from the list of correlations it, are, it has got so now i will show so this value lr parameter random will return one random random array or random string so to hold this random string we must be creating a character array so go to the top of the action and make sure that you must declare all the character arrays or all user defined variables at the top so if you come and define after after any after any of the lines so it will throw an error just let me show that so character random fish product so let me define it as a 20 make sure that you are giving the right appropriate size for that you need to refer with the c function so how to declare a character array as a simple introduction we have already covered this c programming in our previous session okay so now let's compile and as i just said so let's compile and see if you are not putting this whatever the user defined variables on the top as a very first statement what happens see it will throw an error so we just compile see it is showing it as an illegal statement termination so better always as a best practice and a standard syntax you must always keep all the variables declared at the top now let's compile again it won't throw any error see now so we got this fish product now we need to assign that random product random fish product to this parameter so we already seen that strcpy function that we use it so it will copy the respective value whatever generated by the lr parameter random and it will copy the value into the random fish product so now we got fish product random fish product into this character array now let's verify so how we verified previously using the lr output message using this function we are verifying so lr output message let me reiterate lr output message will write any output to the output log whatever the message that you want to print on the replay log or nothing but replay output log okay so here i'm printing let's say so random fish product so you must be knowing some c language basics to to understand more about this so which we already discussed so we have done up to this so it will print one random fish product so let's verify let's run it if it picking the random product or random fish product or not let's verify two three times okay i'm running it if you look at here it has picked this time fish product underscore four it has picked the fourth product or fourth occurrence now let me replay again it is going through the replay so let's maximize see here this time it has got first product or first occurrence of the fish product so this is how lr parameter random is used to pick one random value so the job is not yet done so there is one one more thing that we need to do that we cannot directly pass this random fish product array since it is a c array so we cannot directly put it in our request so what we need to do we need some function which needs to save this character array or any string into load runner parameter or to substitute as a parameter so for that we are making use of lr save string function always load runner functions which starts with lr their assignment will always comes from the right side to left side and if you take any c, c existing functions those assignments will come from always right to left so it would be the lr functions assignments will always opposite to the c assignments c assignments will do from the right to left lr assignments will do will done from from the left to right so let's do that so we are giving some name here you can give whatever the meaningful name random fish product we can again verify that whether it has been assigning that value to the whatever the random fish product it is assigning whether it is assigning to the this parameter or not just to avoid the 
name discrepancy just i'm making it as a short name random fish pro let me rerun on it see here the whatever the random occurrence has got into the random fish pro so we are able to verify that so now we can go ahead and substitute this value wherever we see this fish product so that it will automatically randomly will be picking that respective fish product and it will add it to the card so let's implement that so i'm stopping the script to run now we are going to replace everywhere wherever we see fish fisw02 with random fish pro okay so for that i am doing it very simple activity just select whatever the value you have press control h so it will pop up the replace win replace window and just give the name within the curly braces and say replace all so now it has been replaced everywhere wherever it sees the random fish product let's go and compare the values again so we have done so far up to this so let's compare again what else we left compare to an external file and action.c don't worry so whatever the previous request which we have correlated so those will be anyhow will be having a different value so let's continue with the further uh, next request where we left with so up to this we have correlated so random fish proofs and after this let's look at so add to cart see here if you look at this is the one value which has got the different add to cart until our add to cart step we have done so now let's continue with the add to cart so now if you look at here this has been highlighted since it's a get request you need to go and check it here so now we are going to correlate this value as well so just copy the value and just go back to your script see this is the value we have that we have in the request let's find out whatever we have how we do the correlation again so similarly the same concept which we have already seen so to do correlation always go to the code generation log go to the home of the code generation log nothing but the top of the code generation log by just pressing control home and paste your value and search for it see here it has highlighted something here just copy that and we need to find where it is occurred and or where we need to form the correlation so for that we are typing dot inf so it will provide you appropriate dot inf file wherever it occurs so it says snapshot 15 t15 dot inf that that is where we need to substitute now let's form the correlation template at first i recommend instead of directly substituting first try to form the correlation template after that escape all the double quotes then you can replace with the appropriate left and right boundaries okay now we got the value replace es escape the double quotes with the slash so now substitute the left and right boundaries left boundary substituted and right boundary substituted right let's remove this breakpoint by pressing f9 or you can click here we are capturing that value here right so you can put your breakpoint on the next request so that your request cannot be halted here press f9 we got a breakpoint now let's continue verify up to these steps one more thing that we forgot giving the name for the correlation id so i am taking the whatever the content we have as a refer name here it has name it, it has got name as item id so i am putting the same name here okay so let's replay again i just have adjusted the left and right boundaries because we should not be having the value whatever we want to correlate so i just adjusted the left and right boundaries so after replaying that we are able to capture whatever the item id it has got so now we can go and substitute this item id wherever we see that value okay i'm just stopping the script now i'm replacing wherever i'm seeing this value by pressing control h so just place it everywhere right so it will be substituted everywhere in the script now let's replay let's look at what else we left with see here so est3 is already done now this is something called proceed to checkout so here do we see anything highlighted no so only the snapshot which is which is a difference so we don't need to worry about the snapshot as i'm repeating again so for web url which is a get request you should always look at the difference for 
only URL and for form post or nothing but a web submit data you should always check out check it in the two way two, two places one is at action and see if URL is changing and if it is highlighted and form post data so this is the entire form post data okay we need to check which is it which item is changing see here 1226 which is it says okay let's come with here so it says CSRF token which is getting changed which is already highlighted so EA it starts with EA354 but if you look at here it starts with 6163 so this is the value which has got changed so let's look at other value it is also showing like expiry date so this expiry date which while recording which we entered manually so it is showing the difference in the two different instances I have entered two different expiry dates on the form but since this value is entered by us we don't need to worry about to the correlating them okay so instead we can do parameterize them so let's look at that later but as of now let's concentrate about this CSRF token okay let's move back to the script and find where is that CSRF token so this is the CSRF token we have let's complete the correlation again with the same approach so always go to the code look code generation log home and do next and so now I'm to, I'm going to take the whole line and I'm going to find out make sure that while copying the line you're not copying any unnecessary extra space so now I'm going to I'm going to find where it is for which dot inf it is occurring so go back to here press dot inf make sure that you're always putting your cursor after that line now press next so it is occurring at t16 dot infs you mean it means you can go and form a correlation for this csrf token at t16 dot inf now let me remove this breakpoint so let me form a correlation function where it save param So we formed a correlation. Now let's substitute wherever it occurs. So it is occurs here. So press Control H and replace everywhere. Okay. For the correlation, some people follows the standards by a prefix. So all the correlations will follow with a will be prefixed with a C. Okay. So you must be putting everywhere uh, with C. So C V C refers to correlation. So if you put P underscore, it refers to the parameterization just to differentiate the code correlation and the parameterization. So we have already substituted. So let's replay once. Likewise, you can correlate whatever the values that you see as a dynamic, which is got a different in all the places you can do the correlation. So this is how the correlation works. Let's look at other advanced feature of the correlation in our next session. Welcome to helpingtesters.com. Now we are, we are continuing with the correlations, advanced topics. So let us look at some important things, how to do correlations and how to handle whenever you get any error with the correlation. So let's say we have done this correlation previous in our previous session. So let me voluntarily make some of the left right boundaries changes. Okay, so which is not there in our script or which is not there in as part of this response. So what happens whenever whenever we don't have a right expected left and right boundaries in the script so so far we have seen the happy path now we're going to see the errors how it how it can be handled and various debugging options so let me rerun it so if your left and right boundaries are not proper okay and if you not if you are not handled or if your left right boundaries are not found in your response your script will immediately will be terminated at that place throwing the an error called correlation not found and it will suggest you to do something else see here so far we have done this correlation to work now it is not working due to i just added one extra dot here so as that reason it is not able to find that correlation and it is also throwing a message called no match found for the parameter c underscore csrf See, and it is also telling that hinting to increase the correlation parameter size of more than 256 bytes. Okay, the total length of the response 15591 and uh, it is hinting to 
use the website max html param length so sometimes whenever you're trying to capture any correlation okay there may be a situation like your correlation value whatever the you want to capture this value so this value size may be exceeding more than 256 characters so the default limit of the correlation function would be the 256 characters so if your correlation function size exceeding more than 256 characters though your left and right boundaries are proper your script may not be working because the default correlation size is not sufficient to handle that correlation so in that case make sure that after declaration of the all the statements here uh, all the statements of you know whatever the user defined variables that you declared as part of c okay after that you must be declaring something called web set max html param length so this is the function that you that that is used to increase the correlation capture length so here we need to hint say by default we are already discussed is 256 characters so we don't need to explicitly mention to capture the 256 character if your correlation value is more than 256 character let's say it may be of somewhere between 5000 characters that it needs to capture so there is no harm you go and put it double nine double nine nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine okay until this size it is able to capture means we won't be getting any error as of now though we replay we, 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 we will be again getting the error because i have explicitly made the right boundary as an error right boundary left boundary as an error left boundary so we don't need to worry about it but make sure that in some situations you will be getting into your left and right boundary seems to be fine but still you are not able to capture the expected value so in that case make sure that you are putting the website max html param length as a like whatever the value that you want to capture the size must be changed okay so i just made it as a double nine double nine so until 9999 characters it is able to capture let me also tell you one more thing here sometimes you won't be remembering the whole function syntax so in that case you can use the auto filler or you can make the help of helper so just type the whatever the function you know until then you can press the control space it will automatically populate the entire function list which starts with the whatever which starts with the characters that you typed so far so i am selecting this and it will also hint you what could be you need to type next so here i am typing so it is saying that constant care length it means we need to give a string as a length so i am giving the string as a length so it is so make sure that this will be very helpful whenever you are trying to write a function which you don't know the complete syntax let's say i am trying to write the lr save string so just i typed half typing the lr underscore save just i pressed control space so it automatically populated respective functions and it will also give the respective syntax so we have seen lr save string right so it is also showing us the syntax for it so it is the constant value and it is a parameter name means it is a string and where you want to save that parameter name so this is how you can use the automatic drop down or auto filler for the functions we have seen word equal to all now let's look at not form in some situations you may not be able to find a correlation which is not always be occurring so in that situation you can say if your if your correlation is not found as we just seen it will throw an error and your script script will be stopped in that case though the correlation is not found and you don't want to stop your script from the execution so in that case we are using a special thing called a special argument for the correlation called not found equal to warning okay there are several options for the not found the very first and commonly used option is the not found equal to warning it means it it won't your script won't be stopped though your correlation is not found so let's voluntarily make some changes to your left boundary and let's replay before applying the not found equal to warning how it will be stopped let's take a look at first and after that we apply not found equal to warning so how it continues we can take a look at it so i'm running my script so it is going on
here my script has thrown an error if you look at correlation got failed due to the some unknown left and right boundary so now it has continued it has stopped your script so now let's apply this setting or let's add this argument see whether it throws an error or it continues for this request see it is it has failed at action 76 so let's rerun it again If you look at previously there was an error due to the 70 at that the 76 step due to this correlation was not found now it was not throwing an error in fact it is throwing an error at different step that we don't need to worry because there's a dependency but just focus at the steps not found equal to warning so how it is handled here see if you look at it is throwing an error warning message called no match found the requested parameter either specify left and right boundaries not found in the response blah 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 okay so but it is not stopping your script in fact your script is continue with the next step okay after that due to this there is a dependency with uh, with the item id so our script has thrown error but make sure that whenever we will be using this situation like so whenever you're trying to do some correlation which is not occurring every time Sometimes for some users it is occurring and for sometimes some users it is not occurring just not to stop your script We will be using the not found equal to warning Now let's look at the parameter called search equal to all or search equal to all headers or body So it may be taking three different options. Now. Let's substitute how it can be used in our script Sometimes to capture a value you don't need to always look out look at it entire body of your response so instead you can look at a specific specific part of your response it may be nothing but headers or it may be nothing but body or it may be search equal to all as of now just to make this to pass i'm just making it as a search equal to all so this is a very rarely used option but in fact doesn't make any change if you put search equal to all by default it this this function internally added this particular argument will be internally added with the option called search equal to all though i'm mentioning it explicitly it doesn't make any change okay let's rerun it and whether it works or not it went through so we are able to capture that so let's verify it see search equal to all doesn't add any value here because by default it is searching in all in internally so though in some cases if we exclusively wanted to search in only headers so you can mention it as a headers okay so or if you want to search in a only body you can mention it as a body so this is how search works this is a very rarely used argument let's look at the other argument the next argument is ignore redirections so in some real times let's say ignore redirections will be used very effectively if your server is redirecting to you redirecting your request to other place so let's look at how it works let's take an example with a GUI approach let's look at so here we are user is trying to request for a page called page 1 so server internally redirecting to the page 2 it means server instead of this instead of sending this page server is redirecting internally to the page 2 so this page 2 response will send back to the user so here there is a redirection happening within the server so this page will be sent to page 2 will be the sent sent to the client instead of page 1 ignore redirection will be used whenever trying to capture any response from either page 1 or page 2 so if your response or if you are if you are trying to correlate something which is there as part of page 2 so in that case you must need to put ignore redirection as equal to no so or if you want to put if you want to capture what is the whatever the value that you want to capture which is there exists in the page one then you need to mention that ignore redirection equal to yes so if you put ignore redirection equal to yes so value from the page one will be captured otherwise value from the page two will be captured so this is how ignore redirection works and also not between the within the servers 
so redirection may be happening between the multiple servers so let's say we are sending a request to the page one and internally it will be redirecting to the other server nothing but page three so this page three response will be sent back to the client so in this case also we use the ignore redirection when you need to check in some cases where your left and right boundaries are perfect and you don't need to check them again and though you have already increased the correlation size website using website max html param length though you are seeing once you check in the replay you will be finding redirections so in that case you will be using the ignore redirections let me show if you are having any redirections where we can find it let me show this example to see whether the redirection is happening or not let's look at so here it is this page whatever the request where we are seeing here so add to cart page it is having a redirection just to verify this is having a redirection or not so better always go to the snapshot under snapshot do not go to the page view always go to the http data so redirection will be having a response response code called as 302 so if you go and scroll until the status if you are seeing the 302 means as a response code so that page has been re redirected to other page so here this page has been redirected to card page so this is how you will be able to find if any redirection is happening so for here the actual value that whatever we want to capture so it is always occurring for the est hyphen it is always occurring for the first request so we don't need to add any redirections or ignore redirections if you are having any value that is captured for this url so in that case you can using the you can use ignore redirection equal to s so this is how it works for the ignore redirections now in our next class we are going to see other options available with correlation function welcome to helpingtesters.com so we are seeing about the correlation advanced options so previously we have discussed correlation parameter name left boundary right boundary and search option odd equal to all not found and ignore redirections now we are going to cover about all the leftover correlation arguments so now we are going to look at save offset and save length so these are the very useful options those will be used whenever your correlation value having some dynamic value which you want to ignore and you want to get only one specific value out of this correlation so let's take this example these together will be work many situations both of these arguments together will be taken as part of your correlation so let's take this example so here if you want to capture this whole line today is a monday and today is a sunday how we do capture normally so we capture here it as this date is a left boundary and this ending date tag is a right boundary so here if you mention that it would be capturing today is a monday or today is a sunday so since the left and right boundaries are common for here so it will capture today is common for everything so only if you want to capture only the day it you can give the this part as a complete left boundary so let's take another example where you will be needing of a using the these save offset and save length so here all days monday okay so here in the example see you will be having this value will be changing always this value may be changing every multiple in your response so here what you need to do is so you don't want to capture this value because it is changing and we don't need to that value but as per rule we can only use this correlate this value as a correlation so this unnecessary characters that we don't need only we need only this name this monday or this sunday okay based on our requirement so here let's look at what save offset and save length here save offset means how many characters that you want to ignore before capturing so it means save offset means it says how many characters that we want to be though we are mentioning left and right boundaries those number of characters we don't want to mention so let's say if you don't want to capture this value these characters how many characters one two three four five six seven eight nine so if you don't want to capture these nine characters as part of your correlation just you can mention save offset as nine 
and how many how many characters that you want to capture you want to capture only six characters after save offset so you can mention it as a six character so save offset will always tells about how many characters that you want to ignore by the correlation and save length refers to the how many characters you want to capture as part of your correlation so these save offset and save length should be used together let's apply that save offset save offset and save length example here for capturing the part of your csrf token so if you apply csrf token it would be capturing the entire value instead i don't want to capture this first eight characters or nine characters i want only capture this four characters after this first eight characters let's look at let's form that correlation using the save offset and save length so i'm just modifying it i'm adding those two arguments so first one is save offset i'm naming this correlation as a csrf2 so anyhow we don't want to miss the actual correlation just for the namesake we are capturing using the save offset and save length so as we just see so i don't want to capture this well these these characters so that's why i mentioned it as a save offset equal to 9 and i want to only capture these four characters so that's why i mentioned here save save length equal to 4 so let's replay and verify how it captures so further we don't want to continue after capturing this so as that reason i just add a breakpoint here so let me run it so we have done our replay if you look at the first value which we first correlation which we not make any changes and the second value which we are interested in so csrf2 has captured the first four the four characters whichever we mentioned to ignore or whichever the values we want to capture as per the our instruction it has captured so this save offset and save length are very quietly used whenever your correlation has some specific values that you want to ignore and some specific values you want to capture so this is how save offset and save length will be used in real time and the next argument we are going to see about real frame id or relative frame id so here frame id this is a this argument will be very rarely used let's say your page is having frame ids let's say one first frame and second frame and third frame and if you want to specially to tell the correlation only to capture the value from only from the frame 2 so you can instruct correlation to capture only from the frame 2 so this is all about the correlation functions that we are using using the webridge save param so let's look at other correlation functions now the other correlation function that we are going to look about webridge save param x so this is an advanced version of webridge save param the only difference is we will be having all the search filters that can be applied as part of search filters rest of the all the values or rest of the arguments which look similar just syntactically it would be changed so we can give we need to give the param name this is the mandatory argument so we need to give this argument in order to give the parameter name for the parameter so here we can give session okay this is one more example for giving the parameter name and left boundary right boundary which are common to the which are similar to webridge save param function and ordinal in this version of function we call it as a ordinal as a ordinal in previous webridge save param we call it as ord so it, it was in short form now it is in full form and a save length which which would be applies the same as a webridge save parameter so it will capture how many characters that we want to capture and save offset how many characters we want to ignore and a not found is also works similar either if we want to continue or stop or if you want to throw any warning so that can be used by the not found equal to warning or error or not found equal to ignore okay and this is the only advantage if we use the webridge server parameters, nothing but the search filter so search filters will add more specific to the your correlation function where you want to search your value with the left and right boundaries so scope nothing but it may be headers body or all okay and the content type so content type means here it will say 
content type will be many things like it may be HTML or it may be the XML content or it may be the JSON content. Okay, so all the content type we can mention here and header names if you want to explicitly mention any header name that you can supply these values. Ignore redirection. So, okay, if you want to add any redirections to ignore, so you can mention it as a yes or no and a real frame ID. Okay, this is nothing but to which frame ID that you want to capture and a request URL. So, these are one of the key argument that you can use. So, just by mentioning the entire request here, you can explicitly in, 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 in this web server function to capture only the on the respective request request URL path. So it will it would be limiting itself to capture only on that particular request path. So this is all about web bridge save param x function. Welcome to helpingtesters.com. In this session we are going to cover about the leftover correlation function called web bridge save param rejects. So here this correlation function always works on regular expression. So the difference between other correlation functions, WebRidge Save Param and WebRidge Save Param X. So instead of having uh, working on left and right boundaries, this correlation function purely works on based on the regular expression that whatever you supply for the regular, regular expression. Okay, let's look at what are the parameters it takes. So basically it takes two kind of parameters. The very first one is parameter name so we'll be given the respective parameter name for it and the regular expression so we can write the regular expression whatever we want so if you are familiar with the regular expression you can easily go and use the web server rejects and the other optional parameter that we have is ordinal equal to all so this web server and rejects is also having which is similar to web server and rejects on the search filter side so in the search filters so whatever the webridge save param rejects webridge save param x supports similar set of feature similar set of search filters will be used by the webridge save param rejects so we can add whatever the filter arguments that we have for webridge save param x so similarly it applies for the webridge save param rejects so let's take a look at an example how it will be used in our scripting so webridge save param rejects which also works the similar way so where whichever the value that you want to identify as part of correlation so you can bring all that value you can you can find the similar way in code generation log and copy the appropriate left and right boundary and let me show up an example here so we have a we have a value here now using with the help of webridge save param rejects p we will be using the how to do correlation so now now let's let's try to correlate this value using the web server mx so so let's go to the code generation log home it is a similar way that what we do there and search for that left and right boundaries here instead of taking the entire line just i'm taking the only one html tag one one complete html statement here so now we also need to find where we need to write the web server and rejects just find the dot inf and it says it's a t6 dot inf so you can form the regular expression here so i have already for your convenience i have already created that web server and rejects so if you look at here just let me remove this so which are the value that you wanted to find as part of your regular expression so in that place you can make this regular expression nothing but brackets dot star question mark means it may be the any value occurs between this left and right boundary concept so instead of that having a separate left right boundaries argument so we are mentioning here a regular expression and also like it is searching in for the scope scope equal to body means it is going to search in the body of the response and ignore redirections equal to no means it won't look for the redirections and request url so here it is only it may be having a n number of redirections or n number of uh, dependent request for this url so instead of looking it everywhere we are using the request your request url we are explicitly mentioning that only look at in this url which ends with the login so this is how we use the regular expression so this is all about how we handle the correlation so in our next session we are going to see about automatic correlation and how to use that in our virtual user generator to handle the dynamic values.
in this session we are going to look about autocorrelation and how to do it and we will look at some several examples using the autocorrelation so so far we have learned about the uh, correlation function so we call them as a manual correlation so we need to form proper left and right boundary manually and we need to write the appropriate correlation function in your right place and we need to validate each and everything so everything is done manually like finding where it is occurring in the code generation log and everything that we are doing the manually so so far we have done to do correlation we use webridge server param webridge server param x and webridge server param rejects functions so now let's learn about the auto correlation so for the auto correlation so we don't need to do much effort to create or to do any co any dynamic value to be correlated so let's take a look how we do it the steps for the auto correlation is quite simple so let's take a fresh script so instead of modify everything into the existing script so i'm taking a fresh script here so we already know that okay this is the session value csrf token so which is to be correlated so now let's take a look how do we do the automatic correlation using this here if you select whichever the value that whatever you want to correlate just select that value and right click on it select correlate selection so it will populate a window saying that it has so and so matches in the test in the code generation or the response generation so you are doing the correlation and what is that value that you have selected and by default it will pick up a value a proper name for that correlation parameter and also it will show the status means it is already done or it is a very new correlation that we are trying to do and replace found means so how many times this is occurring in your script it is automatically coming up with one regular expression expression and here either you can modify this regular expression or you can leave it as it is so right now i'm modifying because it doesn't make any sense if we are having extra characters over here so i'm just deleting those extra characters so this is the value which means this is the regular expression which means it may be having any value between this left and right boundary let's go and continue with the auto correlation so once you identify this correlation so once you make any changes for the expression you must click on the apply this definition otherwise it won't those results will whatever the changes that you have modified will not be applied so i have already clicked on applied so once you are ready then you just you can click on the correlate so what happens whenever you click on correlate all whatever the value that you seen in your script will be automatically replaced with the correlation parameter name called csrf so okay let's go and check back in our script if you look at here so the value automatically replaced with the correlation parameter we don't need to worry about where you want to substitute your correlation and we don't need to go and check in the code generation and we need to don't need to check in dot inf where we want to substitute so everything is taken care automatically whatever the regular expression that we have seen in our correlation window automatically those things will be formed up and entire correlation function is being created here so by default in the latest version of the virtual user generator or in the latest version of the load under by default webridge save param rejects p function is used for the correlation now i will show if you want to use any other version of correlation functions like webridge save param or webridge save param x so i will show how to modify them to decide webridge save param x or webridge save param rejects function to form automatic correlation so that we will change that settings in your record options so if you go to the record option you go under correlation branch so under that you will see the configuration so in this configuration you can set which which correlation api that you wanted to use for the automatic correlation so here i'm selecting webridge save param x by defaultly it is selected as webridge save param rejects p it means regular expression correlation will be done and also there are some settings which will say that you can exclude any specific string so that you can mention them here and if you want to exclude any specific content type that you don't want to add as part of correlation wherever possible if you use the auto correlation it would save time but make sure that whenever trying to use auto correlation make sure that you are properly verifying this 
regular expression for multiple users sometimes this regular expression fails for the multiple users so in that case you need to adjust this regular expression with the appropriate left and right boundaries so in that case only your correlation with the regular expression will become successful so this is how about auto correlation i believe it will it would be a very easy thing to do auto correlation that is all about how we can apply auto correlation rules in your scripting welcome to helpingtesters.com today we're going to cover about some other script customization topics so now let's start with the transactions now let us understand what is a transaction so what is the need of it so let's ex let's take an example you are participating in a running race let's say you started from a point a so called as a and you are ending at a point b so how you measure the lapse time that you have been started from point a to point b so nothing but we will be using a something called a timer or a stopwatch right so here in stopwatch so before whenever you started from point a you will be starting the timer and whenever you reaching the point b you will be ending the timer you will be stopping the timer so that is the way that is your whole lapse time or that is the time that you took to travel between point a to point b similarly in load runner transactions works in similar way like how your timers or stopwatch works let's say this is a page one this is that you're trying to request request from request to the server and server sending back with the response so this is what we previously discussed at the transaction response time so let's take how to measure this whole transaction response time so far we have been discussing so which is important part of the performance testing to measure the response times we depend on the transactions just as we discussed so let's take a look at the script so how we measure the transactions now let's take a look at the script that we have worked in our previous session for correlation this is the script we have created and we did some customization i have been instructing you to definitely add comments so these comments will be helpful where you need to start your transaction and where you need to end your transaction nothing but your timer if you add proper comments in place definitely those will be helpful to add the right measure of the page so let's take a look how, how we add the transaction here first of all we need to start the timer or we need to start the transaction so to start the transactions we are using a load under function called lr start transaction so this start transaction will be taking a string what is the name that you wanted to give for the transaction let's say what i've given so this is the very first url that we launched right so i'm giving some name to it as launch url as soon as it completes this page, this request or launching this page we must stop this whatever the transaction that we have started right we must stop this transaction we have three conditions for it either you need to pass or you need to fail or you need to leave it to the load runner to decide automatically so to do that we need to use lr end transaction lr end transaction will take two arguments the very first one is the transaction means whatever the transactions that we have started previously so that we need to end up here let's say this let me give some simple mistake or common mistake that everyone do unfortunately some people do okay they start transaction okay mistakenly or unknowingly they will again start another transaction here so this is an invalid case what happens if you do that so you cannot open two transactions without ending the very first one which you have started so this would your vugen will throw an error says you have already started a transaction which you have not ended this is the one of the argument for that we need to give for the end transaction and the other transaction is what is the state like what is the state of the transaction either you want to pass or fail or you want to leave it for the load runner to decide automatically so as of now i'm just putting it pass putting it as lr underscore pass so this is a very case sensitive definitely we must give it as upper case in lr underscore pass so it will say that so whatever the transactions we have started you must end at the end of this end of this request it means the whole time taken for the this particular request will be measured by the launch url transaction nothing but a timer so let's take a look how it would be the up, uh, displayed in your script i'm running the script now and i'm putting a breakpoint after this so i don't want to continue further after that end transaction let's take a look now so this will give what is the total time taken by this 
launching the application URL. So likewise, we need to add it for all the steps. So if you look at, so still it is going on. See, here it, it, is, it is the place that your transaction has been started and it says your transaction has been ended here. So the total time taken for transaction is measured by the duration 5.1952 seconds it is taken and you are seeing one more thing called wasted time. So here the wasted time is nothing but the total time taken by the load runner APIs internally because this is also a function right. So this function may be taking some time to perform internally not actual the server response time but this function will also executed somewhere on the processor right. So this that time will be automatically removed by the virtual user generator or the load runner. So that comes as part of wasted time. So wasted time is nothing but so which has been taken by the internal load runner API. Okay. So to consider what is the total time taken by the server to respond for this request is nothing but 5.1952. So load runner gives the duration in seconds. Okay. So we have mentioned that here as pass means we are telling explicitly to pass the transaction. Now let's take a look with LR fail. So we are just telling the load runner to fail the transaction manually. There are some conditions when to pass or when to fail. So in going forward sessions we will be covering it. So as of now let's just let us look at it. LR underscore fail. So we will see that there the transaction is failed with the so and so response time it will show up. Let's wait and see. See here previously we have seen it as a pass. Now it is showing it as a LR. It is showing it as a fail status and the duration something similar to that. So here we are explicitly failing or passing this. Sometimes if you don't have any idea what to what to pass and what to fail. So you can plainly depend on LR underscore auto which is uh, you can substitute in place of LR fail whatever you just did. Okay, so if you put LR auto, so load runner automatically decides based on the response codes the server retrieves. So it will automatically pass and fail your transactions. Let's take a look. So load runner auto because the server didn't throw any error. So we are able to see that as pass status. Like this, we need to add transactions for each and every steps. So where you need to start the transactions, okay, at the end of at the starting of the comment and at the end of the comment, you need to end the transaction. So let's do that. LR start the transactions. So we need to give the transaction. So make sure that you are giving the, an appropriate transaction name for the steps, just not to confuse the page. Click sign in link. So I'm giving the transaction name here and you need to end the transaction here. LRN transaction. So name of the transaction it takes. I'm, as of now, I'm leaving it to the load runner to decide pass or fail. So this is about how you start and likewise you need to apply the start and end transactions for the all that all the pages or all the comment to comment that you need to give it for the script let's take a look at so you've been typing everything right so if you don't want to type everything manually you can use some shortcuts just by to start the transaction you can press Control t so it will automatically add the start transaction statement and you just go and put your transaction name in the quotes and similarly to end your transaction you can use Control shift t so you can give your transaction name here too to know about more shortcuts I'm writing down here in the comments control plus T and to start the transaction and to end the transaction you can use control plus shift plus T so this is how you can use the transaction so you need to add it throughout the script let's say sometimes you need to measure the individual request time let's say in a page Let's take an example here. If you look at we exclusively monitor the response for we want to measure the response time for exclusively only for this URL. 
and also along with this all the set of URLs or all the set of requests. So let's take a look to measure response time exclusively for this uh, beneath the request. Though you started the transaction, we have a flexibility to uh, to measure that only for this underlying request. So let's take a look how we do that. So we we can depend on the LR start sub transactions. We call them as a sub transactions. You can start a sub sub transaction. We need to first of all give the sub transaction takes two parameters. One is your sub transaction name. Let's say your sub transaction name. Just I'm giving it as a request to. What is the parent transaction here? You need to mention as part of secondary second argument. It means so sub transaction basically takes two things. The very first one is the what is the name that you wanted to give for the sub transaction and which part of the main transaction it is. So we are mentioning it as a launch URL. And while ending your sub transaction, so you don't need to give the parent transaction. Just you can give LR in sub transaction. So you just only can give the only sub transaction name and what is the status of the sub transaction so it may be lr pass fail or lr auto you can give like you can give sub transactions like this so whenever you verify let's take a look how it works so i am replaying the script now so if you take a look at okay so this is the very first transaction. This is the parent transaction started. And after that, so we have a sub transaction started so called as request to. So we are measuring the sub transaction time here. So 1.955 seconds. Similarly, the main transaction or the parent transaction took totally 10 seconds. So this is how you include sub transactions in your script. So I'm reiterating to, to use the sub transaction. So we use the statement called LR start sub transaction. And it takes the parameter call. What is the sub transaction name and what is the parent parent transaction? Okay, here the parent transaction is a launch URL and to end that sub transaction. So we can simply use the what is the name of sub transaction. So which we opened previously and what is the end case either it may be pass fail or, or auto. So this is how you define sub transactions. So this is all about the transactions that you measure that you can add in virtual user generator welcome to helping testers.com now we are going to cover about text checks so far we have covered about just to add it the, add the transactions are and uh, we just plainly going with the whatever the response it is the server is giving so far we have never validated what the server response what what the response that server is giving and whether it is giving the right response or not we have not yet seen and based on that we are not passing or failing your transaction or the steps so text checks are nothing but to to validate the response with a specific set of keywords or keys so we are validating the response and based on that we are passing or failing your request so let's take an let's take an example how to add that text check so to add the text checks in uh, in virtual user generator we depend some a function called web bridge find so web bridge find is a function so which will be which will be added to which will be used to add the text checks or page checks for each and every request so text checks can be added either for one of the requests in a transaction or you can add it for each and every request in your transaction as of now our scripts are so easy and simple so we don't see much so much so many requests in one simple one single transaction so but if you take any complex applications you will be having multiple requests in a transaction so you don't sometimes you need to add multiple text checks for a for a transaction or it means you need to add multiple uh, web bridge find statements for each and every request or just you need to identify the what is the main request which is retrieving the actual data from the server and you can validate it with web bridge find i will show you one easy option how you add web bridge find without writing any code so web bridge find as we already know that 
so we can using the snapshot pan we can use we, we can show the request that we are sending and what is the response that we, we got either it may be while recording or while replaying your script so let's take your recorded snapshot and if you let's say you want to add a web bridge find or text check or page check for this particular request what you need to do just you need to go to the response body of that particular page okay you can do again in two ways you can pick any text meaningful text says okay this is unique to the this page so which says okay this page has been already this page has been successfully loaded let's take a look in a page view so this page view says okay if you see any of the text let's say j pet store or sign in link or fish dogs reptiles all this menu so whatever you see so if you see this text it means this page load has been completed so based on this text you are confirming that this page has been loaded right so we you can copy that page and let's say instead of taking the whole text you can take a part of your page or some part some text on your page and to add the webridge find select that text on the page and select that page and right click on that you will see this option add text check step so if you select this option you will you will be getting some fine text window so in that you need to populate what all you want to give so the very first thing that you see this in this place so it says what is the text that you wanted to find as part of your response so we can ignore rest of these whatever the contents that we have in the search box so these are not so much used but just look at the mandatory things that we use in our daily life so search in search in means as we already know that a response contains body and headers so where you want to search this particular text that you selected either you want to search in the headers or body if you select all it will look in both headers and body and save count so this is one important thing save count is nothing but so you are you are, let's say this page has been occurred this whatever the text that you seen that has been occurred as part of response so to count how many times it is occurred we need some variable so save count is nothing but in this section we will give the variable name where you wanted to save let's say i'm giving the name for it home count so it means the number of times i'm just i'm giving a variable name as to home count to count how many times this salt water text has been appeared as part of this response and the next one is fail if let's say this text particular text is not being found in your request what in, in your response what you need to do either you want to like fail if means either you want to pass it or fail fail if not found means if the particular text is not there your script will be automatically stopped with say fail status so the inverse of it will look if you find this text it will like if you don't find this text it will find it will pass like this okay so as of now just i'm selecting fail if not found so let's click on and see what it will happen okay so it will automatically add webridge find text so by just by adding whatever the parameters or whatever the options that we selected so it will say the very first thing is fail not found means it fails automatically if this particular text is not found and this is how this parameter is it how this uh, whatever the parameter that we selected will be represented by the web bridge find so let's run it once and see how this will be adding so how many times this salt salt water has been found as part of response those many times this home page will get a count so i'm stopping the script now now you will see the count for that let's say the salt water has been occurred for in your response for five times then you will see the count the variable value holds as five so let's take a look so i'm scrolling down slowly say it says home count equal to one means the text called salt water has been occurred in your response only once okay so likewise for a single request you can add multiple text checks it is not only salt water you can add multiple text checks for a single request okay so and but make sure that you are giving different name different name for the each and every web bridge find otherwise so there is no meaning if you add multiple web bridge finds with the same name and it will override the values okay so let's take a look uh, instead of adding the salt water the second time let's add one more so i'm just i wanted to see various breeds i wanted to see the text called various breeds so let me copy this text and let me put it here 
So make sure that you are unnecessarily not selecting any extra text. Just only select the plain words instead of if you give any space, extra space that may not be part of that extra space may not be the part of response so that your, your web bridge find will be failed. Let's read on it. I'm just putting a breakpoint after this. Just not to go the script further. I'm running the script now. So let's take a look. See, home page count has got. Uh, okay, so make sure that you're not giving the same name. That's what I did. So just let's change the name again. <clears throat> I am giving the home page count as instead of in the for the second web page find I am giving home page count two so I am giving the name as two so we will be having the two different variables holding the count for each of the text so we are just checking with the past two condition let's check in our next iteration let's check if found like if, if that particular text found we are going to stop our script. So if you look at so as we just seen the home count one has got the one time occurrence for the text given and home count two has got two times let's stop it and let's verify with a negative condition so in this so instead of failing if not found it means if the particular text is not found then we're going to fail so let's say if it is found we are going to fail it instead of not found, just we are going to make it as a fail Make it as found if failed. So let's rerun it. So whenever it is not found, the script will automatically stop. And it will not continue further. Let's see, your script is not even touching the breakpoint. It means it is going to end. And you will see that message called Webridge find the text is equal to salt water found. So we just that is how we created the condition. If the salt water is found, this we are telling that to fail your script. So and it will show the count for it. Anyhow, the text is already there, right? So we are we just uh, it will give the count instead of you know giving it zero. So if no text is been found, it will give the value as zero. So based on this, going forward in our next sessions, we will add we will be adding the right or wrong or pass or fail conditions. So that is needed a bit of C coding. C conditioning like if and else conditioning that we are going to use. So this is how about we are validating webridge we are validating a response or a page by using webridge find. So likewise for each and every response or for each and every request you need to add webridge find. So let me show one more example just for the submit login and this will clearly show you so whether uh, what is the case what is the best choice of text that you need to take as part of your webridge find. So if you are successfully able to log in for this request, you will see the response as sign out. So if you are not able to successfully log in, then you will see again sign in sign in text here. So right now we are having the sign out button, sign out link, right? So let me select that and add a text check for that. So just remove if any pre and post space are there, like we have a pre space, some extra space before sign in, some extra space after out. So make sure that you are not putting any kind of the text. It will leads to some error with your webridge find because the text may not be found in your response. So I am giving it as login count and I just make sure that fail, failing if not found. Okay. So let me remove the previous condition which is to explicitly fail them. Let's remove the breakpoint from here and put a breakpoint after your login. So we have already a breakpoint here so let me run it and you will see and we are about to submit the login see here it says the particular sign out text is not found so this is the one of the use case which clearly says that if it is logged in or not you can just confirm by replay page so just take a look at the replay page and it says invalid username and password. See, your credential is invalid means whatever the credential that we created has gone. So that's why we are not able to log in here. So this is how, say this is the one of the useful test case that I'm going to say. 
so if that but if the if the login is not successful there is no meaning that you are passing just your transaction so you are explicitly or just by using the webridge find statement you are not continuing further to do any of the next operations or next request okay this is how you need to validate your request you you, you need to validate your response by using the webridge find and what are these are all the options that it has welcome to helpingtesters.com in this session we are going to learn about error handling and what is the meaning of it and how we do error handling in our scripts let's continue with our session so far we have seen how to create the transaction and uh, we find uh, we also seen that uh, how to use the webridge find to use as a text checks okay so instead of depending on the text check or webridge find to pass or fail so what we need to do is we will be writing some if else conditions to make based on the text check based on the text check count let's say the home count based on the text check count we will be passing or the failing the transaction explicitly so why we need to do that because webridge find is already able to do that but why we are why we need to handle that in if else case sometimes you don't know what if webridge find uh, if a webridge find is not able to find a particular text so you may not be able to see what happened with that page so what the page source and uh, what we need to do and uh, what went wrong with that page why it is failed we, we don't have any information simply we will see this so and so text was not found as part of response and this webridge webridge find will fail your uh, user to continue further so sometimes you don't want to though the particular text is not found in your response we should be able to continue in some cases so in that instances we will be using error handling mechanism to carry forward or to decide what to do next okay let's take an example and let's look forward so how we do how we need to implement so to implement that so we must remove this fail equal to not found as part of webridge find if you want to do that implementation so let's say we are also i would like to say one more thing here whenever any response comes to your page like say whatever the response it may be error response or perfect correct response so you want to show what is the response that server has sent or what is the whatever the response that server has sent back as part of this request so we need to capture the whole response so that we will be using that whole response whenever there is a situation of fail or this webridge find fails or this text is not able to find your a response so we will be adding that page source or page information to the log to debug to know like what happened to our response or what happened to the server whatever this response it sent back as part of request so let's implement that so there is one more thing so far we have seen uh, webridge save param for correlating so now let's use webridge save param for capturing the entire page source so let me show you that so i'm writing the webridge save param function so here what we need to do is so we can give the whatever the name that we want and with a uh, simple skeleton so here to capture page source we must make your left and right boundaries as empty it means it will capture we are not we are not providing any if we are not providing any left and right boundary it means it will be capturing whole response okay so it will be capturing whole response okay so let's give some name so this is a launch page count right so launch url so i'm giving some meaningful name page source so pgsrc nothing but a page source just a short name i'm giving so because the page source will be very heavy like it may be having lot many number of characters so your correlation will be failing because you may not be having the uh, sufficient length for your left hand right bound so in that case you can increase your page source size to to whatever the character size that you wanted to have okay so using the web website max html param so we have already seen about this function what it will do so by default your correlation function webridge save param captures up to 256 characters so if you want to capture more than 256 characters you must always mention the size based on how much you want so right now uh, I, I would i'm going to capture up to 9900 like sorry 99 lakhs 
99 lakhs sorry 9 lakhs 99999 characters so this is pretty much enough to capture a page response average page response okay so i have made it so let's verify so as i've been stating right so this web bridge save param with an empty left and right boundaries it will capture the page source let's see whether it is really capturing or not so i'm putting a breakpoint here let me run it see here it is capturing the full page source see whatever the name it contains though because you are seeing multiple page sources here because it is having lot of dependent requests or lot of uh, internal uh, requests which are spanned as part of this main request we don't need to worry about so we are always looking at the first response or first response or the you know first page source okay so that would be the part of your actual page so rest of things are you know dependency it may be images gif or css so we don't need to worry about just we are interested only in the first response of the page okay now so what we need to do is so we already seen that okay this is the page source. so in case of a fail condition so we need to add this to your error message or to your error log on your script so let's see that how to do that so this would become as part of your error handling as well so to do that error handling so we already seen that we have added a text check for this launch page right so to do that let's carefully look at it so i'm adding a if else skeleton so this is a simple if else condition that we that we have in c language so using that we will be going to add a error condition so make sure that in if condition i'm always going to put the success case or the right case or the valid case means whenever i'm able to see the text check or text check count greater than zero okay i'm going to pass your transaction or i'm leaving it to the low runner to pass or fail so by default it would be passing if page response is good or page response code is uh, 200 or 300 other than 500 okay let's see so now what we need to do we need to add a condition based on this so we already know that so if that particular text is found this home count whatever the variable home cnt2 home count2 variable will be getting a value more than zero so let me show you that uh, c it has got two times so it means it is able to find means whatever the response we got is correct based on this now let's go and add some if else condition here so let's copy this now we are going to use one function uh, lr eval string is a function that is going to we will be briefly discussing about this function in our later classes as of now just use it as a lr eval string function so which converts any load runner parameter into a string okay so how this would be uh, this is the syntax for it so this is the your load runner parameter name it may be you know correlation parameter or it may be your uh, parameterization parameter so you can give always lr eval string so the return type for lr eval string would be a strings or it, it would be a character array so we don't need to worry about it just as of now just use as is so i am putting here lr eval string of whatever the parameter name here we got home count right so what it will do what it will return it will return the string called as a two so that what we need to do so if if it is not found this particular text is not found this this variable with home count variable will always hold the value zero right so we need to check if it, the value is greater than zero then we are passing the transaction otherwise we are failing the transaction so here this is a string two is a string now so we cannot directly compare this string number number two string as numbers two string with the number two because we cannot always compare string uh, with the numbers so what to do that we need to make use of another function that is called a to i so this function will take a string as an input let's say if it is having this because how we can say it is a string because we are mentioning it in this double quotes between double quotes means it is a string okay so this will take any underlying string that whatever we pass and it will return the output as an integer or as a number okay the output will be a number Okay, so let's use both of them how to use it 
so we already know that so this will be a this home count will using lr eval string by using home count it will return a string number nothing but string string called a number string called two so we will make use of a to i of whatever the lr eval string so this is a very standard thing that you must remember otherwise you need to by hard by hard it or you need to mug up it okay so we are passing now so what is the, the output of this both together will return a number called whatever the value the home count gets okay now what is our condition what is we need to implement here so we need to always compare if the home count is greater than zero it means it will let let me show you how it will be uh, passing the value so the first lr eval string will return the value called two and after that a to i a to i function will make this whatever the value the output of lr eval string it will make the value into a number so two less than two greater than or equal to zero so we are making now here number to number comparison so that is valid so string to number comparison is always invalid so we need to always parse that whatever the string that we have that we get as part of your home count or text check we should be converting into a string then into a number so then we can easily compare with any other number so now this value is greater than zero then we are passing means if it is greater than zero means it has a occurrence for whatever the text that we given in the response so this is how we add success condition and let's look at so if it is not found what we need to do we need to fail the transaction so i'm just failing the transaction by mentioning lr underscore fail so we have already seen about lr underscore fail in our previous classes okay so now we are failing so we are also discussing one more thing so whenever any user fails we also write the output for that particular page so what is the output we we already know that okay, the fail we are using the transaction okay we are mentioning the page is failing but we need to also check what is the output of that page what the server has written during that time so to do that we have already used a correlation parameter launch url page source so we can print that as part of your load runner logs or your uh, test logs so to do that we are going to use one more load runner function called lr error message so previously we have seen lr output message so similarly lr error message will write error into a log okay now what we need to say we need to write whatever the message that we wanted to say so let me write the appropriate message so the page source for page source for or we can simply write failed page source so we need to put a placeholder percentage s means so we are going to pass a string value into this place now what we need to get so we need to pass this page source into this error message so how we do that again we just we, we will so because the page source launch url page source is a load runner parameter so we cannot directly use that load runner parameter here so for that to convert this load runner load runner parameter into a string we are making use of lr eval string so let's substitute a lr eval string and let's take this page source correlation parameter and substitute it now what will happen so whenever any error happens it will come and substitute that value here in the place of percentage means so what it will be having so whatever the error page response that it gets so this is how we need to add error error handling for each and every page so let's validate up to this page so it is a script is running so so it has done now so we will see that as of now it is not returning any it is not returning any error because we have added valid text check so that's why we will be not able to see any error here okay so now what we need to do is see one more thing so it you if your text is containing any you know this kind of uh, warning messages though it is able to find but it has multiple occurrences of launch url page source because it is having some internal redirection so to do that we can add a statement which we have already seen in our correlation parameters ignore redirections equal to true 
or ignore redirections equal to yes. So if you mention like this, so it will only capture very first page source that is we are interested in. Okay, it will capture only for first page. Source. Let's verify that. So this is the way that you need to add a page source. So let me. Uh, okay, this is this is how about we we always add error handling in your script. So likewise, you need to add it for all the associated requests or all the following requests in your scripts. This is how you need to handle in your error handling in your script. Welcome to helpingtesters.com. In this session, we are going to learn about think time. Before learning about think time, so let's look into some real time scenario. So let's say you're a user. So you're trying to shop on amazon.com. So what you do, the, what are the steps that you follow? So first of all, you will be launching the amazon.com URL. And after that, you will be waiting for some time and you may be thinking for the, okay, what I need to search. So it means you're taking some time to type something on the Amazon search. So finally you found you, you, you something got into your mind and you typed iPhone. And again, after searching for iPhone, so you may be seeing a number of results for that. And out of that, okay, you need to think again and uh, verify uh, you need to open a particular model right so it means you're taking some time to decide which particular model that i need that you need to open and after that once you open the any particular model so what you need to do is what you will be doing so you will be reading the specs so if you're like the you so to read the specs you may be taking some time right so you will be go through the all the specs okay whether it may be ram processor you will be go through, going through the all the specs of that particular model so if you like then you will add it to product or checkout. So right in this case, okay, after reading the specs, we are just going to other model of the iPhone. So this is like this, just consider a simple flow. So here what happens before, before performing any action, just you, you will be taking some time to do any action. It may be picking an iPhone model or searching for, you know, to search, to think what item to search and you're taking some time to type or uh, some time to think on your some something has to come into your brain right so you're taking some time to perform any action so this is a real user behavior so to mimic like real user behavior load runner provides a special thing called as a think time so think time is nothing but it is a simple waiting time between a step to step or a page to page or a transaction to transaction so this think time is always equal to nothing or nothing but equal to the whatever the real user think time. So if you have observed, let's go back to our script. If you observe, so while your recording is done, sometimes automatically some special statements called LR underscore think time automatically generated. So here LR underscore think time is nothing but it is a load runner function to provide a waiting time between the page to page or between the transaction to transaction so where you need to add now the discussion comes for where you need to add the think time so what i was stating so you need to add always the think time between the end of the transaction and start of the transaction or nothing but comment to comment between the comment to comment you can add your think time so let's look at what is the think time function here lr underscore think time is the function that you need to add so let's say after let's say after launching your jpeg store application so you are waiting four seconds to remember your username and credential and also to type your credential let's take totally it takes 10 seconds means you are adding a waiting time to submit the next step nothing but clicking on the login link you're taking a time nothing but a five seconds or 10 seconds so this thing times varies from the step to step some for some steps it may be taking uh, less time some for some sometimes it may be taking more time let's say you're submitting your credentials to submit your credentials you will be having you will be taking more time to write your username and password and clicking on the submit button right so similar this similarly so submit will be taking more time to we can add more time more think time for the submit login so all it depends on the case or business case or the flow that you are handling so let's say clicking on fish as soon as i purchase i wanted to purchase a fish so definitely i will go to a fish i, I will go to a fish product so 
you will be clicking on the fish so in that case the think time will be less so the think time is nothing but the amount of wait time that load under is trying to perform between each and every step so let's verify so as of now so we have been telling that it will wait between the each and every step right so let's add some extra time to see what how it how the think time effectively working or not so as of now i'm adding i'm trying to say that so i forgot to mention one more thing here so here whatever the mention that we whatever the number that we mentioned in that think time function is nothing but the number of seconds we are waiting be, before performing the action so here if we mention 15 means it is the 15 seconds that load render waits before performing the next action so likewise whatever that here we mentioned four second means so it will come here and wait for four seconds then it will go and execute the next step nothing but a log clicking on the logging link okay so this is the way so let's verify how it really works or not so as of now you won't see that much difference because you won't see it is not applying the think time so it is immediately going to the one step after the other if you look at here so it is immediately it is not stopping anywhere like though we have added think time it is not stopping it is not waiting for anything to complete okay it is coming to this request but but it is not waiting at the place of think time function what what whatever we have added so don't worry about the uh, login fail here because the whatever the credentials that we have created already gone you can go and create your own credentials on the jpeg store so it you but make sure that you are not putting any load just for your practice purpose just you can use one or two users nothing more than that okay now see as we are just discussing about the think time so we are seeing that think time is not applying here because to enable the think time we need to go to this runtime settings so previously we have seen about this runtime settings on a high level so in runtime setting we have a special thing called think time in this think time feature so as of now by default it says ignore think time means though we add the think time here it is not affecting your script because it is it says you should not be using so most of the time you can use replay think time as recorded so i'm just selecting here i'm selecting this option and verify whether it is effective or not so you will now observe there is some waiting time at each and every step wherever we have added so let me maximize that see it has come to the step called lr underscore think time and it is waiting for four seconds now if you look at so i have added 10 seconds to wait see it is waiting it is stating that lr think time has got 10 seconds and it will be waiting for 10 seconds before performing your submit login so this is how think time works so in our runtime settings there are some other options related to think time so let's do, let's go and uh, explore now go to the runtime setting see the very first option that we selected means replay think time as recorded it means if you added the think, think time let's say as four seconds in your script so it will only wait for the four seconds like whatever the value is there in your script just it will apply that value only if you select replay think time as recorded okay so sometimes there may be situations like though you have given two seconds or four seconds you want to multiply it by two or three let's say we mentioned here as two second two multiplying multiplying factor as two so what happens it will multiply four into two means it will be it will be waiting totally eight seconds so in the next step we have added 10 seconds means it will be waiting 10 into 2 because we have given the multiplication factor for the think time as 2 so it will be waiting 10 into 2 totally 20 seconds before performing any action so let's verify whether it is really applying that factor or not so i'm running the script now so it has launched the url see though we have four seconds mentioned here it is waiting for eight seconds because we have applied multiplication factor for the think time so let's go to the next step see it is waiting for the 20 seconds because here we applied only 10 then the multiplication factor 10 into 2 totally it would become 20 seconds so this is how that multiplication factor from the runtime setting works for the think time so now let's check other option so sometimes 
you don't want you don't know you don't want to give you some constant time constant time to wait constant time to apply for your thing time instead you want to say okay somewhere between 5 second to 10 seconds nothing but let's go to runtime settings so you instead of instead of telling a specific number you're telling that whatever the recorded thing time is there either it may be 100 percent to 200 percent or whatever the percentage that you mentioned so when i'm mentioning 100 percent to 200 percent means so what is the 100 percent of four seconds let's go to the very first thing time so 100 percent of four seconds is nothing but four seconds okay what is the 200 percent 200 percent with the eight seconds so if you select this option it will apply think time somewhere between the four to eight seconds okay so let's verify that whether it is really applying it or not so likewise it will be applied to the all the think time where that whatever you have added to your script so let's verify whether it is taking that fact that uh, upper and lower mechanism but like with a percentage so let's go here see we mentioned here only four seconds but it is taking 5.20 seconds so likewise we mentioned here 10 10 to 20 100 percent to we mentioned 10 seconds here so and we mentioned percentage 100 percent to 200 percent so it means from the 10 to 20 it is picking some random thing random seconds to continue or some random seconds to wait that much that, that much amount of seconds so this is how you perform think time and let's look at the last option that is available with think time now let's go back to the runtime settings see sometimes it may be any of the seconds it may be it may be you know you may be mentioning any number of seconds sometimes you don't want to go with the whatever the think time okay if it is let's say i'm mentioning here as a five seconds though whatever the all the above functions creates any think time greater than five it would be limited to five seconds only let's say if we are using multiply recorded think time by two means so it would become here in the first instance it would become eight seconds right so we are not you know we are just trying to override that eight seconds by the five seconds means it will not be like your script won't be waiting for eight seconds instead it will only wait for overriding think time nothing but the five seconds so let's verify that so it would be similarly applied to the all the instances wherever your think time applies so it is 10 seconds now so instead of waiting for the 10 10 seconds because we have added a override factor here nothing but limit think time to five seconds means it would be waiting for only five seconds what happens if it is less than five seconds in your script let's say let's add one second we, we, we are making only one second here so what happens it would be it, it won't wait for five seconds instead it will take the whatever the least number available less than five means it will only wait for the one second because we, it is less than five because it would be waiting for one second only so this is how your think time works okay let's verify this whether it is applying or not see we have added multiplication factor so that's why we are seeing more than five seconds here and it is limited by the five seconds so let's verify let me stop this so once your replay is done i can show you that so sometimes make sure that your sometimes your virtual user generator will be freezed whenever you're running the script so sometimes it would be permanent and it would not come back so in that case explicitly you need to kill your uh, explicitly you need to kill your uh, load runner or virtual user generator now let me show you that so wherever it has already your think time so we can search for the term called think time so here we have added a multiplication factor by two so totally it has to come for eight seconds but since we limited think time as five seconds so it has limited only to the five seconds now let's go back to the other one so here we mentioned think time as one second so let's see how it is applied here so since we mentioned here as 
uh, one second. So the multiplication factor has been applied, and it would become totally two seconds. So since two seconds is less than five, it would be waiting for only two seconds. This is all about your think time. Sometimes your think time is useful to control your total number of executions or to to it would be it would be used as a control factor for your script. So we'll be discussing about control factor in our later sessions. This is how your think time works. Thank you. Welcome to helpingtesters.com. In this session, we are going to learn about some of the important load runner functions that we are going to use in our day to day life. So if you look at in our previous session, we have already seen some set of built in load runner functions or load runner APIs that we have already used. So let us get into some other APIs along with that we have seen with some good examples. Now let's start with the very first function that is nothing but LR save string. So LR save string is a function which is used to save any C string into load runner string or load runner parameter. Basically we have two types of parameter two types of parameters or strings. The very first one is C string and the next one is load runner strings or load runner in other terminology we call it as load runner strings or we call them as load runner parameters. So LR save string function is used to convert any given C string into load runner parameter. So now onwards I'm not calling them as load runner string but instead the terminology I'm using I'm, I'm using parameter. So it will LR save string function will convert any C string into load runner parameter. So here the C string may be any literal or it may be any character array of the C string. So let us look at let's take an example and see how it works. So let's say we are creating a character array. Let's say username. So username has got 10 and we are assigning some called as username as tester. Okay, so this is a C string here. If you want to convert this C string into load runner string, so load runner strings always, if you want to substitute load runner strings or load runner parameters, you will be always substituting load runner strings into within parentheses or within these within this uh, within these curly braces so let's say uh, we have already seen about a few of the load under parameters those are nothing but your correlation parameters are your parameterization parameters whichever you whichever you created here okay so which we already discussed in our past session so if you want to convert any c string or c variables into the load and into load under parameters so we will be using lr save string so let's take an example as we just discussed so how I'm doing is LR save string. So LR save string function takes two things. One is the which which string that you wanted to use. So you need to pass. So I'm, I wanted to save this username, whatever the value there in the username. I want to convert into the load runner parameter. So in this para, to do that, you need to have source and what is the name that you want to save. So here you can give some other name is my name. So I'm giving the load runner parameter name is my name. Okay, so now whatever the value will be there will be assigned to the load runner parameter called my name. So let's verify. So in order to verify any load runner parameter assignment, you must be enabling advanced log and in that extended log and parameter substitution so that you can see whatever parameters that are occurring under replay log. So you will be able to see them in the blue color. So let me run it. I just enabled advanced log settings that too for the extended log for parameter substitution so let's see whether it is taking or not okay so after assigning that whatever the parameter name into we will be verifying it so let's save it and run i'm running the script here so if you look at here it is showing a message called my name equal to tester it means now this has become my name has become whatever that you are seeing between it in double quotes my name has become a load runner parameter so now you can substitute this load runner parameter anywhere in your scripts those are nothing but web request or web submitted anywhere you can submit in your script so this is the use of load runner 
LR save string. So here you need to remember any load runner built in functions will always assign value from the right to left. But if you take any C strings other than load runner strings, built in C strings will always take assignment from right to left. So load runner functions, load runner functions will always assign from left to right, whereas C strings assign assignment will go from right to left. So that you must be remembering. So you don't need to confuse them. Okay. And uh, majority of the load runner functions will be started with the LR underscore so that you can identify those are the load runner functions. We just seen about the function LR save string. So what is the next function LR eval string? So this LR eval string works reversal of the LR save string. So LR save string just we seen it will convert any C string into load runner parameter whereas LR eval string converts any load runner parameter into C string. Let's take an example. So LR what we just discussed LR eval string will convert any existing load runner parameter. It may be a correlation parameter or it may be a parameterization parameter. So it will convert any existing parameter into C string. So to do that let's create a C built in C function or a build, uh, let's create a C param uh, load runner parameter let's say I'm creating something called a username okay and I'm creating some value for it so we have already seen how to parameterization how to complete the parameterization in our in our previous session so don't worry about it so here I'm giving my name as I am tester so I have created load runner parameter here so let's use LR eval string to extract that load runner parameter whatever so called as username into C string. So in order to save it as a C string, so I'm what I'm trying to create, I'm creating character array, let's say name. So I'm giving character array name of 10. So now we will be saving LR eval string value into this name. So now let's look at what I'm trying to do. Name equal to LR eval string eval string of so you must be supplying double quotes and you must be putting this parenthesis in order to substitute in order to use LR eval string so this is a standard template so now between these brackets you must be supplying whatever the load runner parameter that you want to extract so now it will extract that whatever the value there within the username and it will sub it will submit that value to the name so now let's look at just uh, so far we just seen whether it is uh, substituting or not right so let, let's write uh, an LR output message to show whatever the content is there within the this character array. so for that I'm writing LR output message so I'm just putting some percentages so this is percentages is used for represent a string in your output message so let me run it So sometimes pe people may confuse like you cannot make any direct assignment into any character array after it defined. So instead a best practice is to do string operations. So we have already seen string operations in our C basic. So let's use strcpy function. So that will copy any given value into any C array or character array. So how I am doing it so since it is strcpy is a c function so always assignment will go from right to left so that lr eval string will return the value whatever there in the parameter called username and it will assign that value into this character array and after that we are trying to print that character array so let's look at whether it is working or not see now we don't see any error so always make sure that now let's see see here we got in output message we got the value whatever extracted by the LR eval string. So whenever you're trying to copy or whenever you're trying to extract any C para or any load runner parameters into any character arrays, always try to use strcpy function to copy the values from one array to another array or from load runner function to C strings or character array. So now we have we are done with the LR eval string. So also we can see that LR eval string says parameter substitution 
parameter user name equal to I am tester. It means it is trying to extract the value whatever is there in username. So that's why it is showing the some notification called parameter substitution. So whenever we are sub whenever we are trying to extract any value in any place of your script between these parentheses, it will say you are trying to submit parameter. Okay, so this is all about LR event stream. Now let's look at function called sprintf. It is if you if you come this is a function so to understand string printf. So this is to format any given string into any array. So let's take an example then you will understand it clearly. This is the syntax for the sprintf. So the very first value it takes is the destination. It means where you want to save the formatted string. Okay, and uh, the second option or the second argument we have is for formatter. So it would formatter like will be substituted whatever the values that we pass after the formatter those values will be substituted here and that value will be stored under destination. So the third option is the number of variables. There is no limitation how many number of variables that you are passing for passing as part of variable. So let's take an example then you will easily understand. So for the time being just to make sure that you are able to understand the syntax I am just commenting it out and let me write that. So since we are telling that it would be storing the value into a destination character array or C string. So for that what I am trying to do is I am trying to create a character array to store the destination. So the destination let's say I am creating the destination called full name. So I am giving the character array as 20. So I am going to store all the formatters into all the formatted string into full name. So this is how this is this character array that you need to define here because this would become a destination. And after that let's say I have two other names let's say first name and last name. So I want to combine them first name and last name like first name so I'm giving, I will be giving a literals first name space last name so likewise I want to store the resultant string into this full name so let's see how it can be possible so percentages so that we will be passing the first pass name in place of this formatter and after that I am giving a space because I am expected to have a I'm wanting a space between first name and last name so instead of space you can put anything like you can have multiple spaces or you can have any plus minus any special thing okay you can have any character there so now so instead of space just for you for to make it more understandable just I'm putting star so that your output will become like first name star last name so now after that we need to append the last name in the formatter right so that I'm giving it as percentages so now I'm passing variables so what is my first name let's say first name is my first name and uh, my last name is last name so now what happens so these two get the first name will be substituted in the place of first percentages formatter and the last name will be substituted in the last person substituted in the second percentages so that we will be getting the resultant value first name star last name will be saved into full name so now after saving it using the LR output message we are going to print it so now LR output message so what this will be printing so this will be printing the value of whatever the content of full name so let me run it so this is how it is printing so I will tell you in which particular situation you will be using this printf. So we have already seen some sort of randomization concept in our previous sessions. So in earlier days of in the earlier version of load runner like say 11, 9, 10 in all these versions. So there is no advanced correlation concepts are not there. So in that in that situation so we will be using to randomize any to random to pick any random content from a group of correlation values we will be using the sprintf function so right now this is not much used because the advanced correlation functions made this function to not use 
but we can use this function in some situations like where we want to manually formulate some of the formatted strings like whatever we seen here so this is all about sprintf function now we are going to learn about lr error message so, so far we have we have used lr output message just to show the some of the messages that we wanted to print as part of output log or replay log so lr error message is also similarly works similar way but instead of writing some common notification messages we will be ex exclusively using to print the error message let's look at what is the difference between lr output message and lr error message and how this will be used and which particular case we will be using it i'm going to write lr error message now lr error message of so whatever the content that we wanted to print so if you write lr error message let's look at how it would be displayed in the output log so let me run this so so far we have seen lr output message that will be displayed in a black color in your replay log whereas lr error message will be displayed in red color to say that this is an error so most of the times lr error messages will be used in our script whenever we want exclusively throw some of the error messages let's say a user is failed or a transaction is failed so why it is failed to for which particular user it has got failed we have already seen about how to fail the transactions and we have seen some of the customization for the transactions right so in that particular case whenever we are failing any transaction so we can also throw some of the messages says okay so and so user has been failed in the error message so let's take an example so i'm creating i'm, I'm creating the username right so let us assume that this user is failed so now we can write in lr error message say user failed percentages and we can use we just learned about one function called lr eval string right so we can use lr eval string function to get the any load runner parameter value it may be parameter or it may be correlation so now i am going to print the username just i am throwing an error message called user failed so now let's look at how this will be used here so now it will throw up the message called user failed and it will show the respective username here so it will throw user failed i am tested so likewise we will be used we will be using lr error message to show some to show some output content as an error in your replay log so let's look at similarly how this lr output message also works because in which particular situation we will be using lr output message i will be explaining now so we already know that so whenever if you want to throw any error message then we will be using lr error message so that would be displayed as part of your script in red color so whereas lr output lr output message that was never seen in red color that was seen in, in plain text that is in black color in your script so let's look at the similar statements lr error message and lr output message how these will be displaying in your output message see if you look at here lr output message is displayed in the black color means it is simple notification whereas lr error message is a, to throw some error message to your replay log so this is how this lr error me message will be used now we are going to learn about lr parameter random in our previous sessions we have already seen about correlation whenever correlation advanced option called we have used word equal to all right so in that situation if you want to randomize anything we have used lr parameter idx lr parameter random function lr parameter random function so in this random function lr parameter random function will take any correlation value that you have already that you did already correlation for that value so let's say you did a correlation with the name of uh, let's say products so let me give an example let me quickly open one of the previous script that we have recorded so this is one of the scripts that we have done in our previous session so 
if you navigate if you look at the if you look at this session here so we are navigating this application jpeg store and after that we have logged in and after that uh, we are trying to open one of the random fish product and after that we are trying to select it so here whenever you are trying to select any random fish product let me show it up so let me show it up on the screen so these are, we, we are go, our aim is to select any one of these random pet pet types it may be fish dogs reptiles cats and birds so what we did we try to capture using the correlation function uh, we we try to capture all fish product types so we have clicked on the fish so we we are trying to capture all variety kind of fish products available so using that we have problem we using the webridge separam we have properly formed left and right boundaries and we are trying to capture all those values so those values will be saved under index with a different index value so let me show up where this value comes okay so let me run up to here so okay let, let's continue so we are trying to capture all the occurrences with this left and right boundary so we will be getting all the product all the match products with the with this with this left and right boundary so now what we are trying to do out of this random out of this all set of values that is captured we are trying to use lr parameter random to pick one random fish product automatically by the lr parameter random so that we don't need to use any old logic of sprint type function that we just seen in our previous session of load runner function so it would avoid a lo writing lot of code to pick one random function if we use lr parameter random so let me run this script and see whether it is doing that activity or not so i'm putting a breakpoint here so let me run So it is running now. Maybe it's failed due to some of the uh, text check that wantedly made it. Okay, so this password, this account has been expired. So let me quickly fix that account on that application. These are the new credentials that I just created. Let me rerun it so that this user will be able to log in and the user will be able to see different kinds of fish products using the correlation so let's run it is going on so now user submitting the login so user gone through now so user is now clicking on the fish product so user will be able to capture different set of fish products available see here so these are the using the correlation word equal to all we are able to find variety of variety of fish product with the given left and right boundaries and we got the count as fish product so here we have used lr parameter random function to pick one random fish product from the list of fish products that it captured so if you look at it has picked one random fish product that is called fish product underscore one so this value will be returned by the lr parameter random so this is one of the best use case that we will be in, we will be always using lr parameter random to pick one of the random product from the list of correlated values so this is about lr parameter random and the next function we are going to learn about lr parameter idx so this lr parameter idx is also works on your correlation function so we just will learn about lr parameter random so this lr parameter random function will pick one random value so this will lr parameter idx will do just opposite of random it means if you want to specially to retrieve any of the specific index value means any of the specific correlation value we will be using the lr parameter idx now let's take an example how this works so first let me explain the syntax of it so lr parameter idx will take two arguments one is the what is the correlation parameter that you are going to use and the second second one is the 
which correlation number that you, out of uh, this correlation group so which particular correlation value that you want to pick it may be first correlation value or second correlation value or third correlation value based on the index so this is the syntax about it so now let's look at the x real example using the lr parameter idx here in this code snippet we are trying to pick one random fish product right so instead of that we are trying to pick one or one specific fish product instead of picking a random fish product so as we just seen uh, it would the lr parameter idx function will take two arguments what is the co whatever the correlation function and which value you want to pick let's say i want to pick i want to pick the second second correlation value that is nothing but this this fs w02 this particular fish product type that i want to pick using by the lr parameter idx so now let's look at whether it is really picking the second value or not so let me run it and whenever trying to replay your uh, vu gen script sometime your script may be or your virtual user generator may be freezing for some freezing for few seconds so don't worry it would happen So now we are replaying so we are almost there at that particular step so now if you look at i just mentioned using lr parameter idx to pick the second index as a second index of the fish product to pick the to pick used by the lr parameter parameter idx it means it will put the second value and it will substitute that value into the random fish product so instead of random we can say that it's a second fish product but to make sure to to show to demonstrate example so i just used to pick the second index value so in the in this place you can put any value whichever is valid so let's say you have captured the total values of four and if you try to put five it doesn't get any fifth value because there is no fifth value for this fish product so make sure that whenever you're trying to use lr parameter idx you're not giving any value or any any id to pick which is not more than the count so you must be remember this is one of the key point now we are going to learn about lr parameter length so lr parameter length function also works on top of correlation value whenever you put word equal to all similar to other lr parameter function so here as this function says this lr parameter length function will give the total count of the occurrences okay let's take an example so we are all we are, we are again taking the same script where we used word equal to all to capture similar left and right boundaries and we know that if you verify the replay log whenever you put word equal to all it will always give the count of how many occurrences that your correlation function is able to capture so this fish product has got totally four occurrences with that similar with this left and right boundaries so lr parameter length function will also gives the similar 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 number or similar string whichever this fish products underscore count or respective correlation parameter name underscore count so again this lr parameter length will function that function will give the same value of this the count value so let's let's verify that using by writing that count using lr parameter length so we have correlated this here so i am going to write this uh, using some lr output message lr output message so since it returns a number right so lr parameter length will always return a number okay so it will give the count of the correlation occurrences so i am going since it is a number i am going to use percentage d so just to identify it quickly i am putting some arrow in my string okay and i am going to use lr parameter length so here i need to substitute i need to pass the whatever the correlation parameters that i wanted to use so here i am putting fish product because we have made it to capture multiple occurrences so let me replay it now So now we are at this point. See if you look at this statement. 
so if you want to go to just one more hint i'm giving here if you want to go to your replay log to the respective uh, your code you can right click and click on go to step replay so here it would show you sir this is the value that it lr parameter length gave returns welcome to another session of important load runner functions in this session we are going to learn about leftover the low important load runner function so let's look at website max html param length let's take an example like we in our script which we have already used we have already created so we have added and top website max stm param length so this function is taking a number so which is passed as a string so this number indicates that okay before that let me tell you so by default load runner correlation supports 256 characters to capture let's say this web page save param that's we trying to capture launch url page so, so by default any correlation uh, in the load runner supports only 256 characters so if in case if the parameter that we are trying to capture is having more than 256 characters then your script will throws left and right boundary error or it will also suggest you to increase the max website max html parameter if it is not implemented so this is absolutely to this will be absolutely used to increase the correlation size that is being captured by the virtual user generator so here i pass 9 lakh 99999 as the value so this can be used like this so we can pass any number other than 256 characters but suppose if you pass it only 100 then it will only limit itself to capture 100 characters so likewise always better try to give a bigger number let's say like 9999 and uh, it may be uh, 9,999,999 likewise you can give any big number and also the number varies depending on the correlation value that you are trying to capture so this is all about website max html parameter and the next function we are going to learn about website proxy this function particularly used to whenever you are in a situation that your targeted application server is an external application or which is behind a proxy it means uh, this is not if you are working on a not an internal application which is not available in a local network so if you are trying to access that application server so you may need to connect to the some other internet server or some other proxy servers so mostly if you look at in corporates they will be having proxy server to connect to the external network so website proxy used to set proxy value or proxy server information in this whatever the value that you are trying to uh, whatever the proxy server that you wanted to pass it so sometimes you may be in a situation like uh, majority of the times people may be forgetting the setting the proxy if their no proxy is not properly set up then uh, you'll be seeing uh, suppose not reachable or server could not be found kind of error will be occurred so in this situation uh, by default your script may be indicating that you need to use a proxy so it may be indicating that uh, so in that situation you can come and add that proxy name so here this website proxy takes two parameters one is the host name and uh, host name whatever the proxy server name so you must be talking to your network team to get what is your proxy and the respective port number so this is the way that you need to give so if you want like if you are not aware of how to use that so whenever you press some control space you will be seeing the whatever the it will it will it will suggest you what value that you need to pass so it says a const cat uh, style proxy host and port so it means you need to pass it as a const care means you need to pass it as a string and with the respect to host and with the respect to port so let me write some example right now i'm directly connected to the internet so we don't need to use the proxy now let me try to uh, let's let's set up let's say i'm having a proxy at 192 10.1 so this is my let's assume that this is my proxy address and my proxy is listening on the 8080 port so likewise you need to set the website proxy likewise there is one more function uh, that is a website user so this is very common function that you will be using uh, is a very generous function that you will be using whenever you are working in the corporates so website user is sim similarly works with the uh, website proxy just instead of that 
Sometimes your whenever your proxies need an authentication, instead of directly connecting to the proxy, they will be using the authentication. It means it will you need to you need to log into the proxy using some username and password. So in that case, you can also use that website proxy function with the username and password and with the respective host name. Let's say I am saying that 192.168.0.10 is my proxy and the respective port. Let's say I am putting it as 8080. So this is not a real proxy. Just for you to make understand, I am giving this. So website user very commonly use the proxy function. So this proxy can be used can be set in other way too. Like we can use we can set them in the runtime settings. Let me show how we can set it. Let's open runtime settings now. So once you open runtime settings on the left side navigation, you will see something called proxy. So once you click on the proxy, some of the options will be populated here. So by default, now I'm not using any proxy. That's why it is set as no proxy. If you want to do not want to set any proxy manually, then you can set you, you if you use this option, uh, you will indicate in the load runner to go and use whatever the proxy addresses proxy server details that are available on my internet explorer or by default my system okay or the by default it may be your system so it will go and use whatever the default proxy settings that is there on your system sometimes you may be setting the proxy address manually so this will this particular option use in some corporates they will be using proxy authentication scripts it not is nothing but the dot psc script so you need to give that power dot psc script path and along with that, if your proxy needs any authentication, so you must be passing your username and password under authentication section. So you need to give your username. Let's say I'm giving my username and username. So you need to click on change. Let's say I'm giving my password as password. So you definitely need to supply your username and password. If your proxy definitely need an authentication with your credentials. So this is the way. So what we have seen, so we have seen we can use either we can say that go and use my system default proxy settings without setting it manually. Sometimes you may be needing to the set the proxy using a .psc. Sometimes there is an explicit proxy name. So this is used for using proxy with the .psc scripts. Sometimes you can explicitly mention what server address that you want to use instead of .psc script. So let's say I am telling that 192.168.0.1 as my proxy. So I am giving the some port. So this, this should be your proxy port and this should be your proxy server IP or proxy server name. So make sure that you're getting the right proxy address from your system administrator or the network administrator. So this is the way how you can see that. So this is the one way that we can use programmatically are with the JMIT with the load under API. We can set this website user and other ways we can use the from runtime settings. And the next function we are going to learn about LR continue on error. So this function is used to uh, whenever there is a situation like server explicitly sends an error and instead of stopping your script you can still hint your script to or in, instead of uh, stopping your script you can hint to the virtual user generator boss do not stop you can go and continue further you can ignore that particular error so let's take an example how we can use LR. let me write an example for error continue on error so here I am writing LR continue on error. So LR continue on error takes two things. So either you can enable if you want to enable LR, LR continue on error. So you can indicate with one with the value one with for the LR continue on error. So if you pass this value, it would ignore or it would it won't be your script won't be stopping if any of the following URLs are throwing any 500 internal or 400 or 400 unauthorized blah 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 right. So due to the server error, if by default your load runner will be stopping your script if server sends any error. So in that situation, though it is a known issue and still if you want to continue, you can use LR continue on error. And there are situations like you want to limit only for only one particular set of requests. So in that case, you can again switch off the LR continue on error mechanism. So how you can do that? You can simply to reset that you can make it as LR continue on error by passing a zero value. So it means only server VUGen will be ignoring if because we have uh, let me put it in this way so you can easily understand. So what happens? We just added LR continue error for this particular AP for particular URL. So what happens? 
if server sends any error message to this URL, so your load under script will not be start. And after that, the following request, if you want to, if you want to reset and if you want to stop your script, if following errors are, following requests are failing, so you can again, you can again reset the value to the zero. It means though error occurs, like if error occurs, script will be automatically stopped. So here in this case, we are only validating the we are only setting the we are only telling the we are telling the virtual user generator to do not stop only for this request and rest of all the scripts script or rest of all the requests can be uh, validated as it is so this is all about lr continue and error and the next function we are going to see about web convert param sometimes you will be in a situation like so you let's say you're capturing a correlation value so by default whenever you're trying to substitute this is not the case like uh, this not always happen this is happens only when in a case like whenever you're trying to capture a value but you're capturing the value in a normal mode or html mode but your script is substituting it in an encoding format so if you want to encode any built-in any any load runner parameters you will be using web convert param so let's take an example then we will be understanding it more so right now i am writing a, a web convert parameter here so this is the skeleton for web convert parameter so let's walk you through this what is the meaning of and how it can be used so this is the standard template for web convert param Okay, so web convert param, the first parameter means where you want to save the web convert param means so you will be encoding and decoding from the HTML mode to URL mode. Let's say this is the source encoding. Let's say as I just discussed, you are finding it in the value in plain mode. And if you want to encoding into the, uh, let's say URL mode, you can mention the targeting encoding as a URL mode. So here the source encoding. So it may be text mode or it may be HTML mode. Okay and the source string so let's say you have captured csrf token right so if you want to encode this value to the url mode so you can you can send it this value like this so this is the source and source string means where from you want to encode the value so you we are passing csrf token and where you want to save after encoding so if you look at so i'm after after encoding just we are saving that encoded value into the targeted parameter so this is how the way that we will use web convert param we are going to learn about web save timestamp param. Sometimes your server appends the current time in the milliseconds to your request. Let's say your request may be getting something like this. So let's take an example. So you, your server will be appending some 12 digit value. Uh, let me count this. So it's a 5, 10, well, so this is a 12 digit value so if you see any 12 digit number in your request appended to your request so then it would be the server timestamp or it may be your browser's timestamp that also we can assume if you are if you are server if you are seeing any request you can use web convert uh, web save timestamp param value to or to pass this to generate this value using the web save timestamp param function so let's say you're giving something called a t stamp so you can directly substitute this t stamp value in your request so this will automatically generate your current system timestamp and it will pass it to the server sometimes your server may not validate if you are using the recorded timestamp so it is not mandatory always you need to replace but sometimes if servers are very strict to validate the request timestamp so then you must be using the web save, web save timestamp param so this will be generating the current time in milliseconds in 12 digits and send it to the we can send it to the server now we are going to learn about web had web add header and web add auto header web add header function is used to send any header uh, add any header to the explicit header to your request so web had header two takes two values one is the what is the header name and what is the header value let's say my header name is header name header and header name and value is the one two three four so this will be sent for sent for your request and the other function web add auto header so it also works similarly web add web add header the only difference is if you use web add header 
this value will be only applied to the one request if you use web add auto header this header value will be added to the all subsequent request till end of your script so this is the difference between web add header and web add auto header so these are all the built in low runner functions that are so important welcome to helping testers.com so far in our previous sessions we have learned about how to create this script using web http protocol and how to customize our scripts and how to make it ready to be executed in the controller so now in this session we're going to learn a detail about controller so let's get start as soon as you install the complete load runner you will be seeing a component called on your desktop controller so either you can launch it from here or you can search in your start tab and you will be finding it under your program so you can directly search with the name of the controller so it will appear so right now i'm going with the whatever the desktop shortcut that have been created so once you double click on it it will open up the controller says whatever the version it has and it will also display the whatever the version that currently you are holding and one important thing that we need to remember so this is the community edition right now we are using and with the community edition we cannot test not more than 50 concurrent users so whenever you're trying to do any sample test make sure that you are remembering with that condition if you are using any community edition so once you double click on once you launch the controller so the very first screen that you will be seeing the adding the new scenario okay so this is all about the controller how to start so let me take you that what we are whatever we're going to learn now so i will give you an overview of uh, we're going to learn about uh, what are the various things that we are learning about the controller so let's start with the controller overview i will take you through the what are the various tabs available under controller and uh, let's learn it now as we just seen while we launch the controller so initially come up with a dialog called available so now here we are going to learn about what is the select scenario type so here scenario type is nothing but uh, in low runner it could be providing uh, basically two kinds of scenarios one is the manual scenario and another one is the goal oriented scenario so what is the manual scenario and what is the goal oriented scenario so let's learn about the manual scenario at first see if your client is giving the whole requirement of like how much users that you need to do performance testing for each of the scripts or each of the business flow that you wanted to test if you have everything available with you then you can go with the manual scenario it means you are you are having everything ready like you have scripts ready and for each and every scripts that you know the load so like if you take an example see here my client has been providing me like for the jpet store he is asking me to do checkout products for the three users and at the same time he wanted me to do five logins and uh, he wanted me to view the products by three users so he is also he is giving me some information to me to do the test to do the load for each of the scenario let's say this is one script this is one script and this is one script so here it is, he is giving me how many concurrent users that he wanted me to test for each of the scenario so here i know each and everything like how much user load that i wanted to do and how what are the scenarios that i wanted to test so i have a full information that client provided so in this situation i am going to use manual scenario so whenever we know everything that are we wanted to test so then we go for the manual scenario and the other scenario is a goal oriented scenario so here in the goal oriented scenario whenever we don't know how much load that we wanted to test instead of client will be giving other information other than the load let's say here client has provided me the scenarios and uh, tph nothing but transactions per hour so he is asking me to do test for the transactions per hour instead of the concurrent load on the system so based on this we need to calculate how much user load that we need to achieve in an hour so here he mentioned transactions per hour means so these many transactions to be achieved for 
each of the test flow or each of the test case so we need to use in this case the goal oriented scenario whenever you don't have any particular user load that you don't that, that is not provided by the client now let's start with the goal oriented scenario so i have added the script for my scenario for this checkout script client is asking me to do 60 tph means 60 transactions per hour so if we calculate it in the transactions per second so one sec one hour gets totally 3600 seconds so if we convert into the tps tps so then we need to divide it by we need to divide the 60 by 3600 it means it will give us the whatever the total tps that we need to achieve in one hour so it says in one second so it says 0.016 is the tps that we need to achieve so this configuration that we can do in the goal oriented scenario so it is a 0.016 okay just for understanding let's take some bigger value uh, let's say it's a 10000 transactions per hour client is expecting me to achieve so now we'll be having some good value that we can achieve so let me do this so we need to achieve 2 trans 2.7 transactions per hour so we will be giving this tps information in our goal oriented scenario so it will automatically calculate the load that we need to put on the server now let's check it how we, we can do that so here so there are various things that we can apply to the goal the very first thing is virtual user goal so uh, we can ignore it because anyhow this will be covered in the goal oriented manual scenario and uh, the next goal that we can instead of transactions per hour we can also do goal oriented scenario with the hits per second means we can hint we can know how many users and client is giving instead of tps or tpf tps if client is giving how many hits per second he wanted to have on his server so in this case we will be going the will going will be going with the hits per second and the next scenario the next goal type that we are going to see about just we seen transactions per second so here that we have added a script so this is to add to quota checkout so proceed to checkout so for this particular transaction we need to achieve 2.7 tps per 2.7 tps so we can set the 2.7 here so it is 2.7 and the other setting that what we need to do is we need to give how many users that we wanted to start with and how many maximum users that we wanted to end so since it is a community edition i'm not going to use not more than 50 users okay so it will automatically increase the load until it reaches to the 2.7 transactions per second and uh, we can also set one more thing here we can say how long you wanted to run because if you are setting a if you are it will slowly ramp up the ramp up the users to achieve this 2.7 transactions per second but if you are not able to achieve within a short period of time always try to give a bigger number or uh, within one hour or 30 minutes to achieve a meaningful transactions per hour and transactions per second and uh, you can uh, leave it to the controller to analyze on its own to what is the user load that we can go with so now we need to do all these kind of settings and uh, there is one more thing like load behavior so better you always keep it to automatic now so as soon as we can set something here if goal cannot be reached what it can be done so continue with the reacting goal or stop with the scenario so better we always if the goal is not achieved though we have crossed the number of users means so these users are not sufficient to achieve this goal it means we need to add more and more number of users so instead of that instead of continuing further with our script we can always stop our scenario with the whatever the goal that we have achieved so we are indicating that either we wanted to stop the scenario or we wanted to continue though goal is not reached okay so here this receive notification indicates that whenever the goal is received a goal is reached or not then it will show us a notification called uh, 
say so and so goal has been achieved at the so and so number of users so it will give us a notification so right now i am setting the stop scenario when i reached my when i cannot be reached the goal now so i can give some name to this i can give some name to this uh, goal so let let's say achieve tps 2.7 so i am giving this name so you can you can name your goal okay like then you can click okay so now your goal will be applied now what you need to do the next thing is as soon as you create any scenario you always try to you remember when we were discussing about the load and architecture your controller scenario will always be saved with the dot lrs extension so here i am giving it like goal oriented scenario let's say i am going to achieve 2.7 tps so it will automatically append the dot lr extension to your scenario i am saving my scenario now and this is all about how you can add your script to your scenario now one more important thing that we are going to learn about adding the load generators so let's say since i am running my machine uh, i don't have a big network to demonstrate multiple load generators i am using my local system as a load generator if you are working in your corporate or if you are working on your real time scenarios you will be always needing one or more load generators that are required for your controller to start with whatever the load test that you wanted to have so here what you need to do is if you wanted to add more and more load generators you can always come to here click on add and either you can give the host name or you can give some ip address so let me try to give the ip address uh, one of the ip address that i have instead uh, of course i don't have that ip address doesn't have any load generator but i'm giving it just to show how to add the load generator to your controller so i am giving the ip address of the control ip address of the load generator where it is installed and you can select the platform it may be linux or windows and uh, you can ignore the temporary directory or you can explicitly mention where your temporary test results will be saved on the load generator so as of now i am ignoring it so click okay so whatever the scenario whatever the load generator information that you have added will come up here so now what you need to do just adding load generator is not sufficient then you need to connect them and you will be able to successfully connect then only you can use those load generator so if you look at i have connect generator has come up and when i click on connect it says ready but if you see the other load generator it is still in connecting state it means it is trying to the server and now it got failed it means my sys my controller is not able to connect to the targeted load generator that whatever i mentioned here so sometimes make sure that whenever you have added any load generators just do not ignore by adding them always try to connect and verify whether they are available or not available or not so this is how and sometimes you don't need to if you if you don't want to use any load generator or if you if you want to delete them you can just delete them or either you can disable them so if you disable those won't be a part of your test execution so now i'm disabling it and also i can delete it now so i just for the time sake i have deleted the load generators so if you come down here to your scenario here you can select what are all the load generators that you wanted to be part of your script let's say i have n number of load generators so i can select whatever the load generators that i have right now i have only one one local host as load generator so i can select it otherwise if you want to select a whatever the added load generators everything together you can select all load generators so you can if you select all load generators all the load generators that are added in your load generator section so those all load generators will be used here so this is all about how you can add load generators to your system to your script and uh, we have edited just we have we have just edited a goal oriented scenario to achieve that tps 2.7 for checkout transaction so now what we can do we need, we can go to the start scenario then it will go and run so before going to that so if you look at the bottom 
we are having various tabs here so each represents each section and which will be used at a different points of your test right now we are in a design phase of your script means we are adding the script and we are setting up some of the settings that are related to your goal oriented scenario okay so that's the reason we are in the design so as soon as you click on start scenario it will go and ask where you wanted to save the results so it will be switching to the run tab so run tab is the one which will be used to showcase the whatever the users that are running and all your test running information will be shown under your run tab so run tab will be having lot of things like where your all users are running and uh, how they are running everything information let's look at if you are if you are looking at that this run tab we are having various indication like down pending init ready run renders passed fail error gradual exiting exiting and start so let's learn each of them so as soon as you before clicking on the start all users will be staying here means whatever the user that have added will be staying here and pending means so whenever your user test scripts files are transferred to the load generator so then it would be in pending state in its state so in its state will be showing up if your script is in the if you particular if any user is in the place of v user in its section of your script and ready means so it is just simple switch space space between your v user in it and actual action so mostly we won't be seeing any users here run means these many number of users are running right at the moment and renderers so we will learn about the renderers point at a later moment so for that we need we can add them in our script part and the passed means how many users have passed and how many users are failed how many users have been errored out due to some issues and which are users are completed and they are in the just exiting your test and uh, exiting and who are the stop like whatever the users who are whenever you click on the stop so whichever the running users are will be coming to the gradual exiting or exiting then finally they will end up with a status called stopped so this is all about various states of the users whenever you are running controller so we just clicked on the start few minutes ago so the test is running to achieve the goal oriented scenario so based on that it will see it has automatically ramped up the ramped up the users that whatever we have given so we said it to start with the 10 users and uh, it will uh, it will end up to the 50 users so meanwhile if it is able to achieve any tps that whatever we have mentioned then the test will be able to stop automatically otherwise test will be stopped again though it is not achieved with some notification says goal is not achieved so now test is going on now also let me introduce about various pans available in your run so we just see learned about whatever the scripts that you have added those will be you can see here under your scenario group section so the other section contains some of the start stop button or reset user button and v users all the information that will be available here so let's take a look you know if you, if you want to start your scenario you can click on start scenario if you want to stop scenario you can click on stop button okay now if you see any of the users have been failed or failed or uh, in error condition so you can just by clicking them just by clicking on reset you can push them back to the down state so they will be again can come into your run state so you can re, you can use those users so right now why it is disabled because as of now we don't see any errors any users are coming into the failed condition okay now there is one more button so called as v user so here v user tab shows whenever there are as we just seen that right so these are the various states of the uh, virtual user so here we can filter out which user is running on which state so everything can be clearly shown there so if you click on running state so all the users will be now are in running state so you can just filter out here you can filter this is this tells about which particular test script and this tells about which particular state of the user so right now i'm selecting all the users so i can see them 
just I'm clicking on close and uh, it is see if you look at here it is showing me some of the errors because since we are running with the community edition we have exceeded uh, 50 concurrent users so that's why it is throwing messages errors so now we just seen about this now the other part of this you know test status so it will also in the test status it will show up running we users so how many users are running and elapsed time means how long the test is continuing so far and hits per second so how many hits per second the test is running with and the past transaction so how many transactions have been passed so let me show you if you click on this number link it will show up how many transactions are failed and many have transactions are passed so we can look at all of them okay so we can close this and error transactions again error transactions will also open the same window just it will indicate how many passed and how many failed likewise and the other thing and important thing is the error so in this error section it will show up all the errors that are coming as part of your test execution so i am getting various errors like step download timeout no match found and a couple of other errors remote server is down likewise so now my test is automatically stopped with a message says target cannot be reached so this is all about how you can use the goal oriented scenario so now we are looking let's learn about the other sections of your run tab so in your run tab you are having graphs that can be monitored whenever you are running the test see here on your left side there are various graphs which are some graphs are in blue color some graphs are in red color so blue color indicates those have got values and black color indicates so those graphs doesn't get any value for this test so let's take a look here on this graph so we by default it will be having four panels of the graph so if you want to specially visualize it any of the graph bigger you can double click down click on them to visualize it into bigger again if you double click it will visualize it into the normal and we can see the four panel graphs let's say i wanted to rent some errors per second on this graph so if you want to do that you can click on this graph and you can double click on whatever the error statistics graph so it will render the graph information here so likewise you can grab whatever the graph information that you wanted to have and the other section we want we will be learning now here if you look at this will be showing up the information about your transaction response time like how much how much transaction response time you got it may be minimum maximum average standard deviation and the last transaction so last transaction means whatever the transaction which has been come as part of your test execution recently so these are the various spans available in your test scenario okay now if you look at here our test has been stopped so if you click on the reset whatever the users that we just have here those were gone to your running state or down state so you can look at them here or everything will be reset okay this is all about running a goal oriented so now our goal is not achieved so that we are not able to uh, complete and uh, since I am testing with a very high load so it would be the server the server is throwing some of the messages so so called as the server is not reachable so you can ignore it for the time being so this is all about the goal oriented scenario now next we are going to learn about the manual scenario welcome to helpingtesters.com so far we have covered about control overview and design tabs and how to how to add scripts to your controller and how to add various load generators and also we have covered about the goal oriented scenario now let's learn about the manual scenario so far we have seen that like whenever we have we can use a goal oriented scenario and whenever we can use a manual scenario so now we have already known that like manual scenario can be used whenever you have a definite number of users load that are used for your each of the scenario so now let's implement a simple manual scenario by using the controller so to do that 
I'm just going to create a new scenario. Click new. Okay. So now I need to select here the manual scenario. Just forget about the use percentage mode. So mostly no one uses the option. And here you need to add whatever the scripts that you wanted to performance test or that you wanted to do test with the given number of users. So you can if you click on add that script will be added to your controller. Then you click on OK. So now you're going to open manual scenario. So if you open the manual scenario, basically this is already we have covered uh, like various pans and uh, various things that are there. So now let's start saving the saving the scenario manual scenario. So this is for checkout checkout. We're going to do it for the let's say we're going to do it for the five users. Check out five users. So I'm saving my scenario. There is one important thing. So whenever you have created any new scenario, immediately you better always see, keep the wherever you wanted to save the creating a path for you must be creating a path on and you must be creating results name for whatever the scenario that whatever the test result that you wanted to save here. See here I'm saving it. So better always follow the best practice and the standards to save your results. So let's say you need to follow some naming conventions like this is for checkout and that I'm going to run this for the five users and uh, five users test. This is the test one. Some people also append the date instead of giving some name. They will also append let's say some XYZ data. Let's say this is executed on 0101 2020. So some people also gives the date prefix also for your results name just to best identification at a later point of time to your scripts or to your test results. So now I'm na I'm naming I'm naming my test results with this name. So I'm just you can click OK. So there are two options here. So if you want to automatically add some number to your results at the end, so you can also you can select this. And uh, if you select this, if you are trying to give you a name with any other existing test results, so it will automatically overwrite this. So always try to avoid select this second second checkbox because without prompting you, it will automatically delete it so that you will be losing any of the existing test results. So now I'm going to click on OK. So now let's go. Let's come back here and let's learn more about it. OK. So we already known we have already seen that. So this is for adding whatever the number of scripts that you wanted to add. And also you can select the load generators against your script. So right now we are in the design tab. So in this design tab, we are adding one or more scripts to your scenario controller scenario. And also we are adding number of load generators and uh, whatever the load generators that we wanted to run for each of the script under your scenario so that can be selected here. Now the other section is the SLA. So in this SLA section, if you click on it, so let me reopen. This SLA section is always shows about, let's say you're trying to run your test where you wanted to automatically apply SLA. So in our earlier classes, we have learned about what is SLA. SLA is nothing but service level agreement. So let's say your client says, I wanted to have each and every page to be loaded within five seconds. So that is five seconds so called as SLA. It means client is enforcing his applications to always obey the five seconds as response time. So if it is not meeting the SLA, then the test will be failing automatically. So here, let me create some simple SLA for you. So I just clicked on new. So just go and click and uh, here we can create SLA based on the various options. Let's say by transaction response time and uh, based on errors per second and based on the total hits, average hits, total throughput, average throughputs. Majority of the times people uses by percentile and uh, by TPS transactions per second or hits per second. Okay, so now let me apply a percentile mode for the transaction response time. So I'm going to apply 90 percentile. Now let's click on next. 
so for which transaction you wanted to add SLA so that you need to select here so since it's a checkout that is the main transaction that I wanted to achieve so I'm going to click I'm going to select checkout transaction so you can either add one or more transactions to this so right now I'm uh, going to select proceed to checkout for this transaction only I'm enforcing and also I'm also enforcing to submit login so you can select as many as transactions that you wanted to have and select them so they will be come on to the right side of your transaction list then you can click next so here it would say what is the percentile so we will be and we will be learning more about the percentile in analysis right now just remember it as the threshold 90 percentile threshold should not be exceeded to the more than five seconds then only either you can apply threshold value combined together for all the transactions or you can individually set threshold for each of the transactions so let's say for the login I'm giving as 4 and for proceed to checkout I'm giving as 5 so whenever you click on apply it will be automatically overridden to the, your uh, all transactions so let me apply everything as 5 seconds so once I apply so those settings will be come up here so I'm clicking on the next here so likewise you can define multiple SLAs that will automatically enforce your transactions to validate so now I'm finishing SLAs so either that SLA whatever I just created so that is coming as part of like this so likewise you can add n number of SLAs to your test or scenario now this is section is completed now let's look at the other section is the scheduled by scenario and scheduled by group so this is one important thing that you must be learning it here whenever you are you are added one or more scenarios or one or more scripts to your scenario you will be basically seeing these four options so the very first option is tell, tells about scheduled by scenario okay and the uh, second option is run mode it may be real world scenario and it may be basic, basic schedule so let's try to understand what are they let's say if you select the scheduled by scenario let me add one more script to understand it mean so that we will get more idea about it so i have added one more script so whenever i select scheduled by scenario so if this scheduled by scenario is added see the ramp up ramp down and the steady state all the settings will be shared by each of these script that we have added means there will be common ramp up ramp down to the all of the test test scripts that we have added to your controller see here i have added 10 you by default 10 users are coming up to this scenario and 10 users are coming up per scenario so here those together all will become the 20 users so 20 users will be ramped up and ramped down and uh, they will be having a different study so let's learn about more on this when we come to this topic of global scheduler so we will be seeing more about it so as of now just remember so whenever you apply select by scenario so the select by this scenario settings will be common across to your all the scripts so now let's take a next thing like scheduled by group so in the scheduled by group if you look at each of the script having its own different run settings let's say you can give scheduled by scenario scheduled by group you can apply 15 users to this first script or second script and only 10 users to your first script say it is nothing to say like each script can have its own number of users and each script can have his own number of ramp up ramp down and steady state so now let's learn about ramp up and ramp down and steady state see here your client says I don't want all users to be coming at the same time into the application instead of that I wanted to have users to come at a slower rate or gradually I wanted them, them to be on my system so this is so called as start v users start users so the start user says how quickly you wanted to tell the whatever the user that you have assigned to your test script that the, you wanted to come them into the picture or come them into the execution so this is so called as the ramp ramp up so 
in this ramp up for this the first first script i have set the ramp up as like this say five users one user for every 5 seconds so that respective graph will be automatically highlighted see if we select this second script so the second script graph settings are ramp up and a steady state everything will be appeared automatically on the interactive scheduled graph so this interactive scheduled graph is shows the whatever the it, it shows the graphical representation of the whatever the settings that you made under the global scheduler okay now I wanted to run my test for five minutes for the first test script. Let's say dev2 for the first test group. I wanted to run it for five minutes with the 10 users. Okay, at a rate of one user for every 10 seconds means one user will for every 10 seconds one user will be come and execute the test. And the next option, how long you wanted to hold the load? See here, if I select here, this particular part has been highlighted means when all users are coming into the picture or coming into the run then those many number of users will be hold whatever the amount of time that you mention here those many number of hours or minutes or seconds the test will be continued so here right now i wanted to continue my test for 10 10 minutes so this is hours minutes seconds okay by default run for is selected even you can run your test for number of days so I'm clicking on apply so that my run duration will be automatically reflected. See here, the total duration will be calculated from here to here as 10 minutes. So let's look at again other option like run until completion. So run until completion means each user will run and come into the picture and run whatever the runtime settings that you have applied here. So let's look at the runtime settings here. See. I am selecting my script to run only 5 iterations so that 5 iterations will be given here. So if you select run until completion, users will be doing only the 5 iterations and exit instead of running it in uh, based on the time. So they won't be worrying about the time now. So they will be worrying about the number of iterations they do like they will be using the 5 iterations. So right now I don't want to go with the number of iterations mode. I wanted to continue with the time mode. So let's say I wanted to run this script for three minutes and uh, just applied and OK. And the other one, the last option is like when you wanted to stop and how you wanted to stop. See, if you wanted to stop all users together, then you can select simultaneously means there will be sudden drop of the users from the system means users will be suddenly exit out of your system. Or if you wanted to slowly exit them, then you can select whatever the slow coming down time it is nothing but so called as a ramp down time so you can i'm giving a ramp down time as one user for every five seconds users will be coming out of the system likewise you can set multiple run settings for each of the test script or test group in your controller see this particular test this particular test script has got some different runtime settings and uh, different test duration and this second script has got different test duration so likewise you can mention if you select by scheduled by group so each and every script will be having its own test running metrics so right now let me run the second script for just only five minutes now my scenario setting is completed so before running the test always make sure that you need to check where you are saving your test results so right now i'm giving my test i'm saving my test results as it's a totally of 25 users so 25 users and this is test one today so i'm giving it as a test one so my test results will be saved under that particular directory So now the next thing is you can if you click it if you click on here start the your test will be starting automatically and you will be moved into the run tab so we'll be looking at the run tab in our later session so this is all about how you add a manual scenario in our next session we are going to learn about how to add 
how to how to refresh your script and how to apply runtime settings on your controller scenario and how we can use it in your scenario that we can learn it welcome to helpingtesters.com in this session we are going to learn about more in detail manual scenarios and uh, we will look at some of the uh, real time situations like how we can set up different set of scenarios and how we ramp up ramp down and how we can do different types of spike testing all that we are going to learn now so let us take a look in our previous sessions we have seen about how to add a control how to add a test script to manual scenario and how we can set test users like how many users that you wanted to run for any script that you have added and also we have learned about the testing the user ramp up pattern so this is a ramp up pattern and the test duration uh, or the steady state like how long you wanted to have the urls to be running concurrently and that the ramp down is nothing but how you can stop the all users that you have scheduled so here if you look at basically we have the two types of scheduled by options that is scheduled by scenario and scheduled by group so we have already seen that scheduled by scenario will have common shade ramp up steady state and ramp down across all the whatever the number of scripts that we have added to your scenario and whereas by group will have individual script ramp up ramp down patterns that we can apply for individual script so this is all about we have seen now let's take a look and let's learn about some of the advanced scripting or advanced uh, scenario creation so let me navigate now let us learn about run mode see here in run mode we have basically have basic schedule and real world schedule so the the difference is with the basic schedule we don't be we won't be having so much options to schedule runtime run duration and steady state ramp down so simply we will be having when you wanted to start how you wanted to have the users ramp up and how you wanted to have the how long you wanted to run your users and uh, how you wanted to stop your test or how you wanted to stop your users so thus can be available only with the basic schedule so now let us learn about real world schedule in real world schedule let, it, let me click on this in real world schedule we will be having advanced scheduling option let us take an example to understand how we can play with the real world schedule to create complex scenarios so let me open up here so let us say this is a j pet store application and the users are coming up into the application like this so this access indicates the number of users and this access indicates the time so now let's look at so the users are coming up like within the first five minutes we are having the five minute we are having the five users are coming into the system and uh, the five users are holding holding the load for five minutes holding the load for five minutes and after that so this is the five minutes duration that users are holding okay after that within next five minutes the users are coming down or ramping down okay so after users all users are ramping down again five users will be coming up within the next five minutes and the users will be holding for next five minutes duration and users are coming down within the next five minutes of duration as a ramp down so now if you look at this one of the very common scenario where some of the real time applications will be having the load will be like this so users will be coming up in some situations and there may be some period of period of duration where there will be less load and user will almost no load and again users will be coming up let's say if you are testing an op office application so in the morning users will be coming up uh, gradually and uh, by morning in the nine o'clock all users will be coming up okay so until uh, until before lunch so all users will be available and working on the application so slowly one after the other during the lunch time users will be ramping down okay so then when lunch time is over slowly one after the other users will be again coming into the application so that till four o'clock everyone will be working and after four o'clock so users will be one after the other leaving the office so this is how the application works so let us create the real this kind of real time and tricky scenarios using the controller using the real time schedule so let's open the controller now 
So we already seen that how to create some of the basic schedule or basic scenarios using the simple ramp up and uh, run run duration or the steady state and ramp down. So to do to to start with, for first of all, let us implement this part of the this part of the scheduler. So we are having totally five users. So one user will be coming up for every one hour, every one minute. So that totally within five minutes, all users will be coming into the application. Okay. So if you look at uh, if you look at here, so user we will be seeing the users are coming within four minutes because for the first step it won't consider anything. So that if you wanted to have users to be coming only after one minute of the duration, so that if you wanted to put any delay in the users to come up into the system. Okay, if you wanted to add anything like if you wanted to delay the users to come up into the system, we can do that setting in the initialize. So if you wanted to schedule the users, users to be come into the picture immediately or if you wanted to come all of them after certain amount of period of time. So we wanted to have them to come into picture only after first minute so that we can we can make the users to come whenever they wanted to come so to achieve that this scheduled by scenario is really doesn't help here so let us refresh it let us put back whatever the settings so now to do that we must be selecting the scheduled by group so scheduled by group options will give us if we wanted to put any delay to the start the user so that we can put it so let's say we are putting some delay so that we can put the delay in by start group so when we wanted to have like if you wanted to start these set of users immediately after scenario starts so here if you want if we wanted to have some one minute of delay to start the user so here i'm giving that i wanted to initialize the users to come after one minute of the duration whenever the scenario starts so that if you see here now we are having a delay of one minute here so now we can schedule as is so we don't want to to have a 10 users so we wanted to have only one five users five users run coming into the system at the rate of one user per every one minute so that setting we add on see if you look at see within first five minutes all the users are coming up into the system so this is what we are expecting to have and after that let us take the run duration so we wanted to have the users to come into the picture and we wanted to hold the load for five minutes so we have made the setting here as a five minutes and just need to click apply if you make any changes just let me put that back so i'm putting it a five minutes so that we will see the steady states so call this is as a steady state where steady state defines how long the test is running after all users are coming up and if you click on next then we will be setting up the stop users this is nothing but so called as ramp down so we are also ramping down with the same ramp down pattern like one user for every one minute means within five minutes all users will be ramp ramped down okay so let me set this and then click ok for some reason this is not applying okay so let me do this instead of let me do this apply changes sometimes you, you won't be seeing that uh, graph is properly applying it so we need to make it as one user for every one minute so that so now it is been affected okay now we are seeing the whatever the expected pattern that we wanted to have so the first type of ramping up and is done now we wanted to implement the second part of it like second phase of our post launch of the scenario that we wanted to implement so now here what we need to do we need to here come down here see if you look at here we are having an option called star so this is to create a new schedule or new action after this so if you click on it it will come up with an action so that it, it this action will be having some different options here start users and duration so now what we wanted to do we wanted to initialize five users at the same one user for every one minute see here we got the ramp up if you once you click on apply it has got up right so now after that click on add another action so now here you can mention the duration so now you need to mention here five minutes by default 
we got the duration as a five minutes so if you apply we will see the steady state again for the users now after that what we need to do we need to stop the user so how we wanted to stop the user again with the similar settings one user for every one minute let us make let us not do changes so let me apply here that is overriding changes so let me count down if you're seeing some kind of conflict then you can come down to the edge and you can click here so what you need to do you need to stop the users so you can mention one user for every one minute so now this is the actual expected scenario that we wanted to have see if here this is similar to that whatever we wanted to have so now if you run this will go and run as we expected okay and also in our previous session of the controller we have already seen that so in controller also we are having the runtime settings these runtime setting nothing but whatever the runtime settings that we have seen in our virtual user generator component so here the best option that we need to look at whenever we are running the any test in the controller always we need to set some pacing and the think time enabled in the controller because the realistic scenario so that all users will not be go continuously after that one after the other like how like how our controller is doing instead of that we wanted to have some delay between the each and every iteration of each and every user do so that is so called as pacing so we have already seen about this okay and one important thing that i want to mention here so whenever you are running any real time test make sure that you are not enabling the log to always send messages so if you enable this option your load generators will be unnecessarily writing a lot of logs because we are putting lot of load on the system so each and every user will be writing lot of unnecessary stuff so you may be asking a question so if you are not writing any logs then what is the situation if say any user fails so how we can identify why they are failing so in that situation what we can do is we can select the send message whenever only error occurs so that if you select this options you logs will not be generated unless until there is a error occurred on the run your scenario okay so make sure that if you if you select any standard or extended log so that for more information you will be logging and that too whenever there is an error record so this is a mandatory option that you need to select otherwise you may be filling up your disk space on the load generators and make sure that you are enabling think time on your controller so otherwise your load if you think time is not applied properly or if think time is properly not calculated your load agents will be utilized 100 percent cpu so make sure that if you give some think time it would help in two ways one is the like you will be controlling the user throughput as real as how real users do and also you will be giving some space breathe space to the load generators so that within that time the load generators will be able to serve other users or other virtual users so make sure that you are always enabling the think time whenever you are running the controller okay and you don't need to worry about other options like here make sure that see if, if you look at our runtime setting explanation here so better always if you are using the http script or web http html protocol always you better select the run user as a thread otherwise there may be sometimes some situations like users may not be created because if you you cannot create so many processes it would be again some hectic job on the load agent process so if you select run user as a thread so we will be having good chances of creating so many users so there is an advantage if you select run user as a thread okay so how it works like under a single process if you select run user as a process for each let's say you are running a test for 10 users so for each and every individual user a process will be created on the load generator so creating the process on a load generator is a costly in terms of resources but whereas creating a thread is quite easier compared to the creating a process and this is not resource intensive okay so that is why we need to always select run user as a process so some people say you can select a continue on error so that if any error occurs so the users can continue further and also some people put 
generate snapshot on error so that this is to just to keep a track like what are what kind of uh, pages that we are seeing whenever any error occurs on any page so that better always choose this so that will be helpful for us to track or debug once your test is done and make sure that you don't want to select any automatic transaction means each action will be defined in a transaction so that right now we don't need to use this option and likewise we can also disable the proxy if you wanted to have anything okay so i'm not putting any proxy if you are working in the pro any inter corporate network so make sure that you're working behind if you're if you're behind a proxy you need to select the proxy otherwise if you're directly connected to the targeted application without any boundary lines or firewalls or proxies so that you can directly select no proxy so apart from this you don't need to change any by default settings which are coming with the controller okay so now we have done all the runtime settings so now we are clicking okay likewise whatever the scripts that you have added to your scenario you can make changes to those runtime settings to your scripts and you can make them ready okay so now we have created this scenario one of the complex scenarios now i am going to run this scenario so before running any scenario as we just discussed in our previous session so make sure that you are adding the proper set of load generators to your script okay now there is one more thing we are forgetting like make sure that whenever you are before running any test you are giving an appropriate test results path otherwise it may be saving in it may be saving in the temporary directory or it may be saved with some unknown it may be saved under unknown uh, test results so that we may be if we wanted to keep track them in future so we may be losing them so now i'm giving some name as per some standard so i'm going to run it for the total 10 users because for the first phase 5 and second phase 5 so i'm giving the total 10 users and i'm giving test 1 okay i'm clicking okay here okay so now everything is ready now simply we can go to the run mode okay either you can click here to start the scenario or you can go here and you can click the start scenario so better you always keep reset whenever you are seeing uh, any errors or something okay then now let's start the test so now users will be ramping up like however the scenario that we have set so let's wait and see how users are coming up so users are still not at coming up because we have added a delay of somewhere of one minute to start the first user so that's why it is taking some time so after one minute we will be start seeing the one after the other users are coming up for every one minute so let's wait and see now one minute is completed so now we are at one minute 28 seconds so we have one user already entered into the system so this is how it works see now we have one users into the system and uh, we have already seen about this span like we can keep track of what are all the transactions coming into the application and we see here one users are failing at the login this may be the credentials are not working so we can ignore it because uh, we are right now we are not fully validating the test script just we are verifying how we can create various set of scenarios and we have assumed that we will be running a test with the whatever the expected pattern like five users five minutes and again five users five minutes so we can also visualize them how it is happening in real time see here we are also having the same kind of graph that is that will be drawn whenever you're running your test so that that is whatever we have seen in the design mode so that this is the expected graph expected graph for the user ramp up and this is the actual graph for the user ramp up or how your users are really coming into the picture okay so likewise we can create whatever the complex scenario that we can do okay and already we have already we have already seen about this like uh, how we can uh, uh, set different ramp up different graphs like we, we have already seen that so we will be learning more about these details in the analysis part welcome to helpingtesters.com so far we have seen about how to record a script in the virtual user generator 
and uh, how to customize our scripts using the virtual user generator also we have seen various topics like how to create a load scenario under controller and we also covered uh, uh, a bit on uh, controller and uh, various scenarios goal oriented manual scenarios and how to do test execution uh, how to add uh, various types of load in our controller so that we have seen so the next step we are going to learn about analysis so without analysis though you conduct test the test is useless because without analysis you cannot analyze any test results using the load under so let us go to what analysis says and uh, what it contains so we are going to learn about introduction to low analysis and uh, we are also going to learn about various reports under analysis and also we are going to learn about various graphs and also we will see various uh, extra graphs that we can add and also we will see about the global filters and also we will see how to merge graphs if you look at uh, whenever you started testing using the controller you will be specially mentioning the controller to sh to save your test results so here if you want to see the test results there is a two there is a two way that we can open your test results once your test execution is done you can open the test results from if you look at this so this icon is highlighted so by default it would open in the very recent test results otherwise you can check the other way you can go to your result settings and there you will be finding that where you have saved your test results so here I have saved my test results under c scripts folder and with the name called test one uh, with the name called the five users load test two minutes and the test two so likewise i have conducted two tests so that is for our beneficial i will go i will show that why we have, why I have conducted test two times it is always the best practice to conduct any test two times and uh, i will also show why we need to conduct the test let's take it let's uh, take through the analysis so right now i'm going to open my analysis from here so now i am here under the test under the results directive wherever results i'm opening it so in order to open that so you'll be seeing some icon called if you have complete load runner installed you will see some icon called load runner icon here analysis icon this says a blue icon indicate blue icon indicates it's analysis and also how you can identify the file it comes with the dot lrr it means dot load runner results so if you double click on it it will open with the analysis tool sometimes it would take more time open your analysis results it depends on the amount of the transactions and the amount of data that you have so now the complete analysis was open see here if you look at the analysis basically analysis has a two parts so that is the on the left side panel we have a session explorer and the right side part is like it would render the whatever the content that what we select the on left side or on the session explorer so let's take a look by default in any analysis report it would open the summary report this summary report contains the high level information and the transaction level information of your test that whatever you have conducted okay i will take a walk you through later in this session and the other part is the graph session so in this section you will be by default it would be oh, it would be creating some of the default graphs those are nothing but running users http hits per second throughput transaction summary and average transaction response time so these are the very default graphs it would always will be constant so if you wanted to add more graphs there is a way i will take you through later so let us first learn about the summary report now I, also i will inter, i will take you through about all the menu options in our later session now let us concentrate on the summary report so initially the summary report contains four sections one is the scenario information statistics information transaction summary and http response summary so let us go through each of them the very first thing is the analysis summary so in this you will be seeing the periodic period information means when your test has been started and when your test has been ended every each and every information will be available here so that we can consider uh, it would be by default the local controller in local controller time it is always local to your controller time so 
if your client is asking when you have executed test, so you should always depend on your local system uh, time wherever you have executed your controller. Okay. And the next information it is having like the scenario information, like what was the scenario that you used to create this test results and uh, what was the scenario name and what was the test results name and how long the test went. So the duration is also available here. And the next thing is statistic summary. In the statistic summary, we will be having various information like maximum running v user so that this maximum running v user statistics says about what is the maximum concurrent user that you have executed in your test scenario. So it says right now it is a having value as 5 so that our test went for the maximum of concurrent users as 5. And the next thing is the total throughput bytes means throughput bytes nothing but the amount of bytes that we received as part of response throughout our the test. So here it says it has a, some bigger value. We have received these many number of bytes as part of responses and the average throughput. So based on the average throughput, so it is indicated in the bytes per second. So we have received 46k bytes per second as part of our response. So total hits. It means your, your script may be having one or more uh, hits. It means let's say a transaction is having multiple hits. So each and every hits will be considered as a single hit and the total number of hits that has been hitting on the server throughout your throughout your test is these many. Okay. And the average hits per second means so it will show per second calculation like per second it would show it as a 15. Okay. Right now I have not defined any SLA so that uh, there won't be any SLA supplied. If you want to define any SLA you can click you can click on this SLA configuration wizard. So let me take you through that. So SLA is nothing but previously we have discussed about in our load under session. SLA is nothing but your client says each and every page of my application should be opened within so and so seconds. Let's say I am putting the SLA as three seconds here. So let me show how to create that SLA. So based on our SLA, your transactions will be automatically highlighted whichever passed or failed. So let me create an SLA now. So to create SLA, click on new and just click next. So the SLA contains various parts to apply. So you can apply on either on a 90 percentile or whatever the percentile that you want and the average. So right now I'm just looking at the 90 percent percentile based and I just click. There are various other statistics that you can apply your SLA. Adults per second, total hits per second, average hits per second total throughput and average throughput. So you can select any one of them right now. I'm interested in only based on the transaction response time percentile. So here you can enforce which are all the transaction in this wizard. You can enforce which are all the transaction that you wanted to select and that you wanted to apply the SLA. So here I'm selecting the all transaction, not only one transaction, I'm selecting the all transactions to apply my SLA so that I want to show which are transactions that are deviated the SLA that I have set. So here I am setting the 90 percentile by default. We are having 90 percentile in our response times. I will tell what are those data. Okay, right now I am just taking the default at 90 percent so that the SLA will be applied here. So my SLA should not be exceeded more than three seconds. So I am applying for all the transactions. So whenever you give some number and apply to all, so it will be applied for the all underlying transactions. Then you click on next in the wizard. Okay, if you want to define any other SLA, you can check that. So again, it will reiterate into the other SLA. Right now, I don't want to, so I'm just finishing it. Okay, so I'm just closing it. So now it will apply SLA to your test results. Let's wait and see. In your transaction summary, the next part we are going to learn about the transaction summary, and we just applied the SLA status. So in the transaction summary, it will show up all the transactional response times and also it will give something like SLA status. So whatever the SLA that we just applied, it says in right tick mark. It means in a green tick mark means it says this SLA has been perfect. So nothing, no transaction has been deviated for the 90 percentile response time. Nothing has been deviated the three seconds SLA. So that's why we are seeing the SLA status as green tick mark otherwise it would be a red cross mark okay let me apply another SLA uh, which is exceeding the 
four sec which is exceeding the two seconds so that we are having other transactions which are exceeding two seconds so let me apply that now if you want to open if you don't see any option so that you can go here it is a configure SLA rule so that you can you can verify the existing SLA rule that whatever I created. So I'm not going to create any new SLA. Instead, I'm going to edit the existing SLA that I have created. So I'm just changing the 90 percentile should not be crossing the more than two seconds. That is my SLA. So now we will show this SLA. It will show whichever the transactions that are failed that are not meeting the SLA. So see here. Previously, we just we seen all the transactions SLA status as green. Now we are having the few transactions SLA as cross mark. So it means these transactions which are highlighted, the 90 percentile has got two seconds. See here, this transaction has got 2.669 seconds. It means so it is crossed SLA. That's why we are seeing this. So this is SLA is used to do just on a high level, just quickly to identify which transactions are deviated from a given SLA. So this is all the transaction summary. So let us go through the various options, various things in the transaction summary. So in the transaction summary, we have the minimum and average and the maximum and the standard deviation and the 90 percentile pass fail stop. So minimum is the out of let's say we got totally 15 samples, 15 samples for the add to card. So out of this 15 samples, which particular transaction has got the minimum is becomes as a minimum value and that the average is the average of total 15 samples would become the average and the maximum is out of these 15 samples which one has got the maximum so called as a maximum and the standard deviation so standard deviation has some internal formula so right now I'm not going to take you through because it has related some statistics but don't worry about it I will tell some important rule about the standard deviation okay and uh, the other metric we have is a 90 percent. So 90 percent is a very key metric that normally industry considers. So 90 percentile response time is nothing but the 90th user experience. So that it would always 90th user experience good then okay the system is perfect. Okay rest of 91 to 100 percent 91 to 100 percent users will be ignored. But at least a 1 to 90 user experience should be good. So that is what it says the 90 percent response time. Okay. And the other metric like pass is the number of samples passed for your add to cart or, or transaction. And fail is nothing but how many of them fail. And the stop is nothing but so whenever you hit on the stop. So how many transactions which are currently performing have been stopped. Okay. So we also seen just about the SLA status. So or SLA status can be defined you know what is the meaning of that SLA status pass or fail underneath it okay it is clearly defined and the other part that we are going to see see about the HTTP response time so since our whole HTTP request everything is a nothing but it works based on the response codes it may be 100 200 300 400 500 so we have already seen about our initial session of the load runner about this response codes okay now we are going to learn about what are the various response code that have come as part of your test so that http response summary tells that how many pages or how many requests has got 200 let's say totally 2220 samples has got response code as 200 and there are few transaction codes a few requests which has got response uh, tra or the transaction code or response code as 302 so and how many we got per second if we calculate how many we got like that so it will be clearing sh clearly showing so some people uh, some sometimes we also need to give to the client about this HTTP response summary because now right now since we are not we are not having anything fail here but sometimes you may be seeing like HTTP 500 HTTP 404 these HTTP 501 so these kind of uh, response time response codes that clients are mainly wanted to look at so those are also imp some important important statistics as part of HTTP response summary so right now we don't have any metrics that kind so it would be in a happy path for us okay welcome to helpingtesters.com so far we have covered about summary report overview so now let's look at various graphs that are available as part of analysis 
So now let's take a look at the graph. So by default, as we just by default analysis opens up five different graphs. So let's take a look at the very first graph. This is a running view user. So uh, we learned in the controller like ramp up, steady state, and ramp down, right? So here let me explain what it says in this running view user graph. So running view user graph basically explains about the number of users, whatever we have given in the controller. So how they are going up, how they are ramping up and how long they were running and how they were ramping up. So let me show that. See here, this is the ramp up pattern that it is shown. So these ramp up pattern that we have already set in the controllers based on that, the users will be ramped up. So we have set one user for every uh, five seconds so that we will be able to see that users coming up for every five seconds. And then this is so called as a ramp up. And the next, the line, whatever the flat line that you are seeing from here to here so this line so called as a steady state so this is one of the important technical term let's say your client may be asking you like so what was the steady state that you have applied so you can say that my steady state started at the 20 seconds to uh, 2 minutes 10 seconds so approximately 2 minutes the test went so this is from this from this steady state first point to the last point the full load is on it means the full load is a five five users or five concurrent users so to achieve the five concurrent users so we have given the ramp up so this is the full load this is the steady state is always shown for the complete number of concurrent users and the next you know the next the step down that you are seeing these nothing but the ramp down so that ramp down is always shows like this okay so this is the steady this is the ramp up steady state ramp down so on this axis you will be seeing the how many number of users and in this axis you will be seeing the number of like the time elapsed the elapsed time means the total duration that went on so i have executed this test for 2 minutes 25 seconds so until the last user the total test went for 2 minutes 25 so underneath we will be having some extra information like the whatever the graph that you are seeing on top so the average and the minimum maximum and some of the metrics on the graph so you will be seeing here so for the running we use that these graphs are not much important okay so the next graph we are going to learn about the hits per second so what is the meaning of hits per second let me open our view gen so i just opened uh, our view gen script here see if you look at we are having there are various functions that are related to urls web url and uh, you know web url is for login web submit data this is for uh, submit login and uh, there are various web url and web submit data so each and every web submit url web, web url or web submit data each and everything consider as a one request so here one request or one hit see here this is a one hit okay this is a one hit or one request so likewise your entire script will be having n number of hits so your transaction may be having one or more hits your transaction may be part of one or one or more hits so if someone asks, okay what is the difference between the hit and transaction so a transaction is a high level uh, and a hit is uh, nothing but a subset of the transaction so that a transaction may be having one or more hits in the hits or request in your transaction okay so that these many each and every web url web submit data considered as a request so that whatever the graph that we are seeing here is it's a hits per second so how your hits per second is going on throughout the test so that there are some conditions uh, whenever you are trying to run your test sometimes your hits per second will be going up sometimes it will be coming down again it will be going up so that is a normal condition so you your hits per second will always should be a constant uh, if the pattern should be constant if you look at your hits per second is going up coming down going up coming down going up coming down so it's a good pattern so if you look at the high level points so your hits per second is uh, timely it is in, it is it is going stable but sometimes you will be seeing that your hits per second coming up you know it, it would be sometimes it will be going like this and all of this it will fall so if you see a sudden fall in your hits per second after certain amount of time it means there is some problem with your load generators looks like your load generators may be 100 percent resource utilized or your may be looking for additional resources or we can tell in other terms like your load generators are not sufficient to handle so hits per second always 
defines if you are seeing any abnormal behavior like hits per second is going up after some time uh, after some times it will go straight and suddenly falls then we can consider it is a problem with the lower generators okay so this is all about the hits per second and the next one is the throughput so throughput is number of bytes that we received as part of your response throughout your test see here hits per second and throughput looks like almost similar see hits per second means the we are requesting the number of we are we are giving the we are increasing the number of uh, hits per second to the server in the same way we are receiving the response from the server so if we compare both together then it would be a good approach so that it will it will show us whether the problem is there with the server or not our server is able to handle the number of increasing the increasing requests or not so we can easily identify the identify using the throughput and hits per second so for that we need to match these both of these graphs so i will tell you that how to do match those graphs in our later session okay so right now the throughput is nothing but the number of bytes that we receive and also like uh, underline under uh, the underlying statistics says about average and the graph maximum all these statistics will be included here and the next graph we are going to see about the transaction summary here transaction summary is a very good graph and uh, you know it gives a very good matrix about your transaction details it would say that how many transactions have been passed throughout your test see here it is it shows a, a green green bar so in this in this bar chart your transaction summary says all the transactions that whatever we have given in the in, in our script everything is passed there is if you see any transactions fail so those will come under red color if you see anything is stopped those will come under other color it may be amber some other color so right now we are not worrying about it so right now we will be looking at mainly red and green graph so that it will give a clear idea about how many transactions are passed for each and every transaction uh, how many transactions are failed so it will give a detailed detailed idea on this in the transaction summary and the next graph is average transaction response time so this is the one of the important trans, one of the important graph that we always look at so transaction summary graph average transaction response time graph speaks about how your tra particular transaction is behaving throughout your test let's say let us consider a transaction called add to cart okay so how add to cart transaction is behaving from your starting to till ending of your test see here your add to cart transaction is uh, almost stable so it is under it is always below 1.2 seconds see here it is somewhere at maximum touching 1.2 so it is almost varying in milliseconds okay not in seconds but in milliseconds so here it says your transaction your add to cart transaction is going very stable sometimes you will see that your transaction response times are gradually increasing means there is some indication that your application is not stable with the load so what happens we will be slowly ramping up the users so that as user ramp ups goes up and uh, what happens your transaction response times also goes up though users are not ramping up still your transaction response times are going up so that in that situation you will say that there is some issue with the server so which is not able to handle the given load so likewise we can filter out whatever the transaction that we want to look at so average transaction response time on a high level it will gives the your transaction footprint throughout your test so that it will collect the number of samples throughout your test so let's take a look uh, let's look at the launch url see your launch url transaction is the very first transaction in your script so that that's the reason you are seeing this particular transaction graph launch url which is starting at the 0 to 0 second so that it is ended up so if you look at what are the transactions those transactions are starting at a later point of the script so that we will be seeing them are at a different interval see this it's this at submit order transaction has started somewhere around the 24th second from the uh, beginning of your test so that your submit trans submit order transaction is also going a very stable so that so this also about this if your transaction response times are stable that it means your server is stable in terms of the response times okay so these are the default graphs that are available in the analysis in our next session we are going to learn about various advanced graphs how to we add and 
how to match graphs and we will also look at the global filters. Welcome to helpingtesters.com. In our previous sessions, we have covered about various graphs. Now let us look at how to add some additional graphs which are very important. In order to add any additional graph, so if you all you need to always right click on your graphs and add item. Click on add a new graph. So when you click on it, it will open some various uh, graph information it will open so that it is having n number of graphs like it is having various sections. There are some graphs which speaks about the users, which speaks about the errors, which speaks about the transactions and web resources likewise there are various sections so since we are running our test only uh, for the from from the client side to monitor so majority of the graphs that are not comes as part of your analysis graph so let's say to, to set an examples network virtualization network monitoring and uh, web server information and a j2w.net diagnostics so those are we have not included okay how to identify that which are graphs that you can generate the data for them okay so if you look at you are seeing some graphs are in blue color highlighted and you are seeing some graphs uh, some 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 uh, sections are in black color so you can get the data from whatever the content which is in the blue color text so blue color text will always says okay there is some data as part of your analysis okay so now let me open something like a v user summary graph by default we have v user graph size available so that let me open the running v users graph is available let me open the v user summary so that it will open the v user summary it say how many users stopped automatically how many users stopped fail everything is coming here so let us let us add some more important section the transaction section is a very important section it is having various various transaction related information let's say your client may be asking you to send transactions per second graph so that in the transactions per second we have individual transactions per second and a total transactions per second it means uh, the difference is total transactions per second graph will be giving the including the all transactions it will give the one single graph information whereas transactions per second gives individual transaction TPS okay so let's let's look at see here it is showing the individual transaction level in metrics how, how these transactions are accessed per second pattern okay let's add also add one more graph that what we just discussed total transactions per second as I just said it will be having only one transaction one graph one graph line which contains all the transactions together so those will be summed up and it will show up the information here so if you look at the differences very uh, very shown very quickly very clearly shown like it is having the each and individual transaction information and it is having the all the transaction together how those transactions have been how, how those transactions have been requested so this is the transactions per second so what is the meaning by this transactions per second so if you look at in our script we have added various transactions let's say launching the url and uh, you know clicking on the signing link so everything is a transaction but whatever we have added so your transactions per second graph speaks about these and the next graph we are going to look at it so let's add one more a few more graphs about the transactions uh, because the transaction section is very important and uh, uh, you may be seeing the transaction this is the one important like transaction response time distribution so let's open this graph and explain on this see this transaction response time distribution graph says about how your various transactions are available at various response time let's say if you look at the graph this is the number of transaction and this is the number of seconds the transactions loaded see if you look at add to cart see add to cart has got uh, this particular color add to cart if you click the transaction will be automatically appeared here let's say add to cart where is it's gone so if you look at this uh, this is the add to cart so add to cart transaction has got majority of 11 transaction in 11, 11 transactions has got somewhere around 0 0.1 to so between the 0 point between the 0 to 1 second okay likewise there are 
other transactions like it will show up the how your transactions are scattered at a different transaction per second or at a different transaction response times from a scale of 0 to 1 2 3 4 and it may be infinity like unless until the maximum transaction says okay if you look at one transaction here got submit login so your submit one of the submit login transaction has got somewhere around 3.5 seconds so out of all transactions out of all submit logins all submit logins are total out of all submit logins oh, 11 transactions are got somewhere around 11 seconds only one transaction has got somewhere around the 3.5 seconds so this is all about your transaction response time distribution graph on a high level it will it will show the information about how your transactions are scattered across the response timeline likewise you can add whatever the graph that your client client requests so you can add a variety kind of graphs uh, from this sometimes you may be needing also uh, some page level information let's say uh, your page may be containing how much serve how much it took uh, server how much time it took for the network and how much time it took for the generating the request so those all information can be available under web page diagnostic so let me show up one of the graphs time to first buffer, buffer breakdown so this graph will clearly show up that so how much time let me scroll it up see how much time your network took to uh, it took or uh, as part of total response time how much time it took how much time the server took so if you see if you if you open this graph time to first buffer breakdown so that if you are having any network latency so those network latencies will come under as part of this so here the average if you look at the uh, network time it, it shows 2.23 seconds so that my network has added some latency to the whatever my network has my network has been added some late latency to the transaction response time whereas server was able to quickly process for the you know the category whatever that uh, whatever the step or whatever the request that you can look at here see it's a jpet store categories fish so that this particular selecting the fish url so server has got or oh, server was pro was able to process very quickly where your network is the culprit so that your network is taking most of the time so likewise you can interpret where is most of my transaction is pending time okay likewise you can add various graphs that are available in your system so this is about how you can add all your whatever the additional extra graphs based on your client client demand so you can add all these graphs welcome to helping testers.com so far we have covered about some additional graphs that how we can add various graphs so now we are going to look about the filters and the global filters filters are very easy to apply and the filters mainly used as the name suggests to filter anything on top of your summary report or the graph so that let us open uh, if you look at the menu here see menu sets the global filter the filter icon if you click it the global filter will be opened so global filter can be applied on a various conditions based on the transaction names let's say if you apply if you want to apply if you want to only show the one transaction related information so that you can select whatever the transaction that you wanted to as part as part of your report so that you can select them and uh, you can apply and click ok so that only information to those transactions will be shown up as part of your summary report okay now let's look at other filters so before applying any filter just say clear clear all so that it would it would not having any worse impact or it would not having any data loss so likewise we will be having various transaction filters like based on the transaction response time we can apply based on the scenario elapsed based on the transactional hierarchy and the transaction end status so i'm not going to take each and everything based but i'm going to show one important and uh, whenever you're doing the load test you will be having uh, filters to apply like based on the only failed transactions throughout your test it may be specifically asking for failed transaction information separately so that you don't need to go and uh, use excel so that instead you can directly come up and 
apply your transaction end status as fail so that everything whatever the transactions failed you will be found right now we don't have any transactions fail so that no data is appearing here so now let's look at other filters let me clear this okay now the other very important that we will be looking at based on the script view user id let's open the view user id so here if you know the any view user id like first user how this first user is working throughout your test so that you can give any first user if, let's say we have execute our test for five users so if you particularly would like to look at the any trans any user information how those were happening so that we can apply them so that that only that user specific information will be added as part of your analysis so this will be taking some time so first user has got totally did three iterations so that this is only transaction summary shows about the only first user transaction response times and whatever the how many transactions that he's got uh, as part of your transaction summary trans about the response codes and uh, how much this first user has got total total throughput and statistics summary so and everything will be applied okay so but not the analysis summary will be always constant in respect to of the filter that you apply only it would be applied for statistic summary transaction summary and http responses your filters will not be applied for your transaction you will not be applied for your scenario definitions okay so let me clear that and uh, sometimes you may be needing to, you may be needed to uh, filter based on the uh, v user end status or v user end state v user uh, status okay and sometimes you may be needing to based on the think time and we have already learned about the think time and if you want to include think time to your response time so that we can also add them here so now you will be seeing if you have added think time between your transaction so those will be exclusively added as part of your transactions okay see here your there are worst transaction says your submit login has got somewhere around totally 2.93 seconds as actual so that out of this the transaction response time included think time has got 46 seconds contribution so this is all about the filters so likewise you can play around the various filters using your transaction so there is one more thing sometimes your client may be asking the test results only for your studied so let's study state so if you look at the study state started at 20 seconds and it has ended at uh, 20 minutes sorry it has ended at 2 minutes somewhere around 13 seconds so that your client exclusively looking at for only these study state information so that you can apply that based on your transaction scenario elapsed time so that in the scenario elapsed time you will be giving when you wanted to start the time so that I want to start my test at 20 seconds because uh, 20, from the 20 seconds your test will be started coming up all the users will be coming up so that I'm giving as a 20 seconds and uh, when it would be stopping it would be stopped at it was stopped at 22 minutes 13 seconds so that I have applied the filter he like so that you will be seeing your summary report only for whatever the steady state information during the steady state how your transactions are behaving so that is it has been by default applied to your running users as well so this is about your global filter so global filters will be always applied to all the reports and the graphs if you want to exclusively apply it for only one summary report so let me clear this so that you are having one more additional filter here so if you click this filter it will open on it only for the summary report let me select the summary report and if you click so this filter is only for the summary report okay so likewise we can play around the various uh, various various filters options using the analysis